Roman Reigns run as the head of the table. CM Punk's journey back to his old stable. Cody Rhodes' story left right in mid-swing. These are a few of my favourite post things. The TKO merger, a surprise in the night. John Cena's return due to actors on strike. The post-wrestling family, voices that sing. These are a few of my favourite things. John and Way's insights, a guiding bright light. Andrew, Neil, Four, Johns and Jack, Newsday, right? Braden and Davy, Nate's wisdom that clings. These are a few of my favourite post things. Park and Rich fan, Karen's joy, Bruce's might. David, Kate, Sino and Eric's fight nights. Phil, Chris and Jordan, the wellness he brings. These are a few of my favourite post things. When the bell rings... When the match ends, when I'm feeling sad. I simply remember my favourite post things and then I don't feel so bad. Jay Briscoe's legacy will never be ended. Terry Funk's passing, many eras transcended. Bray Wyatt's memory, in our hearts it sings. These are a few of the year's saddest things. Vince McMahon's rebound, a twist in the tail. Will Ospreay's signing, a wind in Cannes seals. Wrestling at Wembley, the crowd in full swing. These are a few of my favourite post things. Promos that captivate, tales that unfold. Heroes and villains, both the new and the old. Christmas in wrestling, the joy that it brings. These are a few of my favourite post things. Year-end reflections, as Christmas bells ding. Anticipation for what next year will bring. Guests swapping stories with Pollock and Ting. These are a few of my favourite post things. When the bell rings, when the match ends, when I'm feeling sad, I simply remember the post-Christmas show and then I don't feel so bad. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the 11th annual post wrestling christmas show i put an asterisk next to that because i'm doing that math off the top of my head i think i think well technically it's the sixth annual post wrestling christmas show but you are including our prior history so hey congratulations we've overtaken our prior history of christmas shows with the post uh, uh, under the post wrestling banner i guess we're done this we hope it. you've enjoyed the last six years. This was the sole purpose from Christmas Eve 2017 to Christmas Eve 2013, mm-hmm. which I it didn't even dawn on me. Happy anniversary, way. Oh, happy anniversary, John. What did you get me? You have to a come couple, get it. Oh, I ordered uh, one cream, one one sugar for you. L- lovely, lovely. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, man. Six years ago, we were in uh, my parents' house hitting publish on the website the whole thing came out and then um our lives were changed were you with your wife at the time of yes. us launching the site you were with her okay at mm-hmm. this time all right when did you two start dating i think what um man, i really should know this it was seven yeah years. you did <laughs> it was seven years ago I, no i think shit okay no I'm we'll, we'll, cut, this, this. we'll <laughs> cut this out it's, it feels like yesterday that you met her but a lifetime of memories before and after to come <laughs> that's the correct answer yeah yeah exactly how dare you john put me on the spot like that yeah. but you have been with yours well you've been married you just passed a 10 year anniversary 10 years year. yeah Damn. we've been together for 14 um wow the, it's it's the opposite with us where obviously my wife always believes I, like i know the exact date that we met she has literally at times gotten the year wrong that we met. So she is just way off. There's no beating sense. you when it comes to that. Um, you know, you'll no. always have that over. No. Well, how did you celebrate 10 years? Um, we we uh, we just went went out for dinner. We had like a night out to just uh, hang out the two of us, which I might might not sound like the craziest plans. But in our current life uh, situation, just getting a night to go out the two of us, it's a massive deal. So oh, we, it's uh, WrestleMania. We, uh, it, right. it is yes i wish we could have had two nights but just this one so um no yeah, we had a we, we had a good anniversary like we're not um we're not crazy like gift givers for anniversaries it's mm. sort of like we come up with ideas for each other and do that type of thing um 
so yeah we uh yeah that was last month and how are you how will you two and your family be celebrating christmas um well we've had about uh 5, christmas parties this year with, with different families and such we are um Tonight we are getting together with family. This being Christmas Eve, and yes. uh, this is this is the morning. I think Christmas yes, Eve. I'm, I'm just I was, okay. I just woke up. I'm still trying to get my bearings with me. And then we are we're doing nothing on Christmas Day. I'm gonna have a day of nothing. That's my mm -hmm. goal on Christmas Day. My goal is to do nothing. And then New Year's Eve, which has gone from a night I I used to just detest to a night I very much look forward to where i order chinese food i'm the only one who eats it now because my wife not a fan and my kids are like allergic to half that. the stuff that's in it so but so this why year do you continue to order it because i like it so it's a it's a it's a I'm, meal for one well i offer it to everyone but it usually yeah is, is now just for me and unless i'm eat? guilted into just giving up and ordering pizza so everyone can enjoy it. but they get so their what? thing i get mine Gotcha. Okay, so you have two yeah. different. I'm not, I'm not. I'm not starving everybody at my expense. Um, wow. Well, you must but, really like Chinese food to be the only one to order it to justify. It's the it. one time a year I order Chinese food. But uh, this year, Max has said he wants to stay up till midnight. He's really intrigued to see what happens when a new year begins in real time. There's not a prayer he's going to make it till midnight. But we thought of changing the clocks to, <laughs> so that once it's like nine o'clock, it's going to say midnight, so he can still get he'll feel like it's it, it, is that like somewhat duping him or do you feel that's a cool little activity for a six-year-old i think th i think it's cool I, I think it's sweet when once they realize you know that uh, in, in the future when you tell them that you've done this i think it's totally fair you okay. know maintain the maintain kayfabe here i i like it now the trick is i i, I mean max is a smart kid you know he's going to see through certain things he's got a sense of time i'm sure so how will you do this to make sure that he doesn't realize so he has a mastery of our ipad the phones mm. like i would have to change everything okay mm. now it will be dark out by nine so that part i have taken care of but i literally have to plot this out and think because he does he's pretty clever when it comes to this stuff it's very hard to get things over on him but i think I, almost every day you have to turn the clock an hour ahead so that it feels a lot more gradual yeah that you're, you're making this more daunting than I, I and i anticipated it to be but um we'll, we'll see how it goes we will see how it goes maybe so he's gonna have the, maybe he's just gonna be ready to go till legit midnight yeah so uh you know prior to getting to the next topic i do want to uh, maybe uh warn uh people listening if you're listening with the little ones maybe maybe cover their ears for for this next little bit but where are you at with your children and the topic of santa oh um this year i mean they are they are both very much into the spirit of santa claus although this year was a big challenge in terms of we were going to take them to see santa claus at the mall uh -huh. to which max informed me you know that's an elf right it's not the real santa he's busy i was like yeah of course i wasn't born yesterday max okay so he though decided i don't want to see santa he didn't want to go I'm like i can't he doesn't want to see the elf i mean he knows it's not the legit santa i think he, i think he wants the real deal so he would not go so then it was down to evie and she was of the side she wanted to go she, every single time i want to go want to go want to go so this past uh friday morning uh we set out went to the mall on a friday morning where the the traffic was going to be light we get to the mall like one family in line i'm like we have scored refuses refuses to see santa will not what? go up for the photo it's like we're gonna sit with you like you can you can sit with mommy no and she's just having a fit we got all the way we couldn't we couldn't take her to see santa she would not well, she was, what was the reason she she's not giving me a, a dissertation on her thoughts on santa but she was not mm. gonna go i was like what am i gonna do i'm gonna force her to sit on santa's lap or have a photo it's like this yeah. is not happening so we got no visits with uh with santa this year with them don't know if that's going to be a permanent um stance that they take but this year we were over two but you saved yourself like 50 bucks you know for one of those pictures dude these have gotten extremely pricey to ridiculous um for your children to see santa now you on the other hand this would have been the first year you took yes. oscar to see santa i assume and how did that go because 
Um, th- it was very difficult the first times we took our our kids to see Santa. There were lots of tears and mm. screams. It went really well. You know, Oscar is like about uh, Dude, Oscar um, is like the most laid back baby I've ever heard. Well, listen, I, at this stage, I, I don't even know how aware he is of every, everything, you know, maybe more than I, I I give him credit for. But, you know, he's 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 almost like mm, concerningly calm around strangers. Like when we were down in in, um, in the Dominican, he's just like walking around saying hi to everybody, walking up to other groups and just waving at them, saying hi. Um, and it's almost at the point where like, you know, we want a little bit of stranger danger, you know, just, 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 you know, for, for security sake, but he's very calm. Like we sat him down on Santa's lap by himself and he's just like, wow. he's, he's just kind of curious, you know, and he'll, like no, no ill emotion, like almost like very, almost too trusting anyway, but we got some great shots out of him. Like then we walked in, it, it was kind of as smooth as can be, um, but that could change, you know, could change next year, like, you know, with a bit of uh, increased awareness. But we got a lot of uh, some really nice photos, paid the 50 bucks. Now, they, 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 they're, they're very, like, sly, you know, these Santa Claus photo people at, at this mall. They, they only, for the lowest tiers, give you, like, the small po- pocket size photos. Yeah. And if you want the actual normal size photos that you might want to put into a frame – you got to go for the biggest tier. So you get all the pocket size ones, then a bunch of other sizes that you don't want with these awful filters that are cheesy as hell. Then you get the normal one, you know, if you get the highest tier. So, and I assume it's frowned um, upon for you to take your phone out and take a separate photo. Oh, you phone. can't. No, that's, you that's can't, the entire right? business. Yeah. So anyway, the commerce of Christmas. Commerce of Christmas. So well, be happy that I guess, you know, that, that you say 50. What I'm trying to get at is, um, so you're still very, very much maintaining the idea and the concept of of Santa. Have you had any thoughts? Because you know what, like uh, in in maybe um, hearing some sort of parental like guide, uh, I don't know, advice like blogs and and, and influencers. Um, some have like maybe suggested simply kind of telling the truth about like you know what Santa Claus represents um, at an early age rather than maybe maintaining the sort of mm, illusion of, you know, this person who comes to your house every, every year and, and delivers presents. What, do you have any thoughts on that? I think it's, um, I kind of just leave it to, there's going to come an age when they're going to figure it out. And, and that's that. I, I feel it's like, man, um, I don't really see the harm in them having something to look forward to. And if it's a, if it's an illusion, if it's, I, I feel like, you know, in time, I think we have to stop worrying about all, all these things. Like it's uh you know, this isn't going to last forever. You, you'll probably realistically by the age of like eight or nine, the genie's probably out of the bottle by then. And do you feel the same way about professional wrestling for a child, for a child? Well, may, I mean, what, uh, sorry, like, I mean, like once a child gets into wrestling, whatever age it may be, it could be, you know, I don't know, t- 10, 12, 8, 9, uh, not telling them that this is staged and that this is, you know, like uh, a, a real sport. I would think pretty much the same that any kid that's getting into wrestling is probably figuring that out pretty quickly. I just I don't know. I, I understand like a lot of people are still um, concerned about this question. I. Like, I can't remember like, like, like as a child thinking wrestling was anything but what it was. Like, it was just, like, assumed, like, with me and my friends. And, like, it was never a thing for me. It was never of a, like, oh, my God, I can't believe this. I was just, I don't know. I'm Maybe I was an anomaly in that sense that I just, I watched this and it never computed to me that I'm watching uh, MMA. It's from the uh, moment that you first watch wrestling when you're five or six, you were looking up the ratings and, you know, you, you were studying dates. No, like but I was like, I was watching Marty Jannetty go through a barbershop window and not die. And I was like, you know what? This probably isn't like a realistic reaction to someone wanting to have a singles career. Um, I, this, that's that's very interesting because I, I would I mean, how old were you when you watched that? Seven, eight around that time. You must have been a, a very sort of. um. I don't know, discerning seven, seven, seven or eight year old. Cause I mean, I, I would, I would guess a lot of people at that age would probably still believe that there was something real about that. 
Um, but I'm curious to know, like, I'm curious for myself, you know, what I would do if you, both with the topic of Santa Claus, as well as like, you know, the topic of professional wrestling, is it better to just tell the person, the, the child that this is what it is from that point on? Or do you kind of leave, let them discover it by themselves? I lead it. I, I leave it to them. I think it's like, I don't know. I, I'm more of a proponent of sort of being like hands off of like, let, let your child just experience it for themselves like we, we don't have to monitor everything that it, to me is a pretty harmless um thing to believe in like i wouldn't have that same sense about like the tooth fairy and explaining the tooth fairy you know what i mean it's like come on the dynamics of that one are, are pretty tough to um to play out as well oh it's i mean but magic exists man. like what's the market value of one of your teeth you think anyone's really leaving you money for a tooth like i'm sorry it's Depends how uh, how good you take care of your teeth. I guess so. Yeah. Hey, by so, the way, what an intro! Oh yeah, we have guests, don't we? Are, do Do we have guests this year? No, I meant the intro of this particular podcast that we both. Oh, I thought to. you just meant our conversation. Well, that was the great Neil Flanagan. Amazing, and, uh, amazing. I'm going to bring everyone behind the curtain. And th this year, I was um, all of a sudden, I was like, man, this Christmas show is like creeping up on me. And I was I was not ready for the the dive into a lot of the uh, the planning, the coordinating, and then this intro. And I pretty much came to Neil. And I was like, Neil, I need your help with an intro. Do you have any ideas? Because I'm creatively bankrupt uh, this year. And he came back with that. And I was like, Neil, MVP. Thank you. Amazing, amazing work. Um, not only a great reporter at postwrestling.com. Not only a great co-host on the wellness policy, but a, a a poet, I would say, you know, he is one of my favorite post things. Lovely, lovely. Thank you very much, Neil, for your contributions again. I I mean, um, maybe we'll hear from him a, a little later on. Uh, we will find out if we get the double Neil Flanagan experience on the Christmas hmm. show. But as you have seen the length of this behemoth, it's a big one this year, folks. It is the post wrestling Christmas show. And as we are wont to do, it is finally time to discover who drew number one. Well, happy holidays, everybody. We have a cavalcade of stars joining us on the show. And wow, a, great pull. A great personal pull. favorite of one of ours <laughs> joining us here. Gentlemen, Jeff Merrick, we are so happy to have you here on the Post Wrestling Christmas Show. A happy holiday, Jeff, to you and yeah. yours. And thanks so much for popping by. And to all of you viewers slash listeners, uh, all the best of the holiday season, best of the new year, health and happiness to all. Why would you want me on? I'm like the 24-7 hockey guy now. Because whenever we throw out, uh, who do you most want to hear from? Uh, Jeff Merrick always is a among the most votes that we always are, get from people. Are people that bored? Like, <laughs> seriously, to hear my little routine and my act. Haven't, haven't people had enough of me in wrestling? Listen, I, I think that you had a, a major influence on, on a lot of people that have thankfully uh, held on to this industry through... Yeah. Uh, drug abuse death, and uh and so much darkness um but seeing wrestling covered in a very different way um yeah. that then was typical at, at the time like in 1999 the idea about a radio show that was covering the industry of pro wrestling as opposed mm -hmm. to what was just the side show and let's do 10 minutes at the end of the show tongue-in-cheek that was very novel for an audience that i think craved it it was fun like it, it really was at the end of the day, like, I don't know that there was any sort of high minded, you know, philosophical design of we're going to revolutionize the industry. And this is our position in history. Blah, 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 blah. I don't think there was any of that. I mean, John, you were there like, you know, it was just, you know, some goofballs that like to talk about um, professional wrestling. Um, but, you know, much along the lines of and this is the example that I always raise. Um, if I had a chance to interview Tom Cruise, I wouldn't pretend that he's Jerry Maguire. I'd interview him as Tom Cruise. And to me, that always just seemed natural. I think the uh, I think the wrestlers themselves liked it. Clearly, the audience did as well. Um, and if I had, like I always say this, like if I had any role, you know, as however minute as it was, to sort of move wrestling forward from a broadcast uh, standpoint, from a from a media standpoint, then then I'm really happy. Um, and if I influence anybody to go on to much greater heights than I ever got to uh, covering professional wrestling, then then I'm I'm really happy for for what I was able to do in, in pro wrestling, which is again 
very, very small, very, very tiny. It's tiny little things that I moved along there, John and Way. Ever the Canadian, I think, you know, continuing to uh, maybe uh, be very humble about maybe your your influence. But for me, um, honestly, I, th I think um, your involvement in all of this um, it, it even predates the law. You know, I was maybe one of the few people that might have listened to game on. Um, Bless and, you. Did you yes. really? Yes, I did. You just yes. made my day. You just made my day. See, my, uh, honestly, John, no offense, but I have a special, special place in my heart. For people that listen to that show, like the lead researcher at Sportsnet is a guy by the name of Steve Fallon. He runs the Snet Stats Twitter feed, which is fantastic. He was a day oneer on game as well. And him and I always talk about whenever I get run into Steve, that's one of the things we always talk about. So whenever I hear game and for your listeners slash viewers, that was an overnight show, Friday nights from like one in the morning to five in the morning uh, with me, George Travelopoulos and, and Bob Mackowitz Jr., for which we got paid the princely sum of $30, not each $30, but we didn't care. We just wanted to have fun. So thank you for the historical poll. You, you warmed this old man's heart. Thank well, you. it was very unique to me at the time, um, uh, Jeff, because on, on radio, I mean, I'm, I'm sure as you know, um, it, maybe, maybe you would differ, but it, it feels like it would t take a lot of, um, I think approval in order to get anything on the air. And yep. game was very much kind of like podcasting before podcasting where, where it was just like three guys kind of talking about whatever they want, whether it be um, showcase <laughs> late at night yeah, yep. um, or professional or make, wrestling or, or making fun of Peter uh, uh, Michael Landsberg's hair. And then later <laughs> he hired us all because he loved it. He would drive <laughs> home from TSN and listen to us Friday overnights and we'd be roasting about his hair, comparing it to. Vince Cellini's and he thought like Landsberg's got the best sense of humor in the world, especially about himself. Um, and he just loved it. And he ended up hiring me, George and Bobby went off the record started. But, so that's, but how, that's how we got in with Landsberg. We roasted him every week. <laughs> but professional wrestling was also one of those topics that you would yeah. never, ever hear talked about on the radio. So, I mean, that yeah. did it uh, in what way did it maybe give birth to the law? Well, you know what? I'll, I'll tell you what the, the, the pro wrestling thing for that, for that show, um, like George always admired it and liked it and liked the, uh, the show business element of it. Um, but Bob Mackowitz and I used to go to Maple Leaf Gardens all the time to, uh, to watch wrestling shows. He was one of the guys I would, I would go with. Uh, and we would all watch wrestling on Saturday afternoons, you know, in, in Southern Ontario, we were really blessed. Um, because Saturday afternoons were all wrestling and roller derby. We did get roller derby, but at noon you had AWA uh, and all the matches were recorded in Winnipeg. And then one o'clock was Maple Leaf wrestling. Uh, at two o'clock, there was an hour of roller derby. That's how I fell in love with skinny mini Miller. And then at three o'clock we got from BC, um, Al Tomko's promotion. Mm -hmm. So like you could park it from, from noon to four every Saturday when other kids were out there being productive and having fun and playing hockey and get, doing things that were healthy for them. We we're just, you know, roasting our own brains, watching three different promotions. But the great thing about Maple Leaf was that's when uh, Tunney had the, uh, the association with Crockett. And so you get great mid Atlantic wrestling and you get like hot matches and everything at Maple Leaf gardens. Like when the association, and you guys know this, like that association worked, like he would, uh, Mid Atlantic would lend talent to 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 Tunny, but the deal was, I think it was the was it the top three matches had to be Mid Atlantic matches. So you got to see like Blackjack Mulligan and John Studd Texas Death matches, which were great. Um, the first main event I ever saw, and it wrecked all of wrestling for me, was over the U.S. title, the Mid Atlantic U.S. title, Ricky Steamboat and Ric Flair. Yeah. But great, like like Slaughter and Kernoodle, uh, Steamboat and Youngblood, like great tag teams, great like a, a mass superstar. Who I I still think, and maybe you guys can correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think history has been kind enough to, as far as him being a performer, being that size and that athletic, and having that ability. Uh, to draw money and headline wherever he went. Uh, I, I, I pick your promotion like WWWF, NWA. Like he was, he was monster everywhere. But we got to see all these performers because of that association between Maple Leaf and Mid Atlantic. So I kind of felt spoiled as I look back on it now. And now that I think about it, there was also Mexican. I can't remember which promotion it was, but there was. I think it was at four o'clock or maybe five o'clock as well uh, on one of the channels. So and and and, you know, and then there was um. Uh, George Crabby Buchanan's promotion. Milton Ruskin was uh, the lead announcer right. here out of Montreal. Yeah, so yeah, we got Montreal. to got to see all that. So, man, you know, I I did a lot of ironing 
uh, back as a kid. I ironed the couch with my ass and I watched professional <laughs> wrestling all day on Saturdays. And then at night it was hockey night in Canada. I wanted to uh, just, just circle back to the the off the record uh, stuff that you were mentioning because sure. you and I chatted about this, this a while back when we had Landsberg on the show, and that was in the summer of 1999. You guys uprooted and went down to Stanford to do a number of oh, sit boy. downs yep. with with the McMahon family. So to put into context, this is about two months after Owen Hart's death, and yeah. the WWF is kind of on a you know. A campaign, I think, to put themselves in a more favorable light. And you were at the center of this as one of the writers on Off the Record. Well, tell me a bit about that experience being down in at Titan Towers to do yeah. all of these these interviews. I think it was like three shows you guys produced. Yeah. And and you're right. Like, make no mistake about it. This was the WWF charm offensive. This was like this was not a mistake. This was not coincidental that, you know, as the McMahons were, you know, getting torn apart. Uh, over what happened at Kemper Arena. Um, they wanted to put forward a face that this is a family company. And here's Steph, and here's Shane, and here's Vince, the father. And I'm going to talk to you as if I'm a concerned parent. Like, I, I don't want to be so callous as to say that for them it was an angle and they were just doing, you know, nice guy promos or parental promos to try to get themselves over as as uh, as being, um, as having feelings <laughs> <laughs> and and being human beings uh, about the entire thing, but it, it very much did have that vibe. But I can recall uh, Vince McMahon saying to me, and you guys will like this, uh, because right before we went to Stanford to do these interviews, um, Terry Bollea, Hulk Hogan, was on with Larry King, just mm -hmm. destroying Vince McMahon, destroying Vince McMahon, what he does to the industry, what he did to him, how he rides his guys hot and just leaves a husk of a shell of a performer when he's done with them. Like Hogan went, Hogan went hard at Vince McMahon. And uh, I asked him about it. This wasn't on camera. This is just after all the shows were done. And I said, did you see Hulk on Larry King? He said, oh yeah, I, I watched that. And I said, what did you think? And he paused because it was all about how he treats performers. He paused and he said something that I will never forget in my life. And it was total promo. This wasn't Vince McMahon, human being. This was like Mr. McMahon, the performer. He said to me, I'm a carnivore. And when I eat, I want to have the tenderest, juiciest piece of meat in front of me. And if it makes my stomach upset in the morning, so be it. And <laughs> the glasses back on. And I was just honestly, I had my jaw hit. I'm like, is that a human being or is that just like a real life promo? If that makes my stomach upset in the morning, so be it. And now, the other was, side of that, that coin is, is that uh, years <laughs> later, this man also suffered from diverticulitis. So, I mean, there is that warning that comes with being. A, well, uh, and uh, that's what that's why I've been a vegan going back to 2008. Yes. Well, <laughs> I would tell me as well about some of the um, the challenges that come with a format that is 22 minutes with with a Vince McMahon and. Like certainly he's, you can come at it from so smart. many different angles. Tell me a bit he's about smart. the structuring of that. He's he's smart. He's really smart. Um, and I, th I think um, like uh, the sport that I cover now is, is, uh, is hockey and NHL commissioner Gary Batman is really good at this as well. When you're interviewing someone who understands the format and understands the authority of time, like you're right. Like it may feel like you have all the time in the world, but really it's 22 minutes. Like that's what you got. You got to get to your stop set and this is how it's all going to be formatted. So what McMahon is great at is, and the whole family's like this, the power of the pause, the power of slowing things down in order to eat the clock and trailing down on your speech to make it, to give the appearance that what you're saying, all the words have a certain, hmm, how shall we say gravity? But really what you're doing is you're stretching it out. So I don't think that that like these 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 people are are, are masters of, of understanding the art of an interview. There's only one thing. And again, this is all hindsight is 2020. Uh, I remember flying back from uh, from Connecticut and I'm sitting there and I'm thinking about all the stuff that we shot. 
and talking with Landsberg and, and Makowitz, and it dawns on me the most obvious question that we didn't get to. And I'm like, that's my failure as one of the writers on the show. One of the questions that I should have fed Landsberg or helped work with Michael on, on putting out there was, Vince, what if that wasn't Owen Hart? What if that was your son? Would you have stopped the show? And there's really no answer. Because on the one hand, if you say no, you come across as callous and you betray everything you're trying to portray right now. Vince, and Linda and Steph and Shane, like we're the family here. So if you say yes, then you come across as callous. If you say no, you come across as callous as well. There's only one way out of it. And I'm pretty sure he would have chosen this answer. But again, this is like on the fly and you got to rely on your brain moving quickly here. The right answer probably would have been, I shouldn't make that decision at that time. I would have handed it over to Pat Patterson, or I would have handed it over to someone else. That shouldn't be my decision because I am too emotionally invested in that moment. Would he have given that answer? I don't know. And we'll never know. But the one thing that I, and John, you and I have talked about this before. The one thing that I always take away from uh, that whole episode at Kemper Arena, whether it's show went on the McMahons, the, you know, the, the entire tragedy, um, what happened psychologically to all those performers that saw a colleague pass away in the ring. I still don't know how the Kansas city police didn't stop the event and say, this is a potential crime scene. Nobody touch anything. Everybody leave now. That's the one that I've, I've and I don't know, at least I don't cover it anymore. So like you guys can tell me if, if Kansas City Police has ever commented on why they didn't stop the event after someone died on the stage. It's, I don't know. It's a great unanswered question that like this was a crime scene that we not only been. had 10,000 witnesses to, but that we had yeah. active performers coming out performing on top of this crime scene. And you just you just look at it and. I mean, you, you tell me, Jeff, like the equivalent of of a hockey player dying on the ice and Game's how over. that how that Game's would be treated. Over. Game's over. We uh, we saw that in England um, where a player had his throat sliced and the game stopped. The game stopped. The team didn't come back for I think it was a couple a couple of weeks. I mean, just the the, the trauma and the tragedy. Um, yeah, that that that's that's one that I still look at, you know, and and I go back to and I say, like, how did they not? Like, how, how did they not just say, like, OK, everyone, this is over. Uh, and you talk like you, you've talked to all the performers afterwards and they've probably all told you, like, they don't remember the matches like they were zombies at that point. Like, on the one hand, you're trying to process that that Owen Hart is, has passed away and you got to, OK, this spot, that spot, I got to go. Here's our finish. And what's my time? And like it's it was it was a, a horrible situation for uh, for everybody involved. It's um. It's awful. Like it's 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 the it's the worst thing that I've ever had to cover um, in professional wrestling. And I can remember making phone calls that day. And you know, I remember uh, Wayne Ferris, Honky Tonk Man, saying, "You guys are getting played. It's work. Um, I'm not going to fall for it. I'm not going to come on and embarrass myself and come on the radio and talk about this because this is an angle. This is a work. You guys are getting like, oh, like he's like Wayne. He's he's dead. I'm not buying it. You guys are falling for it. I'm not going to be part of it." And then I remember talking to uh, to Terry Funk as well that night, and he said, "I'd love to come on, but I'm too angry at Vince McMahon. I'll say something that I'll regret." And he was hot. I don't know that I've ever heard Terry Funk that hot before. Mm. Um, you know, sadly, it, in professional wrestling, um, it it felt like it, certainly for uh, much of the 2000s episodes and topics like these were certainly not uncommon. Um, I and yeah. I, f I feel like it, it takes maybe you know the type of um, maybe broadcasting that you might have sort of helped it, um, you know push out to the audience in, in in this more of a in depth sort of like thoughtful discussion about professional wrestling that that provides a form in order to like you know talk about something like this in in a maybe sort of um I don't know like in in a way that that I think um these sort of topics demand um. Mm -hmm. What, you know, did you always feel like there was a market for this sort of discussion of professional wrestling? You know? Market market's an interesting word because that implies um, uh, commerce. <laughs> I didn't know that it would that it would be something that you know could be a career. 
Um, I thought it was interesting, and I thought that there would be a, a lot of um, like-minded people. And as we found, there were a, a lot that 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 they themselves talked about the industry the way that our show did, uh, and the way that everybody on our show did, and they were curious about it. Um, and I, I think that at the end of it, and I, I I still follow the exact same philosophy in my career now that I did in professional wrestling, and that is every show you have to answer one question. And that question is, tell me something I didn't know. Well, that's more of a statement, really, Jeff. But uh, that, that statement is, tell me something that I didn't know. Like, it's, I, I feel if, if you're going to be presenting, if you're going to have an information-based property as opposed to a personality-based property, you have to do the anthropology. Like, you have to go out and find things and bring them back. Like, you have to be the one, you know, taking the jug to the river to bring the water back to the village, like that's your responsibility as a broadcaster. So the way that I covered that is the same way that I cover hockey is the same way that really I would cover any sport or any topic that I was, um, that I was, that I was, that I was doing um, at the end of it. I think it's your responsibility to tell people something that they didn't know. And if you can do that consistently enough, I mean, that's probably a, a good format for success or a good strategy for success. But honestly, that's the only thing that I went into every show thinking, am I telling people something that they didn't otherwise know? Because nothing that I do is going to be involved. Like I'm not going to have, have any sort of personality based um, property because I don't think that I can be as a personality that consistently interesting. The only thing that I can do is sort of put frames around things and find information. You know, the frame being that area where, you know, um, uh, life stops and art begins. Like I'm interested in that part of media. Give me that frame. I think frames are really important because again, like I mentioned, life is stopping here. Art is stopping there. In between is the frame. If you can exist there and join those two things, then I, I, I think you have a, a recipe for success. And that's kind of the way that I approached professional wrestling. And that's the same way that I approach uh, hockey, which I cover on a daily basis now. A show that we sometimes uh, cite, um, a very famous one that you might not even remember, Jeff, but I think it's the marriage of all those elements, was uh -oh. a week that you uh, manned the show solo, and you just did a page-by-page -page review of Hulk Hogan's first book that came out, and it was just <laughs> fact-checking every page. It was the most riveting two hours oh, yeah. that I wish so much existed out there, because it was incredible. It was just page-by-page-by-page. -by -page -by -page. And you had just, you just, I remember bounced. that. It was like, it, it's to me, it's the all time but it was, of a book. But it was easy, right? Like, okay, pat myself on the back too. But that's like not even shooting fish in a barrel. That's like shooting fish in a barrel full of Vaseline. The fish aren't even moving. Like, it's it, honestly, it was, it was one of the easiest things to do. I'll tell you, I got in a lot of trouble with that. I shouldn't say trouble. I had a lot of people angry at me about that book. And it starts with Carl DeMarco. And I remember at a house show, um, I remember I was either backstage or on the floor and DeMarco came up to me and like, and just like ripped into me. And I kept coming back with the same thing. Tell me one thing, Carl, that I said that was wrong. Well, that's not the point. You can't, you can't, you shouldn't be doing this. And you're like, Carl, tell me one thing that I said that wasn't wrong, whether it was matches that never happened, whether it was attendance figures, whether like take your pick. Like, choose any of them. Like, I'm happy to be wrong. I like when I'm wrong. That's the only way any of us grow is, uh, as other, you know, broadcasters, journalists, whatever you want to call us. Um, I just said, Carl, tell me one thing that I said that was wrong. And he couldn't. And it didn't calm him down. I'm sure that someone told him, hey, go tear a strip off that smart ass. Um, and he did. Or maybe he just, like, felt that it was his obligation um, as a head of WWF Canada to, to do so. Uh, because that's a ma major property for them. And that was in their mind, I guess, being attacked. Um, but if you're going to put forward a book like that, you have to expect that someone's going to call BS on it. Like Come that on just, next week, that's just, Come on the air just, two hours, that's just you get your rebuttal. Baked into the pie. Yeah. Like, uh, but that's just it, right? Like, listen, I'm happy for him. To, I would have been happy for him to come on. And I will just like, here's here's the stage tell all of our listeners everything that I said that was a lie or just tell them one thing that I said was a lie. I, I, I just remember flipping through it and going like, I can't believe that I'm reading this. 
like I really don't like it when, especially in pro wrestling, because it happens. I don't know if it still happens as much as it did before, but so much of, you know, what was put forward. I mean, I guess everything's a work and everything's a con and we all understand how the industry works, but so much of it was just sort of I just looked at it. And I'm like, this is really insulting. Like this is really insulting to wrestling fans. And I just don't like wrestling fans being talked to like that um, by performers or promoters or by anyone really for that matter. So I don't know, but for some reason that book really, like, I'm sure there's historical inaccuracies in plenty of books. Like before we hopped on, I told you, I just picked up this book again. Yes. and started reading it, drawing he, Jim Friedman, which is a fantastic Classic. week. Oh, it's so good. I'm sure there's stuff in here that I'm probably not even aware of that, you know, there's what are they say in the Simpsons, Lionel Hutz, there's the truth. And then there's the truth. Um, I'm sure there's parts of this that are totally legit, but just the Hogan book, like consistently every page seemed really heavy to turn because I'm like, there's so many lies here. It weighs the paper down as I'm trying to, to they're like, screw it. We just got to go game seven on this thing. And that's what we did that show. I remember that one. I got Do you have time for, for, for one last topic, Jeff. I got, yeah, I got time. So we uh, we have not brought up uh, CM Punk yet, and um, <laughs> you, you you chatted about this uh, after his yeah. return at the Survivor yeah. Series, and I think anyone uh, I know yeah. we have a, a number of listeners out there that that would know um, your, your history with him. But uh, yeah. can you just explain a bit about the, the hockey connection and how you two kind of came into contact a few years ago? Sure. So what the NHL does every year, and now they do it for Europe as well. But what they used to used to normally do is they used to have what they call the the NHL Media Tour. And what it is, is a two-day event where all the teams send one or sometimes two of their top players. And all the rights holders get chances to interview them, you shoot promos, um, things that show up sort of uh, over the course of the year, whether it's in commercials or promotions for games and all that. Uh, you do some stuff on the ice. And Elliot and I, the guy that I host 32 Thoughts with, um, we always have like a run of like 20 players that we end up interviewing. And one of our producers came up with a great idea. So they used to always do this in Chicago. Now they do it in Vegas for the North American players. Uh, and it changes in Europe for the European players. Last year we were in Paris. This year we were in Stockholm. So this would have been when it was in Chicago. And one of our producers, who's also a wrestling fan, and you'll find a lot of wrestling fans in hockey media, I'll tell you, oh, man, yeah. they are everywhere, said, you know, thought to himself, it would be really cool if CM Punk, Phil Brooks, would sit in on an interview with Jonathan Taves, the captain of the Chicago Blackhawks. He's a huge Blackhawks fan. He lives in Chicago. So our producer called him up and, you know, he has a certain fee um, for what he does. And it was like way more than we're going to pay in sports that, but good on Phil. He said, you know what? Screw my normal fee. I'll do it for like, I think he did it for like one tenth of what he normally does. He said, look, listen, I, it's just going to be fun. And he like, he knows all these Blackhawks players. There's a great shot. There's Phil. There's, there, there's Elliot. And look at my dumb smile. Um, he said like, look, this is just going to be, this is just going to be a good time. Like, okay, well, this will be fun. We're doing down the Taves on the second day. So just show up for that one. And if we can do like a 20 minute interview with you after for the podcast, that'd be great because we have a lot of wrestling fans that listen to the 32 thoughts hockey pod. But here's the pro that Phil is. He showed up on the first day and said, do you mind if I just sit in to listen to how you guys do this? And so I get a sense of what you expect out of me. This is a non-paid day. He just showed up, spent the whole day in the room with Crosby, Ovechkin, like superstars. And Phil just sat there. And as guys would leave the room, it was funny. There's a lot of hockey players that are wrestling fans. Like, is that CM Punk? Because I like CM Punk like sitting in the corner while you guys are doing all these interviews. And then Taves was on the on the second day and he sat in and told some great stories with uh, with Taves about, you know, celebrations for the Stanley Cup and his history with hockey and how much he loves the Hawks, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then for the uh, for the interview that we did with him, he's like, look, we can we can go Broadway if you want. Like, don't feel like you only need to do 10 minutes. Like you got me for the day. Like, use me, use me, use me. So it was great stories of you know, Harley race and his history in, in wrestling. And that's really where this sort of quasi friendship sort of began with Phil. Like I was always a fan. I always loved him. Um, I think he's just a, a, a tremendous performer and a highly, highly intelligent person. 
Um, and what I like about what I like about Phil is, and I'm sure you guys have met people like this in your lives as well. There are people that dip their toe into the water, and then there are those that just dive into the pool and will put themselves out there and will try new things in order to grow, in order to make themselves better. Like, I'm sorry. I don't care how you do in a UFC fight. I've always thought about what happens in your brain when you hear the door close. Like, what happens? And there's one person in there, the referee, who's separating you from your demise goes through your head like and phil puts himself in these situations as a way to grow does he get criticized absolutely does it change the way he feels or behaves not at all like there, there's an old saying dogs don't bark at parked cars and i think phil understands that maybe more than anybody else he will deliberately put himself in situations that are good and healthy for him as a human being because he will grow because of it knowing full well he's going to get criticized you know there's a there's a great old story in the 1970s the philadelphia flyers and the nhl were like a combination of toughness and skill and they had a guy by the name of dave the hammer schultz who set the nhl penalty minute record with getting 472 penalty minutes and there was one cover issue of the hockey news and i had a picture of dave and he's fighting long hair big mustache looking real tough and the headline is dave schultz is ruining hockey and schultz goes into his head coach fred shiro's office and says like like my parents back in saskatchewan like they they'll they read the hockey news like all my friends my family everyone's gonna see this this is terrible this is this is awful like i'm embarrassed and fred said oh you 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 want this to stop you don't like this and Dave said, no, I, I don't like this. Like, this is this is, this is is terrible. And Shira said, okay, well, you can solve this really quickly. And Dave said, yeah, what do I do? He said, it's really simple. Say nothing, do nothing, be nothing. Now get out of my office. <laughs> I always felt that way about CM Punk. He understands that when you're doing something, that's when you get criticized. When you're doing something different, that's when you really get criticized. But that's the only way you're going to grow as either a person or a performer. I know Phil has his detractors. I understand that. I get it. But I have all day for someone that thinks like that. Like to me, the most impressive thing about Phil is his brain and how he thinks. And he's got great stories. And we have a mutual love of Harley Race and Mitsuhara Misawa. And I don't really talk to him a whole lot about his day to day at all when we text or, or talk i talk to him about old wrestling stories and he talks to me about the chicago blackhawks it's like a picking of each other's brain it's one of the it's one of the coolest relationships that i have and i got i got a lot of time for that guy right there well to your point i mean since he's come back number one he is the biggest star in the industry as we speak and I mean, this guy's spending his days off going down to the performance center and working with with younger talent. I mean, like it's like it's it's all or nothing. And he's all in yeah. on, on this run. If you're in for a penny, you're in for a pound. That's how that's how he that's what, what he believes. Like if you're going to do it, really, really do it. You know, Sam Kinison used to have the great line. If you're going to miss heaven, don't miss it by two inches. Yeah. Um, and Phil, like if he's going to do something like none, none of that surprises me, even just by that tiny little thing at the NHL players tour showing up for the full day unpaid just to see how you guys do this. And really, I mean, it's really boring. Like we sit there and there's two microphones and we ask a bunch of hockey players, goofy hockey questions like Phil, we're not trying to put a man on the moon here. Phil, we're not trying to crack the atom. Like there's no like grand reveal, like the, the, the some some big secret. Ignore the man behind the curtain, like it's Oz. So it's just you know two hockey schmucks in Canada talking to hockey players. But for Phil, it was important that he understood everything that he was about to walk into. I I'm I'm endlessly impressed by 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 Phil Brooks. Well, Jeff, we are. It, so, it sounds like I'm about to say that he invented oxygen too, isn't it? Like I'm gushing about like he's invented oxygen as well. I'll throw that in. And he invented oxygen, ladies and gentlemen. And They'll save that for oxygen. Mania season. That'll be okay. The, very the, good the character reveal. But Jeff, uh, thank you so much for for jumping on with us. Of course, I'm sure many of you already listeners of Thirty Two Thoughts, the podcast, and the named after himself, the Jeff Merrick Show, weekdays noon to two p.m. Two things as I, as I wrap up, then thank you very much. You, uh, you, you read that just as I wrote it. Thanks, John. 
Yes. Um, a couple of things. I hate the name, the Jeff Merrick show. There's that element of, uh, you know, staring at a mirror or, Oh, look, there's my navel. I wanted to call the show rink fries. Uh, but everybody above me said, Jeff, that's a terrible name. So we're just going to name it after you. Uh, secondly, you know what I always think about at this time of year, how lucky I was. We talked earlier about how lucky I was as a kid, you know, growing up and being able to watch a lot of wrestling on television. Toronto was great in the seventies and eighties because Tony would always run a boxing day show. And for a lot of guys that were on the road, maybe didn't have a family, or maybe didn't want to go see their family around Christmas time, they could always get a really good payday at Maple Leaf Gardens on Boxing Day. It was the only promotion that ran, and that's where you got to see, you know, Dory Funk Jr. I never got to see Dory Funk Jr., but I saw him on Boxing Day. That's where I got to see Austin Idol. I never saw Austin Idol live, but I did on Boxing Day. The Assassins go right down the list. Boxing Day was always a special day because for Toronto wrestling fans, and I believe they used to pack the place too, you could see a lot of performers at other from other territories that otherwise you couldn't see because that was the only promotion running. And I'm sure, guys, that the payoffs were pretty juicy because they were the only show in North America. Jeff, a happy holiday season to you. And uh, if thanks, you, boys. Uh, do hit us up if you uh, if you go out this uh, this holiday season to check out uh, the Von Eric film that is uh, coming out. I just saw the promo for it this weekend. It looks really good. I really hope. Hope that it's historically accurate. And I know that it's a story and you got to play fast and loose sometimes, but the story is good enough for real that you don't have to fluff it up, right? Like, I'm looking for it. Text me after. Text me after. Okay. All right. You're going to shatter my myths about this one, too. Thanks, John. A big thank you to Jeff Merrick of Rogers Sportsnet and the appropriately named The Jeff Merrick Show. What a what an honor, honestly. I the first time I've I've had a chance to speak to Jeff Merrick um on on the airwaves at least, you know. I had like one interaction with him. I doubt he ever remembers this, but I had one interaction with him um around high um high park. Like I okay. just saw him walking down the street. I'm like, hey, I know are you're Jeff Merrick. And um was this yeah. a long time ago? No, it was after I was doing the shows, and I guess he had recognized, recognized me from you know doing podcasts with you as well. So because we um, stay in touch and he always brings you up and stuff like that. And I've always really? been curious. And I was like, have you two like crossed paths over the years? And I've always just assumed like you must have at some point, although I did in my head. I mean, him and I didn't te- like when I worked on the website, it was with Jeff and like he was the one I, I dealt with. So we always had like a kind of like I knew him, but actually working on the law, he had left the show the summer and I started like in, in the fall. So Hmm. we didn't actually work on the Sunday night show together, but we've, I mean, I've been, you know, um, I I think I first met him around 99 around that time. When you were 15, 15, 16 years old around, around that time. Yes. So incredible more than half your life ago. Um, yeah, no, honestly, he was, it was his appearance on off the record that actually even got me, um, listening to the law. So, uh i mean in my books like a a legend you know around these parts well we thank jeff merrick uh, very much for joining us and uh some great stories from his days of covering wrestling and now one of the top authorities in hockey not just in canada i would say in the entire hockey industry so someone uh, very well known in uh, many different circles but definitely in the pro wrestling space as well so we are going to keep chugging along because we have there there were a lot of RSVPs that were sent back this year when we sent out the invites for the post wrestling Christmas party. And our next guests are going to join us and we will see if they can clock in at 15 minutes or less. Well, way as we answer the door and more guests join us for the Christmas show. Joining us now, they are on a collision course with the holidays. It is Kate from Montreal and John Sino. Hello, Kate. Hey, ding dong, hello. And Mr. Sino, welcome back. Good morning. Merry Christmas to all here on this very festive post-wrestling Christmas show. Always an honor to be on these shows. Well, John, I want to ask you about the the dichotomy of having uh, a show like Collision Course where you can go deep into every angle, every match, every thought versus your 15 minute format. You kind of get to review wrestling in every kind of conceivable way, shorthand, longhand, you do it all. 
Yeah, I mean, a collision course, obviously, you have a more of a, a microscope look to it. You know, I'm, I'm analyzing every single detail, every single backstage segment, every word that's being spoken by any of these talents on the show. Um, opposed to Shot of Dark Words, I'm kind of trying to find, like, the key spots of every show. I'm not going to go through every single backstage promo on an MLW or NWA. Uh, trust me, I don't want to go through some of those backstage segments. But I try to, like, bring at least the key elements to it. But like I said, with Collision, I'm definitely looking through with a more um, thorough view uh, every single detail from production to just what the way the commercial breaks come in and whatnot and i have to admit the last year or so aw like when i started doing the dynamo reports it was so freaking hectic but now i feel like they've definitely i don't know what it is but they definitely found the click with their shows on how they're formatting it it's making it a lot more easier to not only view it and talk about it but to also write it as a as a reporter okay you would agree? you yeah i was gonna ask the same question kate have you noticed like like a change to the pace of, of aew especially now that you're you're, you're you've been watching the, this whole time but now also kind of you know you're, you're note-taking having talk about this after i i definitely have sensed like at least dynamite my, my head spins a bit less than, than it was at, at other times for, for for better or worse yeah i think that you can definitely tell that they're not trying to fit everything that they need to into one show it, the, the collision has given them a sort of room to breathe i think with collision it was almost like they did start off a little bit slower with that sort of letting it find its feet and now it's expanded so that both shows have a good balance of uh of things on them actually and i actually find too that whether or not it's related that rampage in the last couple of months has has improved as well i guess it uh they've been doing a good job of sort of at least sticking like one marquee match on there but yeah i'm really enjoying it and certainly i guess i've uh, I've only ever sort of commented on Dynamite a couple times, so I'm not as familiar. Like, I didn't have to go through the uh, the hecticness that was uh, taking notes for Dynamite. But certainly I could see uh, there have been times when I've just wept for whoever has been taking notes because it, uh, it was over the top. And I think, yeah, they, they're, they've got a... a, a good balance going i think that the the c2 the uh like i almost said the collision course tournament that's the, the original continental C2. classic yeah exactly that it's all about us the continental classic has sort of created more of a balance uh between shows as well you know it, it i i definitely agree that i think the shows are, are paced better um I would say the quality of the shows is still pretty high overall. Um, that said, this has been a year where I think it, the AEW product has maybe been met with more criticism than um, years past. And why? Why do you think, um, for in both of your uh, opinions, that might be? I think because WWE has turned into a hotter property. I think that I actually think that that AEW last year sort of struggled a bit more with focus and with compelling storytelling but this year has come in for more criticism i would say some of it very valid some of it uh hyperbolic but the biggest thing that's happened to them is that wwe have pulled themselves up by their bootstraps a little bit and they've been delivering a product that their fans are happier with which has opened the door like when something is not sort of the a not the new exciting thing and b not the kind of only game in town for more hardcore wrestling fans then yeah you're gonna get more criticism i wanted to ask you john because you have a very unique perspective because you also do work at cage match and i'm just interested to hear kind of your thoughts like when you are you know, involved in a database like that, that is a lot of user generated reviews and you see firsthand reactions to these shows on the extremes and such. Can you just give us any kind of insight that you see on a, on a day to day basis when it comes to the, the hotness of a WWE product and where people stand in relation to AEW over the past year? Yeah, uh, it's been really bad this uh, last year with the um the ratings in Cage Match, um especially with me because a lot of this updating I'm doing in Cage Match, I'm usually the one doing it in real time because with the, with the time zones I'm usually like watching Raw or AW Live while I'm doing the report. I'll also be updating the the match times and the results on Cage Match, so I'll see a lot of the res a lot of the ratings and comments in real time, and it's so bad. Like 
as soon as the CM Punk and Elite stuff happened, every CM Punk match was was rated zero, and every Elite match was rated ten, and same thing. It's like tribalism within AEW as well as AEW versus WWE. So they tried a lot of things, like they tried to d- delay the time that you could rate your shows, but. It, it, this, it still comes in, unfortunately. We still get bombarded with zeros every Monday Night Raw and tens every Dynamite and vice versa. And um, just like the emails that we get from like um, the 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 users are like, you know, they're they're trying to like point out specific users saying hey, this gentleman here is always rating uh, CM Punk matches high, and this like it's like a lot of like pointing fingers, and it's it's really sad. I try to like not watch all that and try to this year I've, I've realized I've stayed a lot off off of social media a lot, and that. Um, partakes to the cage match like emails I, I can't I can't like just take all this tribalism it's too much and it kind of like it makes me not enjoy the product as much when I have like just all these like people just just saying whatever these you know despicable things about certain product and it's like I'd rather just not read in, into any of that and just try to make my own judgments and my own um uh, results coming out of these shows I feel like I, I can't just listen to anybody else honestly especially this year I've, I've realized that the most has has the tribalism maybe affected you in the same way or are you able to do you feel any differently about it kate i i feel the same way i i have although uh, i still spend uh, a fair amount of time on social media i've learned to mute terms i'm a lot quicker than i used to be with muting or blocking people and uh, i think that uh, I lose patience very quickly with anyone I sort of perceive as having an a, a, an agenda or really I, I have a, a very low tolerance I find for hypocrisy. Like that actually bothers me. And that comes out a lot in tribalism where people will criticize one thing in one company and not criticize it in the other. It's so silly. And I guess it is something that you run into when you have to – uh, two large competitors in the same space uh, as if having choice is a bad thing that you, but you just get this, you know, someone wants to, someone wants to win. Someone wants to have all the viewers. Someone wants to be the only option. And that's so, and that's so nonsensical to me. And yet you always get it, not just with wrestling. Yeah. So much of it, I think is, is actually maybe, encourage um maybe not to the extent that i think we see it on social media but on some level i mean a co- having a competitor brand encourages you know th- these comparisons and discussions like these um but definitely um there are people that might end up taking it too far um i want to maybe ask you kate about um you know th- we, we've talked a lot about uh the state of women's wrestling in AEW in the past and how would you assess 2023 for uh, Tony Khan's products, whether AEW or ROH in women's wrestling? It's a very interesting dichotomy with ROH versus the rest of AEW because ROH is a show that is booked without having to worry about TV ratings. And this has always been the thing that Tony Khan has gone back to. It's, well, the women don't, they don't get the ratings. And there are some historical reasons for that. But one of the big reasons is that they're not really given a consistent presence. So it becomes this vicious circle. I think that with Ring of Honor, you see that there was a great willingness to push women's talent there are multiple women's matches on every show right now they have a couple of storylines going and of course with athena which is the biggest storyline they have going and now they've had the women's title main event two shows in a row but that is not spilling over onto tv uh in any time now the funny thing is that i think if you'd asked me this last week i would have been even a lot more negative because in the last Literally in the last week, I think you've finally seen some progress on uh, on television for AEW, and I'm hopeful that will continue. But uh, I've said that phrase a lot, and so I'm to say cautiously under uh, cautiously optimistic would be understating it. I am extremely cautious. Are you trying to tell us that this last week was a make good by Tony Khan after you acquired COVID at the Montreal shows? Was this uh was was this the trade off? Of course it was. <laughs> um, as well, John, when you kind of look at the state of Collision, like this has been a really interesting show. That miraculously, like this has been six months that we've had this show, and it feels as though it has gone through multiple chapters this year from 
the CM Punk show to CM Punk is not there. I think that a, a quiet aspect of collision has been, I think how much Brian Danielson has sort of bridged this gap. Like when you look at the weeks he's been on and that he like just this, um, a few weeks ago when they went against deadline, they performed very well with like the best they've performed against an NXT show. And how would you assess like the addition of these two hours and the impact it's had on the, on, on AEW as a whole, asking your fans for two more hours and trying to differentiate it somewhat from dynamite. Yeah. I mean, when it was initially launched, it was, it was really exciting and just very mysterious, right? Like this is like the other show. This is a show where all the, the misfit toys go to like, this is a CM Punk show. You know, are we going to get Thunder Rosa exclusively on here? Andrade exclusively on here. And obviously with CM Punk out of the picture, the question was like, well, whose show is it going to be? And it kind of like, didn't really become anybody's specific show. It's kind of like still in a way like the the other show because we still see some some competitors like House of Black exclusively on there and whatnot. Um, but I, I feel like it's kind of gotten like lost in a way. It, it feels like it is a, a carbon copy of Dynamite, and that's not like a bad thing or or a, or a good thing really. But it's like there isn't too much difference between a Dynamite and a Collision up, uh, opposed to like the um, the cold open in the beginning is like the main difference really. But as far as like the layout of the show, it's pretty much the same, and that was like one of my worries going into it was, is it just going to be the same thing as a, as a rampage or a dynamite or is it actually going to stand out? And obviously this stand out in the beginning because we had like CM Punk exclusively on there, but now it's just like, it's another great show. Don't get me wrong. It's two hours of great television. The, um, the content, the classic obviously has, has helped out the wrestling part of it, but it hasn't really done anything to kind of stand out where it's like, you have to watch this. It's like, no, you can just watch dynamite and pretty much get the same amount of good wrestling. And they most likely will update you on most of the storylines that you might've missed on a collision. Uh, it may be as interesting as like, you know, AEW's plans for collision as well as rampage. I, I, I find even more fascinating maybe the past year for Ring of Honor and everything that might have uh, changed. I still don't have that much clarity about Tony's, you know, intent for Ring of Honor or what current plans are. Um, watching over the past year and maybe looking ahead, especially after Final Battle and, and having that being an exclusive on Honor Club. Um, what do you both anticipate? you know, for Ring of Honor's distinction within the AEW sort of ecosystem. I really wish that he would find someone to hand this off to, to sort of make it into its own thing, because Tony has way too much on his plate. And as a result, Ring of Honor often feels and probably is an afterthought. I, uh, I think that there is a lot of potential there. They actually have a good sort of, unofficial but regular roster people uh, like people doing their own things they've developed a few stories there that have that have generally worked out pretty well but it needs to be its own thing now and someone needs to be paying close attention to make sure that there's consistency week to week because it can vary a lot one week you'll get like a whole bunch of just squash matches against local talent or unsigned talent and another week it'll actually be sort of building storylines it'll be building up their their characters it's the inconsistency that needs to be fixed yeah i mean one of the the worries this year has been about aw like losing its cool factor and like the way i measure that is by talking to people that i don't talk to in the post network people that like i work with or just friends that don't really watch wrestling as as uh, we do obviously and like last year the year before aw was like the cool thing people that don't even watch wrestling were going to um arthur ash stadium to watch grand slam this past year i knew nobody that went so it felt like aw went from the cool talk to like nxt being like the cool talk people are like oh who's this carmelo hayes and uh, who's um tiffany stratton so so what ROH could have had, I think if, if this was what you know what they say is true about them turning down a CW deal, if they were able to go to the CW network, they could have taken so much of that cool factor. Because I know people that just watch regular TV here, they, they might stumble on a Channel 11, which is the CW here, and they might run into a Ring of Honor, and they'll see like a Dalton Casper, and go, who's this? Or they'll see like uh, Athena and a Billy Starks feud, and that would, would cater to like that type of demographic of like teenagers, early 20s, that are into like the CW shows that would think that NXT is cool. They would have been able to pick up that on a Ring of Honor. Now with this being behind a paywall, and not being structured, like Kate said, like one week it's like two hours, one week it's just squash matches. Being on a CW would have formatted to an hour, maybe two hour show, and actually had that structure, and it would have actually given the, the, the cool factor. People could have stumbled against a Ring of Honor. Now it's like, unless you're an AEW fan, you're not really going to know about Ring of Honor, and that's the issue. It's like, okay, yeah, I know about Ring of Honor because I watch AEW, but the normal fan that could have just bumped into the channel and, and, and noticed the Ring of Honor, that's what they, they, they should have gotten to get in that kind of that cool factor back, I feel like. Yeah, I've 
I, it was sort of like striking with me, like watching a bit more like West Coast Pro this year was, you know, just because of the parallel with, with Chris Hero attached to like b- both sides there. I was like, this is what the feel of ROH should be like these, you know, you get these interesting, like legendary Japanese figures that might parachute in, but it's off the backs of your Brian Keith's and, you know, your Starboard Charlie's and sort of that upcoming talent as well. But also having, I, th- I think, like a face to ROH. And I don't think Tony Khan should be your face of Ring of Honor. I think that it should be its its separate thing that is catering to something smaller by design, like which is what ROH is. I don't think anyone is putting this at a uh, an equal level to the AEW brand. So it's, I, I think, remains one that it lacks a an identity, but more so a goal, like what it's working towards. Like, is it a television property is it going to be strictly streaming and are we just like just being filmed inside of an arena for aew it just it does kind of give it that velocity feel that some good wrestling but you are kind of putting it in the shadow of the larger product and forcing your audience to kind of decipher between the two um on a positive note as we end this throwing out wwe and aew subject matter i'm curious from both of you of what companies you're looking for in the new year that might be able to put some momentum behind them that you're optimistic for given some moves that they could be making or that just overall can maybe break through to, you know, be, be in that conversation of like regular discussion among wrestling fans in a, in a positive sense. There are a bunch and uh, I'm going to steal John's thunder and say house of glory because I know that that's one that he goes to see quite frequently, but uh, that would be one West coast pro you mentioned that put on some great shows. I, they're, uh, also, uh, oh, you have out in the West. You have Defy. You have Deadlock Pro Wrestling. I think what's interesting is you have seen an interest from Fight, in particular, in bringing more wrestling on since they made this deal with GCW and they have MLW that on board already. So there is a certain appetite among streaming services to add wrestling to their assortment. Uh, the uh, In Canada, actually, I would be remiss if I did not mention C4, who, uh, who are just there easily putting on the, the, the best shows in the country. And I think that there are a lot of promotions that are, are doing good things who have already sort of a, they have because of geography or whatever, sort of semi-regular stable of performers. The one that stands out to me recently is Wrestling Revolver. Mm-hmm. because they have man I mean the the big coup that they had recently was getting Ronda Rousey in her return match and they have done a number of things this year that have made me sort of sit up and pay attention and I it does feel like they have a lot of momentum behind them there is a link with John Moxley which means that it's an easier for them to get AEW talent which is clearly an advantage in uh, in indie shows. And uh, I think some of them have proven very good at exploiting it. Yeah. Honestly, it's, it's what I found interesting was like, for example, this past year, we had the show on Netflix called the wrestlers. Now, mm-hmm. before that, I never really heard anybody talk about OVW at all, but as soon as that show aired, a lot of like non hardcore wrestling fans kind of got familiar with OVW. And, like, for example, like a Layla gray, she recently did like a signing at the house of glory show. And I heard some fans that came up to her, not really, familiar with her AEW or Ring of Honor work, but mostly just because of the Netflix shows. Oh, we saw you on The Wrestlers. Like, you know, I like to take a picture with you or whatnot. And even like some of the engagement on Cage Match, we're getting a lot more people actually viewing the OVW product and sending in results and match times because they got hooked to the show based on The Wrestlers. So I'm just curious if anybody else is going to cap- kind of capitalize off of that. I know you had like the Monster Factory had a show on Apple TV, but I'm I'm really curious to see if any other company might capitalize off of some streaming show, like some reality-based show. And that's something that like NWA and I has talked to about with CW and kind of using that as a way to kind of capitalize onto your main show itself and getting more engagement. So I'm really intrigued to see who will be the next company to do that. Could it be a House of Glory? Could it be NWA capitalizing off of CW? And my other company to look forward to in the year is TNA, obviously. I'm really intrigued on this rebranding. Obviously, they're bringing in some big names with their Las Vegas shows coming out in January. I'm just really intrigued on like what their whole look is going to be. Is it going to be like a total makeover? Is it going to be a total change of style in their presentation? So I'm really curious to see how they're going to uh, turn out in 2024. I think we can guarantee that uh, Scott Demore will continue his Paul Heyman promos where he has learned that screaming is the most effective motivator for a fan base. Um, and John and I are going to be back 
uh, right after Hard to Kill, and we will be reviewing that show. But every Saturday night, your appointment is with Kate and John for Collision Course on the Post Wrestling Cafe. And uh, I think you guys have done just a fantastic job together. Uh, we thank you very much for uh, covering Collision on a weekly basis for for everybody because uh, uh, people people need a break from myself and waiting in our voices. So uh, you two yeah, are. Uh, have been a, a great duo on uh, on the cafe, and we look forward to many more shows in 2024. Thank you Thank so you. much, and thanks, thanks for, for the, the opportunity. opportunity. John Sino and Kate from Montreal, which if you do look at her um, passport, it is first name Kate, last name from Montreal. Mm. Oh, I thought it was, it was always like um, Kate, middle name from, last name Montreal. It's actually, it's a hyphen last name. Yeah. Hyphenated last name. Okay. Well, if it's not, I I mean, I suggest that she would go and uh, go to the office and, and actually get that changed. Cause um, I, I have never actually had the discussion with her if she prefers the anonymity or if it was just the adoption of her call in handle that we have just assumed now that she has become uh, an on air presence. Well, right, right. in. she would write in, you know, on the forum. Sure. Um, yes. Well, she's done a lot less recently, Kate, you know, I, 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 um, I do check attendance, but well, um, I, I guess she's, she's taking her efforts and talents more to the, the airwaves, which we're all very grateful for. Um, but uh, a wonderful combination of hosts that um, we just kind of, <laughs> put together we you know um and i really enjoyed the, the the shows um i think they both i mean they're both great they were both great on their own already already doing like you know their own shows or or, or filling in uh from time to time but i think both of them have really blossomed into excellent broadcasters over the past several months yeah as i've said i've always i've always loved sino's concept of shot in the dark which i think was just a tremendous idea I, th I think more people could learn from the idea of like short form programming in a uh just podcasting in general that typically it's it's a time commitment to follow a show and for some people they just want like the cold notes of keeping up with a lot of companies that they don't have the time to watch and sino is super succinct but to contrast that with Collision Course, you get more of his opinions coming out and breaking down the show. And Kate's analysis, I think, is always uh, tremendous mm -hmm. that she adds um, a perspective on um, on Saturday nights. So big fans of John Ceno and Kate from Montreal joining us on the post-wrestling Christmas show. But Way, it is time for the post-wrestling Christmas beverages to come out. It is time to pop open some eggnog, maybe some Baileys. Because it's time to get fucked up. The show rolls on, and who better to roll with than Damian Abraham of Fucked Up, who joins us, and dude is going to do his namesake right here. He is lighting up the Christmas tree here on the post wrestling Christmas show. That might be the screen grab for all fans out there. Could we possibly do a Christmas show without Damien Abraham? There was one year we did and I heard about it afterwards. So I will never <laughs> ever make the mistake of missing Christmas without Damien, who it would not be a full Christmas at post without Damien Abraham. Let this be a lesson for how you should handle your children. John, if you forget one of the kids for Christmas, they're going to be pissed. I cannot believe that uh, I made such an omission uh, that one year. But one of our favorite people, uh, Damian Abraham. I mean, if if ever there's a legacy of CM Punk in professional wrestling, it's it's not it's not any of this recent stuff. It is myself and Way being our man on the street segment, running into this man and just casually striking up a conversation that was the the planting of the seed of a wonderful friendship that has now blossomed into this this incredible safari that we navigate called our friendship. That might be the only good thing that came out of my tenure at much music is our <laughs> friendship. Because if I had not gone on lunch break, then I would not have run into the two of you and been completely starstruck. I'm very excited to meet the two of you. Cause I was huge fans of the show uh, the, back then the old, old show and not anymore. Not anymore. Now, now, I'm, now, I'm, now it's a religion for me. This is the <laughs> only way I follow wrestling now is through uh, you two. 
Well, I wanted to touch on that. I mean, because I feel like in previous years that we spoke, I mean, you went from, you know, hosting your own show about professional wrestling, really diving in as as deep as as a human being possibly could to, correct me if I'm wrong, but not really watching at all. So where does that stand today? Yeah, it's it probably I don't know. That's not that's not one hundred percent true. I went and saw AEW this year. I'm going to go and see uh, WWE uh, in a few days from now. Mm-hmm. So I feel like I, I still love it. I still really in love wrestling. I love listening to you guys talk about it. Obviously, I'm, I, I still check out like clips and DVDs. I start I busted out my old DVD player and watched some TNA DVDs. So I've got to have okay. a love for it somewhere. I just, How about the kids? Are they what? What's their temperature on pro wrestling these days? Uh, Holden's getting more into it, which is surprising because like the whole time that I was immersed in it, Holden wanted nothing to do with it. He's my eldest; he's fourteen. Yeah, now, I remember but, you saying that he was more not as much taken to it. Yeah, but now because of because he's gotten into jujitsu and he's really mm. into working out, that he's kind of getting into it almost backwards from I think a, a way a lot of us would have gotten into MMA uh, back then, like through wrestling and then graduating into MMA, and I think. For Holden, it was kind of like a passing interest in MMA, but then kind of a, a bigger interest in wrestling these days. So, yeah, I'm hoping. I've got hope for that. It's also a bit cooler when it's not dad's thing. I Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, that, which is great for the weed. That's why you guys need to start smoking weed. Because you got to show your kids that it's super dorky and lame, so they don't want to do it. Oh, I stopped there, I guess. You know? Yeah, yeah that's true. Dean Wade will take up uh, heroin in the next year. You know? <laughs> so we'll be yeah. the example. We'll make it the alcohol. least cool drug in existence. Well, Absolutely. sadly, the kids, um, I'll, I've, I, you know, there's a weird tonal shift, but I've got friends that have passed away from heroin and, and Th- opioids. Thanks, Damien. That was I didn't mean to bring it down. So, I, you know, they, they have cautionary tales when it comes to, to, to opioids, but... I feel like I'm their cautionary tale when it comes to cannabis. Like <laughs> we don't want to turn out like dad in the basement stinking up the house. I actually wanted to talk a little bit about your your kid getting into jujitsu this year. I mean, Holden, like it's it's crazy because I remember the first time we met you. I mean, I, my recollection of Holden is like what you know how how like how old Max is right now. You know, like yeah, and then Max all of a sudden. Yeah, like, and and I know he wasn't six, but maybe back then, but probably closer to it than than I expect. He would have been he? no. We when we met, he would have been. It'd be like twenty eleven. Yeah, so he he would have been what three? Wow! Oh. Wow! Okay, never mind. Yeah, <laughs> younger. Like, he was a baby because I, I remember that much music. It's it's. Yeah, it goes by so quickly. Like I feel like having kids is the only way to really measure time for me because I have to relate. Yeah. the passage of time to how old they were at every given stage. Is he like ninth grade around that? No, he's just in ninth grade now. He's okay. six foot four. Six uh, four. That, well, that was what I was going to get to. Because yeah. like, I mean, okay, he was th- three at the time that we met you. So he's actually closer to, to my kid's age, who's yeah. one and a half. Yeah. And now you, you have raised Dominic. You are the Rey Mysterio <laughs> of Toronto. Yeah, and but you have raised Dominic, who now towers over you. Well, Damien is not the size of Rey Mysterio. Okay? No, he is not. I'm and, shorter. I'm a good and three his, feet shorter. And his kid is like is 13. He's 14 now. 14, and he's he's taller than you, which is an incredible, and yeah. which bodes really well for his jujitsu career, and maybe even more. Yeah. Oh yeah, man, he he's good. he's gonna have a hell of a rubber guard. I bet. I mean, get it, get him into that. Yeah. He's he uh his favorite thing to do now is like, Dad, let's roll. Dad, let's roll. Which and not because, means something different for you than it might for him. <laughs> Well, he definitely does, and and I feel like my type of rolling does not involve me having to tap out, because inevitably when I'm wrestling with when I, when we're doing jujitsu, I don't have any jujitsu. My knowledge of jujitsu comes from your uh, UFC review podcast, John, over the years. Like that's really where I'm getting all my skills from. So I don't I don't really know what I'm doing. So normally it just it, it really involves me scrambling for survival, and then once in a while. I'll get him in like some sort of choke thing, but you, who can choke their own kid? Like you'd have to be a monster to like really. And he's screaming, choke me, dad. Come on, apply pressure. Come on, dad, apply pressure. I so used I, to have that same feeling towards way. And then when I submitted to his <laughs> mounted triangle and this man was trying to destroy my carotid artery, I realized we didn't have that deep of a friendship when it came to the math. So it's he the was love uh, of sport. It's the only way you learn. Yeah. It's the only way you learn. Yeah. Tough exactly. love. It, I, but I want you both to know, that you ever want to challenge 
Holden's taking on all comers. He challenged MVP. <laughs> oh, oh, really? Oh, that would be. I would. I think to watch between that. Andrew Thompson and Chris Ely, we could have a hell of a Grapple Kingdom follow up at at some point down down the road. I mean, Holden might be headlining with MVP. Well, we need we need to bring back the original headlining card and get <laughs> Way Court Two finally to happen. Court might be a bit tougher to get these days. Um, <laughs> yeah, maybe. So, yeah, maybe. <laughs> so, yeah. So Way and I were uh, we, we were looking because. You know, we, we, we always, uh, you know, we're, we're texting back and forth and you're always, you know, casually mentioning, oh, I'm on tour here and there. And then I go to fucked up dot CC and looking at your dude, you were really on the road this year and more so in the sky. Uh, you were like France, Germany, UK, like you did a lot of touring this year. Was this like, this has to have been your busiest year since the pandemic tour was. I think so. You know, like I, I think we did. It's kind of hard to say, actually, because like I, thinking back on it now, it felt like we had the whole summer off, which was rare for other years. Like normally we're touring in the summertime. Yeah, but I, I guess right. we did a, a lot back to back. But then I got <laughs> my friend. Uh, uh, it's uh, you know Danko Jones, right? So he just got off a six week tour. So here I am complaining about two and a half weeks on the road, and he just did six weeks. So I feel like it's all relative, but. Yeah, today was this year was pretty busy. Like by the end of this last tour we just finished, uh, I think everyone in the band wanted to not see each other's face for as long as possible. So we're not going on tour again till the end of January. How how would you say that, you know the 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 touring industry, the 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 live performance industry has might might still be reeling from the effects of the pandemic in 2023? I think we're really in the kind of a post-COVID era now of touring where we we can kind of see what it looks like, the lay of the land. The reality is, as we all know, everything's gotten immensely more expensive. Gas is way more expensive now. Flights are way more expensive. Even fast food. Like the idea of going out and and you know surviving on $15 a day in fast food, as bands used to do, or even less in some cases with bands, is just gone out the window. Like $15 is one fast food combo (laughs) at at Mm -hmm. best and we are as a band i think kind of coming to terms with the fact that it's not going to be quite the same as it was before but it's also you know it's great to be back out there i think there's still like that appreciation for being back out there but every band has that appreciation because everyone is on tour now and you'll show up in a town And there'll be like two or three other concerts that are the same sort of genre that you're doing or similar enough genres where you're, you're feeling the competition and you know, I can't complain. Like, I feel like every time I start talking about this stuff, I I really do feel guilty because this is all I wanted to be doing during that period when we couldn't do it. So now I'm back doing it. Who cares if, you know, I'm going but, but, but it's interesting. No, it's it's totally interesting. I, I think just, you know, from an economic standpoint, you know, it, these all definitely, I'm sure, feel like dream jobs to a lot of people. But once you really get deep into it, you you start to really understand um, maybe a lot of these stresses that might come with it as well. So, uh, I mean, um, do, do you see this changing at all in the future or is it just directly related to the cost of the dollar or flights or, or oil or? I think it's I think it's all that stuff. I think it's also when people eventually get sick of going out on the road again, when bands start breaking up again, because every band that was broken up kind of seemed to get back together during the pandemic. And mm-hmm. so you're competing with people's nostalgia for for these older bands from another time. And it yeah, like it it I think it's just gonna be the way it is mm-hmm. for I hope prices for food go down because God, groceries. This turned in, this turning into like a really complainy Christmas morning. How, <laughs> how what what feedback do you get on, on the road regarding like the podcast and how that kind of fits into your sort of your audience in, engagement that you are as consistent with this show that you put out with some really fascinating guests and I think like I speak from someone that like this is a world I am swooping in on that I don't have any kind of bearing for and I just find you to be a really engaging interviewer and getting these stories out of people. Um, and I hope you can talk a little bit about Dan Burke, who I discovered yes. through your podcast. That was just one of the most fascinating shows I've listened to of any genre this year. I feel like 
well, first of all, thank you because I really, you know, I I say this all the time on the podcast. You guys are, you know, my podcast uh, educators. Like, a way will, uh, you know, probably reluctantly uh, <laughs> concede that uh, without him, I wouldn't be doing this podcast. Like, anytime I have any need for advice, uh, I'll text both John and Way. John rarely responds to me but way will always get back to me especially in a group text as, as i've said outside of you texting me on a wednesday at 9 55 p.m i think that's the only time that i have uh no God, I, made, I made the mistake of uh i think this was up. last year but there was a group text that i sent to both of you you didn't respond and then i heard you making fun of me for sending the group text <laughs> that was the, the dynamite show. night that was the night you texted me at, at literally that was when it was the craziest of where i had to update the notes on the site as i'm taking notes and doing the podcast right after it's a very busy time <laughs> and i'm not I, one of those people that everyone needs to know my schedule so no no and i there's a bit of a meal culpa my apologies on that one and i only and i only do this in jest because obviously i love you and i really do appreciate you saying that kind words and Whenever I get the text from you about an episode, I know that it was a great episode. So when you texted me about that Dan Burke episode, I was like, oh, this it's is amazing. A, this is a classic. Like, talk about like a Toronto area legend here. And like, again, someone that like, I, I did not know this individual coming in, but man, you are like, you're a product of this punk scene in Toronto and you, your recall is just next level. It's like, it's so much with. Like when it comes to music, like you and Dan Lebransky, like your ability to just remember such details, like it just, it just, you throw something out and it jogs the guest memory and boom, they're off to the races. And that was the case here. And this guy, I mean, to say he's lived the life is an understatement, some that I don't think you would necessarily uh, endorse. Um, but I don't know how many other people could do that interview and, and get like that level uh, out of someone, but it goes to show you a lot of the guests that come on. Number one, they have an appreciation for you, but you have the, this history. Like you are not just simply scrolling someone's bio before you speak here. Like you've lived this. Well, I feel the same about you, John, like you can recall any date ever. Like you have a crazy memory. And I think listening to you do interviews, listening to, listening to Cole Cabana do interviews when he was first doing his podcast. Like the thing that I realized is you just have to know your shit and there's no point in going on a podcast. That's just a general interest interview podcast because the people that are going to be listening to podcasts don't want that. They want the deep dive stuff. So if you're going to be interviewing someone, you better be engaged by what they're doing or at least have something that you hope to get out of that interview. Because otherwise, you're just wasting your own time and everyone else's time. So, yeah, Dan was someone I had a special relationship to because that was the first time I ever saw anyone get a blowjob in front of me when when I was like 15. <laughs> walking in, and you're seeing... more than welcome to elaborate, or you can just leave that as a teaser <laughs> yeah, for this because it was, if, if anything else, one lesson you take: you always knock uh, at a concert yes. promoter's door. Yes, yeah, the the, the, fir, the the part of that sentence is when you said the first time. Um, that's what really <laughs> kind of got me. But okay. well, I think I've seen it now. I've probably seen <laughs> pornography before that, but like never that real. You know, I don't know if uh -huh. you heard this episode way, but I really implore you if you listen to one turned out a punk episode this year, the Dan Burke one is is worth the price of admission. I, I, I have a, a whole new different uh, vi visual of this podcast I can uh, imagine now when, when listening to it. I uh, also wanted to talk to you, I mean, in relation to Turned Out of Punk, which is the podcast that we are talking about. Um, you've also really dove into um, Instagram reels and, and YouTube and I assume TikTok as well, Damien, yeah. this year. Uh, what, what's that been like? Because it's, it's something you, that, that I believe is new for the, the, the show. Very new. Uh, for me, like I, I th last December, I tried to start doing these YouTube videos and I edited a couple together that took a long time. <laughs> it really took like, you know, days and days to put a 45 minute long documentary together. And then I was like, well, you know, how much of an impact are these really having? And then you think about reels, Instagram reels, YouTube shorts and TikTok. If you make your video short enough, you can kind of have the same video play on all three platforms. And I struggle getting it short enough for YouTube shorts because it's only a minute at YouTube shorts. And I seem to find a minute, 30 seconds, kind of my sweet spot. But 
Yeah, these videos have been so much fun to put together. I really it started trying to find ways of just drawing people to certain podcast episodes that I know were good. And I know there's interesting stories on it, but they're so long that I just don't think people are necessarily willing to sit through some of these stories. So you just kind of, I would find a quote and just write a quick script around it and then throw it together. And you could churn out one of these in a day, in an afternoon. And there have been some that have had wild responses. I've met new friends through them. I found out new facts. You know, the Madonna was a punk one. When I put that one up, I learned so much more about Madonna's punk years after I put that up. So as much as they serve as a, a way to draw people to the podcast, it also seems like a beacon to get and learn information about stuff that I thought I already knew. I, I mean, I, I find them very effective. You know, as you mentioned, that's a struggle we always have, you know, because we do long form content and th it's very much a world that is based on a one minute videos at, at this point. So being able to convert them the way that you have, I'm, I'm actually really impressed at what you've been able to do. Oh, well, thank you, Wei. Like I, I it, it's so weird what we do and I'm, I'm lumping myself in with you guys. Obviously what you do is mm -hmm. a little more professional than what I do, but trying to find a way to bring people to this content that you believe in your heart of hearts is great. And it's different than with the band, because I think the band has like a, not anymore, but when we, when fucked up was first kind of getting out there, we were able to tap into an infrastructure that exists to help you promote your, your content. In this case, your music, there was like magazines, there were reviews, there were, music video channels but the stuff that we're doing it's really beholden to us and word of mouth and the communities we kind of build up around our shows to spread the word about it there's no promotion system for us to kind of tap into so it's constantly okay do i focus more time on twitter do i focus more time on it making an instagram real do i focus like it's it's really like time is the currency that we're playing with and it's like, where do I throw it at to try and make people come and pay attention to the other thing that I'm using my time for? Maybe the last thing I'll talk to you about, and that might be of interest to uh, our wrestling audiences, is that you have, uh, over the past year, been working on a, a series of, of wrestling-themed collaborations with the electronic music group, The Hallucination. Uh, what can you tell us about the latest release? Yeah, the those guys, it's kind of a friendship that came out of shared interests. Uh, Tim a tool man from the group uh, he and i connected super hard over wrestling he was in the wrestlers tv show uh in the episode where he went up to Ninevik, and uh he's someone that i just kind of have sat around and, and talked for hours about wrestling with and bear as well from the group and they had this idea to do a wrestling themed ep because i think we've always talked about how wrestling as and when i say uh, like I haven't watched a lot of wrestling. I still fucking love the art form of pro wrestling. I just feel like the current manifestations of it right now don't really connect with me as much, but I, I think this is one of the greatest art forms for telling stories that exists. And I think in terms of a live, a, a live art form, a live piece of entertainment, there's nothing like wrestling. So we've always talked about wrestling in terms of telling stories that are bigger than, you know, a good guy versus bad guy, but wrestling stories that go much deeper than that. Still, I guess, ultimately good guy versus bad guy, but using wrestling to talk about much larger themes and to explore topics that are not necessarily always easy to discuss. And I, we kind of threw out of that conversation, came up with this idea, or they came up with this idea of doing this sort of wrestling heel EP where my character first introduced in the last music video has now, completely lost his mind and slipped into a world of of wrestling and where i feel like the the walls between real and fake are completely broken down and yeah it's, it, it's been a lot of fun it's been really an amazing experience and also daniel Makabe, a mutual friend of ours uh, came out and wrestled with us we had a bunch of incredible wrestlers we did a live tour with fucked up in the hallucination uh, across Canada and, and brought wrestlers at every show and kind of really brought our worlds together. We were, we were struggling to figure out like what would be a good opening act for us to go on tour because if it was a punk band or if it's a, even a guitar rock band, it's kind of too much leaning towards what we do. And if it's an electronic group, it's too much 
towards what they do. And so wrestling really became the ultimate compromise and ultimate opening act. And it worked wrestling over having wrestling play before you at a show is the best feeling on earth. And then having it all kind of culminate during the encore of the show every night, it really, uh, yeah, that's one of the most exciting things I think I got to do this year, but they are, I don't, I'm, I'm struggling right now because I know they've got big plans for next year on what's going to happen. So I don't want to give away any of their plans in advance, but this is just the start. I think we're going to see a lot more of this wrestling collaboration as it goes. It looks so awesome. I'm, I'm, I'm just watching a video right now and just to kind of like, I mean, I, I'm not playing the music for copyright reasons, but to to be able to like listen to that music while watching a Daniel McCoppy match um, at a concert venue just looks amazing. It was awesome. Like Jody Thread, like we had so many incredible wow. wrestlers come out and do these matches and it's amazing because you've got an audience there that's not there for wrestling. And there were some people that just didn't get it. But for the most part, even people that didn't like wrestling got caught up in it because it is such a arresting art form. And it does draw you in. And especially having them break that fourth wall and have them, well, not have them, but when they broke the fourth wall and they kind of went into the crowd and brought the crowd, it really brought the audience into the show in a way that an opening act just kind of filling t- I shouldn't talk shit on opening <laughs> bands, but in a way that few other things could kind of draw an audience in like that. It was so much fun. That was a, Oh, that was a highlight of the year going out on that tour. And that's also when I, I realized like, it's not the art form of wrestling, wrestling in general, going to a wrestling show live and seeing it, that'll never stop being exciting for me and never stop being like a huge, thrill to get to experience it live because i do feel much like punk and hardcore that it is something that takes on a different dimension when you're at it live versus experiencing it on tv or on a record in the case of punk and hardcore well one of the highlights of our year is having you on the christmas show damien uh we thank you so much a happy holiday uh to you your entire family we'll definitely do this again soon and uh and we will we will uh have some Thai food in the new year. Let me give you a super, John. Damien Abraham joining us <laughs> on the Boats Wrestling Christmas Show. Yeah. I, I, I don't know if he was touching the uh, Bailey so much, but he's certainly uh, all about the eggnog um, and certainly all about some, uh, some of the other... Uh, um, things we have hanging off the the, the tree I suppose. is he is he also vegan i believe he is yes he is okay because yeah. i nearly texted both of you about going to this fried chicken place i found as an alternative to where we usually meet up and then yes. i thought to myself i'm pretty sure damien's vegan and uh, i don't want to be that guy um but instead yeah. i'll just share that on the podcast but i was i I think it was on blog to and they had a list of the best fried chicken places in Toronto. And way and I are, I would say we are, we are fried chicken connoisseurs well, and there is one of the top like five spots in all of Toronto is right where we used to work at, um, Keel and Dundas. It's right there. Oh the- yeah. I know. I know which place you're talking okay, about. Okay. Like Chica's, Chica's. I think. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. And I thought that's a place that we should hit up. It's like, I've been reasonable in distance. So you and I can go and uh, Damien can bring, I don't know. He can pack a lunch or (laughs) I don't know, (laughs) but, uh, or, or he can just, you know, venture out into the wild side for, for one day. And none of us will talk about what he consumes. I, 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 I I would respect that. I think he would uh, enjoy that very much as well. Uh, Always a pleasure to hang out even with food or without food, John, or me, you know what? What would be food fair? helps. Food helps in any situation. Though. It's a it's a nice social setter. Yeah. Um. If if Damien's going to eat fried chicken, I think it's only fair that you partake in something he brings along. Um. I don't know what you would be referring to. Well, tis the season. Some 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 um some beard maintenance oil of some sort, or <laughs> yes, yeah, sure. You'll probably think of some other kind of oil-based substance. Um, but Damien, a very busy man in 2023 and will continue to be busy in 2024. He's about to go on tour. So uh, glad that he could stop by uh, on the Post Wrestling Christmas show. Always, always open doors here at Post Wrestling for Damien Abraham. But 
it is time, Way. Um, what are you drinking at this point now that we have uh, opened up the uh, the post wrestling liquor cabinet? Well, maybe I I am uh, going to partake in some of this eggnog and, and Bailey's. Um, and uh, who knows what else? What are you drinking? What, what's your holiday drink of choice? You know what? I have um, I have recently been uh, looking up different um, mixtures for various uh, white Russians. So maybe mm-hmm. maybe I will be having a a white Russian. Um, well, what what exactly is in a white Russian again? Vo- vodka milk. Is vodka. Um, you can go milk. You can also go cream. And I know that I'm straight a straight cream. Um, well, you you put you. I use a a, a Kahlua instead of the the cream, and okay. and then you can add um, you can add cream on top of it as well. It's a very thick drink, uh, depending on what you put in it. You but you can have like various. Uh, different variations on the white Russian. So, so it sounds awful. Like when you're describing it, it sounds awful, but it, it doesn't, it doesn't. I mean, okay. Have you, ever... it's not one I th- I'd say like um, w- with, with due respect to like the big Lebowski, it's not one that I want to have more than one of, but yeah. it's a nice drink to have as like kind of it's um it's its own kind of uh meal almost. So something I'm actually getting into lately is um milk with coke huh yeah not crazy it sounds disgusting but um i had like a mutual friend or at least um uh, you know an acquaintance sort of like swear by it and then at some point like i i i think either coke or pepsi they were advertising it either huh. so i'm like i'm trying it it's delicious have you i mean you've had an ice cream float right yeah yeah it's that basically you know but in the See, i hate drink. i won't say i hate but like i I seriously have not drank Coke in probably 12 or 13 years. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do like root beer. Root beer is like the one pop I will have. But That'll work honestly, too. like I, I would at least try this concoction. Yeah. Like it sounds weird, but I can imagine that like the two different properties complementing each other. You, and, you, have, you put ice in it. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. And, and a little bit of rum as well. You know, really, really kind of makes it special. And I've actually been substituting like milk for eggnog, you know, over the holiday. So a little bit of eggnog, a little bit of soda and a little bit of rum. So what you're saying is with this drink, when you add the rum, you need something to taste it with. The Christmas show continues and joining us now from Digital Spy, friend of the show, it is Stephanie Chase who is here with us. A happy holiday season, Stephanie. Hey guys, happy holidays. You are joining us uh, all the way for, from England and tell us a little bit about uh, uh, Christmas. What, what's going on in the world of uh, Stephanie Chase this holiday season? Um, well, I'm just back from a little Christmas trip to London. That was nice. Got to see a lot of festive markets and stuff like that. Um, didn't see any wrestling, uh, though there was wrestling on, but yeah, full Christmas. And I'm actually about to go home to Belfast tomorrow, and that's where I will be spending Christmas with my family. Oh, very nice. Wonderful. Very nice. How would you kind of classify uh, this year for, for yourself, just your, your own career and sort of uh, coverage wise? How would you assess the year of 2023? Um, it's been OK. It hasn't. I don't think it's been like that memorable. I think I've done like some fun interviews this year, um, gone to some shows, not as many as I went to last year, like not as many. But the UK has had bigger shows this year. We had Money in the Bank and we had All In. So it's it's been a bit of an up and down one, but not too bad. It, uh, you've done a lot of writing this year, I would say. And and, and for me, like those, those are probably the 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 areas where I've maybe seen um, all, uh, the most from you, to be honest. And I think you've done really some some great writing about um, women's wrestling. So thank you. Maybe as a question, you know, um, concerning the two major companies that I think we, we both cover the most, what would you say is something WWE and AEW ha- have each done well over the past year for women's wrestling? And what is something they could do better each uh, in 2024? 
Um, I think WWE has done really well in making a star out of Rhea Ripley um, mm-hmm. and centering a woman, how they have on Raw and within a faction with men where usually the woman isn't the vocal point. Like she's definitely the center of that group. She's definitely the leader of that group. And with them having a pay-per-view in Australia next year, I think that's going to get even better. So I think they've done really well there. Um there's still, you know, problems with women's storylines like across both shows that I don't think there there's as much going on with the men, but positively like they have really strong people signing Jade Cargill is a really big get, I think. Um no matter what she's like at the in the ring at the minute, just getting her and I think they're going to push her really well um as well. So I think they've had a positive year with women. Um I think they might get Another woman returns returning soon. Maybe I'm wearing this uh, Mercedes Monet T-shirt because the oh, clock look at is that subtle. Ticking. Like the <laughs> clock is ticking on this being relevant. I think you know. Um, AW. Um, I'm not sure. I can really think of a positive with the women there. Go negative. Um, go go as yeah. negative as you need. I guess. Tell the My, truth. That's all. I think my only positive is how well Jimmy Hader got herself over before being injured um, around double or nothing time. I think that was great, but that was all on her. Um, it's still just so badly booked. Like, it's so badly booked. One obligatory women's match on Dynamite every week. Um, Tony Storm's doing this character that obviously they've put a lot of work in and it seems like a bit of a pet project from Tony Khan, but it's yet to find a way to really connect to any of the other women in the division. It's like she's playing this character and then every show she'll just have a match with, with someone else. So yeah, they've still just doing really badly with it. Um, they just, I don't know. I think, I think Tony's proven like in four years, he just can't book women's wrestling and has to. Like, is it can't or, or, or is it a desire to not want to maybe mm. spend more time on TV? I mean, that is the question because, you know, he's a numbers man, analytics man, and he will point to the ratings, like the, the quarter hours for the women. But then it's one of those things, like if you're not going to give good storylines or invest in them, how do you expect the viewers to want to watch them to, for the numbers to go up? So he's kind of not willing to really give them a good shot, I think. Um, but I don't think I don't think he just feels the same about the women's division, women's wrestling. I think it all just feels very like he's obliged to do it. And that's is kind of disheartening because it's just not gotten better in the past four years, which is quite incredible, really. And just like more titles. I think he just announced another women's title in Ring of Honor. And it's quite baffling when you think of how um, Athena went as w- women's champion was like the only ring of honor champion that never featured on dynamite. So that's kind of how he feels about that division. It's mm-hmm. yeah. How would you feel this year in terms of just uh, Tony Khan's kind of um, just his handling, like in, in media situations, because this is a year mm-hmm. where, you know, for, for the duration of his time as a wrestling promoter, like AEW has been, you know, in this position where it's been rising and rising and rising. Mm -hmm. And I mean, revenue wise, they're going to have a very, very good year in 2023, but this is the year that WWE just went to such larger heights and was on the upswing. And it was Mm -hmm. the first time I think they were trying to, Tony was in this position of also having to fight this perception issue where we're not the, the new, cool kid on the block anymore but instead we're trying to kind of reclaim that perception that wwe has now been taken as you know it's it's the industry leader but it's also the popular brand with a lot of people yeah it's been a really bad year for for aw like it really has um and i think for tony as well his public image and an image among the fans i think it probably all started with fallout last year kind of (laughs) gave him like a harsh lesson on what it really means to be a public facing promoter because you know when he started he was like the guy that was I'm going to be so media friendly nothing to hide and then something happened where he couldn't be open and then um, I think that it, it like put him on the spot you know and he didn't know what to do and then I think things just 
kind of got worse were any criticism that they've gotten. I don't think that he receives very well or like takes on board. He more becomes like defensive and like defiant you know against it even just his recent comments at the ring of honor presser or the terrible like put your money where your mouth is comment that i just like still can't get over that he said that so i think he's really struggling with them not being the the cool brand that people like the people you know are talking positively about in the internet but i think they just like they had a real opportunity when things were kind of going wrong you know for WWE with um Vince coming back and even when Vince was there and I think there was like a window that they didn't take because so much else drama happened and yeah it's it's just put him in a hard position I think it's it's very hard after brawl out Punk coming back getting his own show and then what happened at Wembley and then getting fired happened to really think of um Tony as a as a great leader. Oh, I feel like I'm being horrible to Tony right here. <laughs> but there's a there's a lot. You know, we haven't even talked about Ric Flair yet. So <laughs> Well, it's, it's a conversation that I, I think everybody has been having uh, over the past year about about Tony Khan and, and this sort of like I, I don't even know if you call it so much a change sort of like perception of of uh, or or just maybe more of an awareness and an honesty about, you know, the fact that he's not a very good public speaker. Yeah, no. he is. Yeah. He's the person who's the most credible, you know, when it comes to um, he it's his company. So he, mm-hmm. I, I think we're all grateful that he continues to do these sort of press conferences. But if you were in AEW and if you had the task of maybe, I don't know, uh, coaching him or maybe asking like t- telling him to do so- things a, a sort of a, a slightly different way in, in the next year what do you think are some things that he he could be improving on whether it be through the quality of his answers or just his mm-hmm. d- demeanor on 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 screen you know i think i'd firstly tell him not to do the press conferences <laughs> um like i don't really know why? because um i think firstly like they're they're you know very strange with the half kv of half not thing and with him sitting there the whole time I just find that like very odd so we need to get a consensus on that from everyone like what are we doing here are we are we in character or are we not are we throwing bottles at members of the press or are we not like that kind of thing we need to get a consensus on but um I think that he if he's not really willing to answer like pretty much everything then I just think he shouldn't be doing them because he gives these very long very like waffly answers where he's not really directly addressing anything like every you know twice I've asked him about women backstage and women's voices I don't think he's ever understood the question because his answers go from like naming every man that works backstage and helps out to just saying you know there are women there and then adding that he you know it's like it stops with him but I don't think he gets why that's important like why the representation is important um and then you know he just goes into the promoter mode and I think the longer it goes on like when you're listening to that those media calls and he just goes on and on with every answer the kind of worse it feels so I think either streamline your answers like if you can't answer something just don't answer it and try and stay focused or maybe decide not to do them if they're going to cause more problems when than they're worth because like that is how ball art started was at one of these press conferences so maybe like are they worth the trouble hmm. i guess we also look at you know you you bring up like rick flair and i think that mm-hmm. was certainly a very um uh, there was a lot of backlash to to that decision. Yeah. And I mean, just overall, like here we are uh, a year ago and it looked as though like Vince McMahon was, you know, as removed as he was going to be from WWE and he swoops back in and, mm-hmm. and, you know, re- largely was not met with any kind of like resistance from this industry that ultimately like there is a certain celebrity and power structure that is in place that allows, you know, even, you know, uh, egregious accusations that are not going to prohibit you from having a place in this industry, even a very powerful one like a Vince McMahon. Yeah, that that's the wildest thing to me. I think when you look at other industries, um, like the movie business, you know, we had um, Me Too, we had Weinstein, um, and 
what really just always strikes me about wrestling, like when it comes to Vince is there's just kind of no one willing to to say anything, to say like we wash our hands with this man or I'm not, or I'm not going to talk with him. Like John Cena, very famous out there in Hollywood, still goes out to dinner with Vince McMahon. Like it's, it's still totally fine. Um, even someone like Danielson is still very positive of Vince McMahon. So we've kind of got no one like high up in the industry, like, in WWE or even in AEW, Danielson, Jericho, all constantly praising Vince McMahon that's willing to say anything. So I think, of course, he's accepted back. And then you go on to Ric Flair and like that's how he gets in the back of the door because it's, you know, the legendary Ric Flair that no one seems to want to say, like, maybe this guy isn't who we should have on TV right now. And maybe he's you know, just not worth it, not worth the trouble. But it doesn't seem that in, in wrestling we're willing to call that out as much, I think, as in other industries. And for that reason, like, has that sort of um, – there's certainly been online um, uh, criticism of, of Ric Flair's mm-hmm. signing. Do you think it's permeated um, outside of, of the, the wrestling Twitter bubble to, for AEW or Warner Brothers uh, Discovery to care? Um. I wouldn't I wouldn't think so. Um I think it takes a lot for for wrestling fans to make enough noise for someone like Warner Brothers Discovery to care be more like a sponsor like um when WWE had the issue with with the Mula tournament, you know, years ago and it was the sponsors. So um I don't think so. No, I don't think that is something that Warner Brothers are are really looking at. I think they should be like they should be concerned though about how bad that energy drink sponsor looks on on Dynamite. Like just cheat me in their TV show like that. You're not going to be by uh, be sipping on Woo Energy. This no, uh, no, no. Um, you know, as somebody who's traveled to a lot of AEW shows throughout their history, how would you mm-hmm. have uh, described maybe the past year um, from your live perspective, both maybe being in the venue as um, some of the host cities, considering, I guess, this yeah. is more of a, a downturn year for, for the company? Yeah, so the first ones I did this year were Revolution and, like, the Dynamites either side of it. Um, the, the Dynamites and Rampages – definitely an audience drop but I had noticed that at the Dynamite I went to before Full Gear the year before Um, and then Double or Nothing was a definite drop from the previous year in Dynamite 2 or previous year sorry in Las Vegas and the audience there like to me that wasn't a very good show at all and the audience was like less of an audience and they were less engaged Um, and then obviously we had All In where you had like 60,000 people in the show. So that was just the complete opposite, like totally uh, an incredible amount of people. Um, and then I just went to Dynamite uh, in November in in Chicago, and that was like the biggest change that I saw. The, the crowd was lower. People didn't seem invested, and they seemed less like hardcore AEW fan, fan people and more people that are just like, oh, there's a wrestling show in town. I'll go. Um, it wasn't wasn't the same atmosphere wasn't the same reactions and then a couple of days later I was in Survivor Series in Chicago and it was completely packed and I've never heard a crowd as loud as I heard at Survivor Series so granted at all in I was up in a media box so I didn't really hear anything but that was the loudest crowd I've ever heard so I thought okay it's not a wrestling in Chicago problem it's a unfortunately AW in Chicago problem which used to be like their top market really hmm and what was just the like? Obviously, it had to have been a, been electric, but just uh, among mm-hmm. the people you were around for, like Punk's arrival at the end of the night, like what was just uh, just as best you can describe, like the atmosphere from where you were. Um, so where I was was pretty much quiet because they had taken all the media away. Um, oh, <laughs> they tend to do that at the end of these shows. They uh, they sequester you. Yeah, it's it was for the press it, conferences. Right. Yeah, for the press conference. It was so funny because so I I always believed Punk was gonna be at Survivor Series. Like that's why I was there, you know. Um I'd heard something weeks before where I was like, Okay, he's definitely doing it. And then I know all the reporting said that he wasn't, but I was just like, Nope. I I'm pretty sure he's gonna be here. Um and then so I was in the media section and I knew they were doing like the after show press conference, but I just um 
I was really worried about getting out of that arena. So I was like, I'm not going to hang around. And as the, the show started ending, I was just still thinking, no, he's coming. I was just going to stand there like he's coming. And then they took everyone away. And I was kind of just left like on the road by myself. But as Zach from The Torch, that's um, one of my great friends, was there with me as well. And I was still just standing there like he's coming, he's coming. And then I thought, wouldn't it be funny, though, if they took all the media away and he actually does appear? And then that's what happened. Then like Cult of Personality hit and he came out and it was... It was so loud. Like, I, I wasn't worried at all about what kind of reaction he would get in Chicago. I knew, like, once he came out, people would be going absolutely mad for him. And it was a really surreal experience because, you know, he only stood at the ramp. He never came down to the ring. So it's like it's like you could barely see him. Or you could see him on the screen, but you could, like, barely actually see him. And people were just losing their minds. And it was absolutely probably the best live moment I've ever experienced was seeing him come back like that. And, and were you somebody who, uh, you know, w- was um, maybe op- optimistic for a, a CM Punk career post AEW? Mm-hmm. Um, you were. OK, because like yeah. I would say, like, for me, what's been fascinating is to see I, I would say it's, the name CM Punk was was met with, I, I think, a lot of um, negative um, sentiment prior to survivor series but the moment he walked out and the moment i think everybody heard the song saw that scene and 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 maybe you know was met with sort of the real possibility of him being in the wwe with all these fresh matches i would say the 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 the, the name cm punk is met with some pretty positive like reactions in the general wrestling community these days yeah. did, did that surprise you that change um I don't know. I feel like the the negativity surrounding him, there, it's a lot with very like hardcore AW people. Like, just for examples, when I've made videos and stuff about other things, like even like Ric Flair, you'll get these comments that are just about punk that will say like, "Well, everything's gone down because of punk," or like, "There's bad decisions because of punk," and all this stuff. I, I think a lot, there's hardcore people like that 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 feel really betrayed i think the hardcore wwe fans like don't care like they'll welcome people home it's like you're back on our team but i feel like he you know he really got the wrestling bug again once he did aw and he had um an interesting experience in that company and i think he had a bit of a like grass isn't greener moment with everything that went down there and then was happy to come back to wwe and try and prove himself right in this company so i think that um i'm not surprised that the fans are so up for him being there because i think he's really you know he's um a lot of it does seem like a little fake like i'm home and all this kind of stuff but i think he's he's really got a point that he wants to prove and i think he's going to do it i don't expect any big drama fallout situations here well, Stephanie, uh, we hope you have a, a drama-free holiday as well, and we uh, we encourage everyone to uh, follow all of your work. Uh, where, where can you direct people to uh, to check out? And I echo Way sentiments. I think some of your writing has been uh, tremendous uh, th- this past thank year, you. and I hope you, I, I hope you continue that into the new year. Yeah, thank you. I'm really going to try and do more like independent writing where I can write about anything. So that's on Substack, and it's just Stephanie Chase at Substack. Oh. Great, thank you. Um, and follow me on Twitter at Stephanie M. Chase, and you'll find links to everything I do there, including my YouTube, which is also Stephanie Chase. Perfect. Well, happy holidays, Stephanie. Thanks so much for joining us here on the Christmas show, and we will definitely talk to you in the new year. Thank you. Bye. Stephanie Chase joining us on the post wrestling Christmas show from Digital Spy, also doing work with Fightful. She runs a Substack, Patreon, very, very busy woman in the world of wrestling media and uh, mm-hmm. stopping by here on the Christmas show. Lovely to to uh, have her check in and uh, two years in a row now. So thank you very much, Stephanie, for being here. Yes, we should have asked all of our guests what they would be uh, drinking for the post wrestling Christmas show. But I some people might not be drinking. So yeah, maybe not not a just open ended question to throw out there as well. Um. What are you eating? Maybe, you know, that's maybe a better question. Well, I'm curious what your Christmas is looking like this year. As someone that didn't typically celebrate Christmas, it seems like this year you're, is this the most Christmas that you have celebrated this year? Um, 
uh, I think it's approaching that, John. You know, um, so yeah, like I guess I, as many people know, like it wasn't really a thing in in our household growing up. My parents certainly didn't grow up with it. So um, now that I I'm basically starting my own family, um, you know, I'm we're doing Christmas. <laughs> so, um, it, but Oscar is almost like a little too young right now. Like we don't even have a tree yet because like what, what's he's going to be like a tree. You're just asking for trouble. Like with, with a toddler, that's just like deciding to pull everything down everywhere. So I think we're probably at least a year away from, you know, getting even a small tree, but next year, like get a know, big tree. Oh, certainly. Yeah. Yeah. But we got lights up, you know, in, in, in the front and, and we got a re reef wreath wreath. Yes. Wreath, thank you. Uh, I always get that mixed up. And then, wreath might be your your holiday <laughs> once the that was uh, Damien's. Uh, well, yeah. uh, uh, once Oscar uh, goes to bed and Wade pulls out his milk and rum, he's gonna have some, his Christmas wreath. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. No, we we are approaching that point. Yeah. D -d was Pauline similar? Did she do Christmas? Same. No, okay. no. We're, like we have very similar upbringings. Where like you know we have immigrant parents that just like never celebrated Christmas. So the only Christmas we got was like what we kind of absorbed through TV, and now we kind of have an opportunity to to actually do it ourselves for for our child. So yeah. it's a lot to take on. Like th th this year, I didn't get any Christmas lights up, and I kind of felt guilty. Like I, it's not so much for for me or my wife, but I feel for like my kids. It's like they get into <laughs> it and stuff, and it's yeah. like. But man, th this year it was just, it just wasn't happening with the well, you go Christmas all out. Like you, you get the ladder and you like climb up on the roof and do all that. Right. Don't you? I mean, we put up a modest light display on uh, outside, but like we got nothing up this year. Like we did the tree and that, and then some decorations around the house. But I mean, as all, you have all the hours, like my house is a, like, it, it's been a through the ringer this past six weeks. So you're we, decorating your basement with new flooring. That's yeah. Enough. Like seriously like um yeah we're we're in the process we did some painting and now it's uh we should have a floor by the end of the year so that's great news well Merry santa's Christmas. santa's bringing us a basement hopefully yeah yeah i i think your your children will excuse you this year well we are not going to be excusing these two people from joining us they have been a heavy presence on post wrestling throughout the year it's another Double knock on the door as we welcome in the latest guests here at the Post Wrestling Christmas Party. We are now joined by our Japanese wrestling correspondents, Karen Peterson and Bruce Lord, who are with us. And uh, Karen, first of all, uh, a Merry Christmas to you and a Happy Holidays, Bruce. Thank Thanks so much. much. <laughs> It's great to have you guys both on uh, the Christmas show. So, Karen, uh, tell me, th this year you have got to do, uh, you know, you have been the chameleon at Post Wrestling. You <laughs> chose with a, a lot of different people um, from WH Park to Bruce Lord on down. Um, what, what have you um, thought of, like, just overall, like, the New Japan product this year and as well, like, doing mo more podcasting this year as well on the site? Podcasting is always something that I've wanted to improve upon because I get very nervous hearing my own voice. For some reason, I, I like to talk, but I don't like the sound of my own voice. And when I'm on camera, usually I'm looking to the side or looking away because I'm just I'm at heart. I'm a shy girl. I'm a shy fan girl. <laughs> but being able to expand my wheelhouse at post the last year with both with coverage for New Japan with with Bruce and you know, seconding now for WH with post pro res, it's it's a great experience not having like the time of my life right now. Well, we've certainly loved hearing more of you. Um, and this has been a year where we've also had Bruce Lord, um, you know, thankfully contribute a whole lot more than you know we we usually rely on on him for between not just uh postmarks, but now of course with our new Japan Pro Wrestling reviews as well as occasionally stepping in for some of our AEW reviews as well. What has uh you know how has this increased frequency maybe been for you, Bruce? I mean, it's been great, like in terms of being able to drive myself to sort of be a bit more of an engaged viewer, specifically when it comes to uh, New Japan. I'm one of those people who can very easily, if I'm just, you know, watching something for the sake of watching something, sort of allow some things to kind of pass me by. But if nothing else, the whole process of actually having to uh, prepare individual match notes and quick match recaps for things like the New Japan shows has really sort of 
it's opened up another facet of how I view and engage with wrestling. It's not something I always necessarily want to do. Uh, but, you know, in, in terms of being able to kind of look back and notice maybe just some extra subtleties in terms of limb work or match long storytelling or whatever. Uh, in particular, I still think that New Japan kind of remains the gold standard for that sort of thing. Uh, so being able to do all of the New Japan shows with Karen, I think has really uh, kind of beefed up my ability to track that sort of thing and load and Karen knows what I'm talking about there was that little like two month stretch when it felt like we were doing a show like every weekend and it was just match after match uh to, to review and talk about there New, New Japan was just cranking it out for a while in kind of September October it was always those things where we just only thought like oh no we got a break we're not gonna see each other for a few weeks and it's like oh by the way there's another show that's coming up okay <laughs> So another, I, I'm another very strong thankful. show in Las Vegas. Or, I'm very yes. thankful for Bruce because he he did a lot of the heavy lifting, especially with the tournaments and watching all the things where I was just like, I've got G1 burnout. I can't cope right now. So thank you. Well, I'm kind of curious outside of the wrestling that you both cover, like how much do you keep up with just even out of pleasure or personal enjoyment? Well, for me, it's it's the I, I love to support women's wrestling and it's been one of my favorite things since the May Young Classic. So I've been watching Kyrie's career very closely. I I I I suffered through all of you know Crown Jewel to watch her watch her show up because I was like tempered expectations, but God, I want it to happen and I'm just I'm I'm living and I you know I when I can I try to pick up programs here and there that I can, you know, continue to watch and support women's wrestling because it's it's really great, it's underrated, and I wish more people would support it. And you, uh, for my part, I try to catch the odd little bit of stardom here and there, uh, you know, not just so I can feel like I can sort of, you know, not appreciatively when Karen is uh, is, is dropping all manner of Joshi signs. Uh, but, you know, yeah, there's other things. There's uh, there's West Coast Pro. Uh, I, I have been diligently trying to keep up with Noah this year, though Lord knows they've made it difficult uh, to get invested to the point that I'm almost sort of thinking like, man, do I have to like swap Noah out for All Japan or maybe CMLL? Because, you know, <laughs> you know, there's, there's a lot of kind of, you know, rewarding stuff happening uh, over there as well. So, yeah, you know, uh, as somebody who basically retain, or, you know, remains uh, you know, just kind of uh, lives in a, uh, excuse me, a WWE free life, uh, even with, you know, AEW and New Japan taking up a large portion of, of my day. There's still lots of other stuff uh, that I'm interested in. And if I had, you know, more hours in the day, I'm just kind of going through my, my cage match top ratings of the year. And I'm kind of creeped out by just the actual total number of match rankings that I have for this year. But it is what it is. Living a WWE free life feels like the next, like, gluten-free um, trend. <laughs> <laughs> Get all um, the trans fat out of your wrestling diet. Yeah. yeah <laughs> How we, would you assess Karen? Like for, for New Japan uh, this past year, obviously they 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 certainly got behind a lot of the of their younger stars to try and push them to the next level. But what would you look at in terms of like the good, the bad, and Ren Narita joining House of Torture? Oh, we're gonna go, we're gonna we're gonna unpack my trauma on the Christmas special too. Um, it's I am glad that they're finally getting to the point where they are you know, starting to see the returns on the, the younger talents. However, I, I, I need someone to give me the playbook when it comes to saving show and saving Ren Narita from house of torture. It, you know, much very, I'm going through what I went through with the Rapongi three K breakup with, you know, how things have panned out with Ren Narita right now. Um, I am curious to see what the new year will bring us, especially in regards to the potential, of Okada, you know, pulling a Tanahashi and putting the main event of Wrestle Kingdom potentially to a vote with Okada versus Danielson versus Naito and Sonata. Um, and where everyone's going to fall once, you know, January rolls around and contracts start coming up and people start choosing the next phase of their life. And if that's the the vein that New Japan's going to go in, they've 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 set a good foundation. However, I feel like they need to start putting more into other talents other than their, their safe picks there, you know, your Naito's, your Tanahashi's, your Hiromu's, your Desperado's. There are other people that if you want the company to remain stable, especially when you have departures and people being signed away or choosing to leave or ch choosing to go somewhere else with a working relationship that may or may not mean that they come like, you know, like, you know, the, the, the prodigal son coming home once every three months or showing up at a random, you know, show here and there around the world. They need to do more than just be like, hey, we finally brought them back. Here's what we're doing with them and then throw them in a group. They need to start giving them credible wins 
and making them forces to be reckoned with and being like, yes, we're not just going to put the mantle of Naito Tanahashi Shibata on these people, but, but this is why we're doing it. I guess to that point, Bruce, like you, I, I wouldn't say new Japan's at that point yet, but in a world where nine months from now that it could be in, in a, a case, like we know that that will be the case for a, a Will Ospreay, what Kazuchika Okada's future holds. And do we, does New Japan accept a role where the biggest stars are the ones that are working in the U.S. that will come in here sporadically and it kind of diminishes the your, your Naitos and your Sonatas that they're, we get them every week on every tour. The big stars, they're with AEW mm-hmm. or they are just coming in for the biggest shows and those are who we see as our stars yeah i mean that just can't be a workable medium-term reality for for uh new japan or god forbid you know any of these companies uh at all and i have to wonder if that's maybe sort of what might be kind of happening with the uh, with this whole united japan pro wrestling group uh consortium that's just sort of uh, come to light uh over the past couple of weeks you know is it? I mean, it, they, they were talking a lot about you know COVID uh, measures in the actual press release for it, but yeah, I immediately started wondering. Look, is this kind of to set up a bit of a you know protectionism sort of scenario here? You know, to sort of set uh, to protect Japan from pre agent poaching, from NXT incursion, uh, to you know maybe allow for uh, you know more joint shows. You know that uh, that the companies have often sort of either you know, kind of had uh, given a more diminished role to, you know, if if you want to do that sort of thing, you need to start then treating the domestic talent and doing those kind of joint shows at a higher level. You know, I know I, I'll allow, I'll just refer people to WH's rant uh, about the bungling <laughs> of Kiyomiya and Okada. Uh, but, you know, those are the sorts of things, right, that are specific to Japan, that Japan can only deliver. Um, and so being able to do those sorts of things, I think like, that you know those are the sorts of tactics that they're going to have to to start to do and yes yeah, certainly i mean you know the the okada question is what looms over everything for the next year ahead uh and to karen's point earlier that means that you absolutely have to have and you know i i'm very firmly on record as as you know having kind of suji at the front of the race here <laughs> you absolutely need to have one of these new younger guys ready to go and ready to not just, you know, take over, you know, not just win the belt, because as we saw with Sonata this year, huh, that that is not enough uh, to actually spur business on, but to be viewed by Japanese crowds as somebody that they do see uh, as that main event person. And again, you know, just to repeat myself, for me, that's Suji. I'd be heading right for a rematch of, you know, basically Suji going for the title once again at Dominion or whatever other large show that you want and, you know, go with it. Just have him have him defeat Naito uh, and, and make sure that, you know, he is sort of front and center of the company for the next year or two with the rest of them, with Narita, uh, you know, Shooter and Uemura. We'll see where it goes. You have to be giving them every opportunity to do as much as they can. And yeah, obviously, House of Torture is not that. Um, but that's absolutely a project that they have to be thinking about if they are at all taking these sorts of the threat of, like you said, so many talents uh, being wooed away by a, you know, WWE, AEW, uh, you know, talent rate that just does not seem to be, you know, quelling or stopping uh, at any point. Uh, you know, who knows whether the WWE hiring freeze is or is not on, but, you know, you, you break that rule for the sake of somebody like Okada. Karen, you know, as somebody who maybe is a bit more in tune with with um, wrestling fans living in Japan and, and the Japanese scene, um, what is the health, of, I would say, of uh, the Japanese pro wrestling scene right now? And what are your expectations from this Japanese pro um, United Japan pro wrestling unit uh, that may alleviate whatever issues? Maybe? I mean, I, I'm thinking that you guys probably saw all the gesturing I was doing while Bruce was on the main camera about the uh, the NXT Japan barricade. That is where my mind went, because I feel like when the pandemic started and there was this this whole united front to go to the Japanese government to, you know, be able to hold shows and be able to do, uh, do activities, you know, basically to keep the lights on because a lot, especially a lot of the smaller companies were having a difficult time because without those ticket sources and that revenue, they can't, they can't sustain themselves. And I think this coming together and acknowledging that while they appreciate, you know, when foreign talent comes into their country and they, you know, embraces Japanese culture and embraces the Japanese fans, 
they some of the bigger companies are getting a they're lo- they're they're losing a lot you know when when uh AEW got established and the elite left that was a very large hit to new japan but they had okada they had naito they 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 were fine and the problem is that as much as i love new japan this is where i, I say this from a tough place is that they relied too heavily on a certain set of people for way too long they they brought people back from excursion they gave them tag team wins or they gave them you know solid runs in like the g1 or the new japan cup but they waited too long on too many people and sonata was one of those guys who they waited too long he was there for six years before he got his first singles title while other people were coming back from excursion and all of a sudden had the championship so that's that's one of the more frustrating things and you know with like take pro wrestling Noah for example katsuhiko nakajima going into free agency mm-hmm. was massive because he is it was one of the largest drawing like fan favorites of noah and if more companies are going to start having their top tier talent either opting to go into free agency instead of re-signing it's one of those things where that is more so of a western oriented mindset in regards to someone's wrestling career you're not joining a company and staying with that company for life you're not signing you know a quote-unquote lifetime contract that you have to renew every january for the new fiscal year but it's one of those things where people are starting to realize that if you want to become a bigger uh star if you want to be able to ask for more money if you want to be able to have that main event spot your your popularity and your marketability outside of Japan, especially with the growth of international audiences, that becomes your bargaining chip. So it's like, you know, with, with Nakajima going to all Japan, he was there of what? He had like a, two, three matches and all of a sudden he's going for the, he, he's triple crown champion now and in the main event on New Year's Eve. So it's one of those things where it's a great way to also get fans domestically interested in other promotions like you know it's great having crossover shows like it's a little awkward for me when it comes to the the new japan stance on Noah the new year where it's like new japan talent is having a whole but it's 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 a unofficial like preview show where it's like tanahashi and zach are on it house of torture are now on it kojima's i mean kojima versus shigo shiozaki someone's been listening to me out there but it's one of those things where just like it's great that they're coming together in that way where they're helping one another, but much like New Japan sending people to AEW, I need a more reciprocal agreement of it all. WH and I are very much on the same page when it comes to Kaito Kiyomiya. At some point, if he is the one who sends Okada packing to whichever international promotion that has that bankroll that can take him away from New Japan... I want that match. Just it can be one, one and done. I don't care. But it, that's what they need to start thinking about. Is that you know, Kiyomi is supposed to be the future of Noah, and they've let him go to New Japan, and they haven't. They're intentionally not like putting a ceiling on him, and that's what it. That's what it shouldn't be. If you're going to start transfer like sharing talent, you know, Kojima went to Noah last year, became GHC champion at their biggest show, the biggest cr- company wide corporate show. And that brought a lot of New Japan fans to Noah because he was there for a very long time. So it's one of those things where it's like, I want more of that. But I want the I want, I want it to be less power politics and being like, no, this person has been with the com- our company long enough. They can afford to eat a loss. It seems like there's at least kind of two kind of cultural changes or cultural shifts happening here. One, the issue with the kind of the handshake agreement. And oh, yeah, we re-up every year. But, you know, obviously you're going to stick around here scenario that you know, New Japan has been running for many, many years and still didn't even change even after, uh, you know, the, the 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 departures of everybody on the eve of Wrestle Kingdom uh, a few years ago that John and Way you were talking about, uh, you know, just just a couple of months ago. Uh, you So you have that question, you know, do we rethink the way that those contracts um, work? Then there's the whole situation with how quickly are we bringing up you know, young lines and developmental talent and how quickly are we getting them into the upper card or the even, you know, the main event sort of scene. And we've already seen in New Japan that there's apparently some kind of internal tension and internal questioning as to how to handle that, right? With, you know, some of the so-called New Japan dads not really understanding or approving of this kind of uh, dictate coming from on high that, no, 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 we're, we're hitting the fast forward button on some of these guys' development. They're not just going to be doing Boston Crabs for two years, then going off to CMLO for a year and a half, then coming back, then toiling away in the junior league for two years. You know, these are all kind of 
there, I don't know if they're cultural clashes or not. I, I'm certainly, you know, I don't have the kind of the expertise in sort of, you know, Japanese culture and kind of corporate culture that, that Karen has here. But it seems like these are two kind of longstanding, well, this is just the way the business has always been done, that are now sort of having to change or having to respond to very, very current pressures. Uh, and it'll be very interesting to see how they react and how they adapt to those. Before we wrap up, uh, let's touch just a little bit on stardom and the year that they had, uh, starting with you, Karen. And just, you know, a year ago, we're talking about, you know, Mercedes Monet um, very much linked to to stardom. And we saw the creation of the New Japan Women's Championship. And um, I, I would state that this this was a year that uh, stardom certainly had its its difficulties, more so the back half of the year. Yeah, it, it they started off very strong. They started off turning a lot of heads and then I think it was mentioned in the, the the investors meeting and strategic planning going into 2024 was that they realized that the five star Grand Prix, while it spans three, two and a half to three months, that isn't the best way to make sure that your roster stays healthy, because on the second half of the year, they were served a lot of injuries some key people had to vacate titles, including Tam Nakano, who regardless of having to vacate the World of Stardom Championship uh, back in uh, November, she did get Tokyo Sports' uh, Women's MVP of the Year. Um, the other the other qu- question that comes into play is that the five-star Grand Prix, uh, quantity doesn't necessarily mean quality. So there's been discussions of should the field be more narrow moving forward and more selective? The hard part about stardom is that when it comes to their fan, their fan, their Oshi culture, their fan culture, it's the if X person is not on this show, people will sell their tickets. And that was one of the problems that they ran into with New Japan mm. putting their titles on Mayu and Julia is that, you know, Julia and Mayu lead factions. They are very they're incredibly popular. They are names that are heavily associated with stardom. And it it. There were at times where it felt like the left hand wasn't talking to the right hand, like what Bushi fight wanted for stardom versus what New Japan wanted for stardom what versus what Kadani wanted for stardom and what Rossi wanted. For it was all different things and nobody seemed to be on the same page. And that's not I don't want to put any of the blame on the girls. They are incredible wrestlers. They're fantastic athletes and I still support them with all my heart. I just want whoever is managing this entire process to get everybody in a room and sort it out because I don't like seeing promos of of wrestlers who seem like they're in distress that, you know, they're they're not like whether it's a work or not is a different thing. But there are certain ways that you can convey emotion where you can tell that they've either hit their limit or they're beyond their limit or they're having to take time off because it's an undisclosed medical condition. But that could be mental, physical, emotional. It doesn't like and there's there's no. I feel like there's not enough of a support system. And the last thing I want is a repeat of 2020. Yeah, I mean it's not not you know. to bring bring down the vibe a whole lot, but I need whoever's in char- who's ever managing what's going on with Stardom. I need them to do better because I need them to be healthy going into twenty twenty four. I think the other question with Stardom is you know something that New Japan has had to ask itself a couple of times over the last few years, which is to what degree is North American you know incursion or making a footprint there a priority? And we've sort of seen how when New Japan takes that seriously it does quite well, you know, and it does like really good crossover shows, whether those, you know, are, are, are things like Forbidden Door or, you know, the, the New York show or things like that uh, in the past when it treats those cards as if they are serious or important, they do well. Um, I'm not really sure to what degree stardom does or does not view, you know, North American uh, viewership or North American engagement with the product a priority or whether that sort of something that they are kind of reluctantly being occasionally halfway dragged into on the basis of the, as Karen was sort of saying, yes, on paper sort of housed within the same larger company, but not actually in terms of the booking uh, link with new Japan. Right. And that's, you know, that produces, you know, hiccups, I think, or it, like it, it's kind of a, made for a bit of a halting sort of uh, situation, I think from a, you know, more casual Joshi viewers perspective as a North American viewer, you know, the, uh, the show that Karen and I reviewed uh, earlier this year, back in, I think it was in April, the all-star grand queendom. That was, it's still, it's still a mouthful. Good that job. was, a, <laughs> that was a wonderful, wonderful show back to front as somebody who is a more casual stardom viewer. I was totally into it. Thought it was great. Yes. Fine. 
give me more of this or, you know, give me more of, you know, these particular stars. And as we've seen with kind of the real weird um, handling of these not one but two titles that are sort of New Japan, sort of stardom, sort of North American, sort of not, who knows what's going on with these two belts. It's just been really difficult to get a real steady presence or a steady uh, sense as to whether or not, you know, stardom wrestlers in North America are going to be coming to North America regular. They are they going to be on these strong shows. Should they, as Karen is sort of saying, be reserved for like diehard stardom fans who need to be, you know, uh, enticed perhaps uh, to come to some of the domestic shows. Uh, again, the whole question of, you know, stardom in New Japan sort of linked together, but sort of not remains one of these kind of kind of awkward half measures, I think, uh, at least from an outside perspective. Well, coming up, uh, it's going to be a very busy uh, 10-day stretch with uh, with shows going on in Japan. And we are going to have you covered uh, because Stardom Dream Queendom is going down on the 29th. Karen will have a, a big, big review of that show up on the site in written form. And then the next week, we've got Bruce Lord that will be joining myself and Way to review Wrestle Kingdom. And then New Year's Dash W.H. Park and Karen Peterson coming together for a big review of Dash, which uh, I think we all could use a dash of W.H. Park to <laughs> summarize everything. I, I like him to be at the end of the week so he can just get all his thoughts out of all the events from the past week. I think the most notorious figure here in the post-wrestling community won W.H. Park. New Year, same WH. <laughs> that, I, I, I wouldn't have it any other way. That's been one of my highlights of 2023 was just getting to have a few beers with WH and, uh, and pick the man's brain in person, definitely. Uh, well, thank you guys for another uh, tremendous year of work. We look forward to much more in 2024 and beyond. And we'll, you'll be hearing from all of us uh, covering many of the different shows going on in Japan over the next week and a half, which, which has some, some very strong cards uh, that I, I'm looking forward to. Uh, but thank you guys and happy holidays. Same it's going to be great. Thanks, guys. Karen Peterson. And the person who Christmas is based around, the Lord. Celebrating the Lord. Us. Sure, he's never heard that joke in his life. Oh, goodness. Break out the Aberlauer 12 year old single malt scotch whiskey. Bruce the, Lord is in town. Okay. Uh, of everyone that we're going to talk to, the finest guest is one Bruce Lord, who, I mean, never shows up empty. Uh, you know what? I I'm going to take that back. We have some very generous people in the post wrestling community. Yeah. Not only did Bruce Lord bring us some very fine, rare whiskey this year, dude, too fine John for my rum and um, eggnog ass. Yeah. You know? way, way is just like uh, a few steps away from like a brown paper bag. But I mean, Bruce is like, you know, he he's bringing out like the, the humidor with some cigars with his finest of whiskeys. But uh, I, I'm going to shout out as well. Uh, John Ceno, the man who made the Home Alone Lego come to life for me this past year. So some very yeah. generous uh, people, which I will say to reciprocate, at least for Bruce Lord, I did make sure he left my uh, my estate here with a a pure dynamite signed copy by Tom Billington uh, okay. for his plane ride home to Vancouver. Well, very nice. And I um, gave Sino nothing, unfortunately, but I owe you Sino. Sino. And Sino. Um, is, is Home Alone, you know, a, a Christmas tradition this year? So Max, Max does this thing where he watches something to the, like, just nonstop. So mm -hmm. last year, he fell in love with Home Alone and Home Alone 2. So this continued, I would say, until June, where I'm not kidding, every single night, went back and forth between them. He knew this movie inside and out, but like anything, he hit a wall with Home Alone. So he took a break from it. It's come out a few times over Christmas, but he has um, now his, him and Evie, they're very big into Super Mario Brothers now. That's the in thing. Mario Brothers has replaced Sonic for Max and Evie loves Super Mario Brothers. Her favorite is Bowser. Like that's her favorite character, Bowser. Oh, awesome. Yeah. So she she sees wow. the good in in Bowser, I, I think. So yeah, yeah. That that's a big one for her. She's still traumatized, I think, by the Santa Claus when I played it for her last year because it's it seems like a like in my mind, it's like, oh, here's a kid's Christmas movie. Like I watched this. Like the first scene, basically, Santa Claus falls off a roof to his death. And mm -hmm. dude, she lost it. Like she was so frightened. And she equated that like. I said, hey, we're going to put on a movie instead of a TV show. So she not only swore off the Santa Claus, anything that was labeled a movie, no movie. 
no more movies. And this was like six months of like, God knows what I did to her by putting on the Santa Claus. But um, you played her a Santa Claus snuff film is what you did. Like, well, it's like, Tim Allen. What, what were we exposed to as like, like that came out in 94. So I probably saw it around that time. Like I'm 10. Uh, didn't think of anything of it. Um, oh, it makes all the sense in the world why she would have that reaction. I mean, um, maybe they could have done a better job of softening that blow. You know, Santa was children where Max, like the climactic scenes of Home Alone, where he's like m basically committing attempted murder every other scene. Dude, he laughs. A stare. He just thinks it's the funniest thing watching these goofs try to break into his house and get hit with bricks. Like we had to seriously talk to him. It's like this is this is not real violence. This is uh, th this is where I'm breaking kayfabe for Home Alone. Yeah. Like uh, this right. is not. You call the police or mommy or daddy. You don't take. You don't have to defend our house to this level if you know mm. something's trying to break in. I, I, you know, it, it checks and balances, you know, you, you give them the freedom and then you, 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 you reel it back when you, when you realize, um, Tim, Tim Allen has really, you know, broken your child. Are there any Christmas movies you might, uh, that, that come to mind for you? Uh, singles Inferno season three on, uh, Netflix. <laughs> no, no. Uh, we, th th I told you like, so Pauline, um, my, my partner, my lovely partner, she has this thing where like she refuses to watch movies be from before when she was born. Huh. And um, I mean, I'm not going to give away her age on, on, on the public airways, but basically it, it, it excludes everything <laughs> from like a, a lot of movies. Okay? okay. I thought you were going to give out a year and I'm like, you're no, kind of no, 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 no. It excludes a back. lot of movies. Okay. And a lot yeah. of great movies. Well, but what's, we, what's the, the reasoning? I don't know. She's got this weird hang up about like, I don't like just the way it, like the, it looks. I have no idea. It's a super weird thing. But anyway, um, she did like break the, the, the that rule one year to watch National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. <laughs> that was going to be my pick. Like that is the Christmas movie, I think, honestly, like Home Alone, Christmas Vacation. Those are those are excellent ones. I and, dude, I, I never get tired of Christmas Vacation. Well, she hated it. <laughs> we didn't even finish it. Oh my god! I can't say I liked it that much either, what? dude. I'm I'm really sorry. Dude, this like, is like prime Chevy Chase. Yeah, I mean, maybe maybe you just had to be there at that time. Um, I guess so. Here's the thing: I was gonna ask, you know, okay, like Max is like kind of worn out, home alone, right? You know, I mean, I get that way a lot with music. I'll listen to like the same album or the same song over and over to the point where I get sick of it. But what's great about it is that, like, after that, I might get into cover versions or i might get into remixes and i suppose like the movie equivalent would be like a remake um but there's not going to be maybe a remake of, of, of the original home alone well hold on a second has he has he gotten into the sequels no he refuses to watch the sequels he has no interest in watching anything beyond home alone 2 which is really? funny because this clip circulated over the last week of siskel and ebert reviewing home alone 3 and gene siskel just with the popular opinion just pans this thing as like, what an atrocity that we had to be subjected to. Dude, Roger Ebert's like, this is the best of the three. And he's defending, and Siskel's like, dude, are you out of your mind? It was hilarious. <laughs> but then afterwards, I'm seeing this debate of people who are like pro Home Alone 3. And I can't fully engage because I've never watched Home Alone 3. So I can't speak definitively. I I'm totally basing my opinion on popular thought. My mm -hmm. conclusion is I do need to watch this thing. So when I do, I will do it with Braden and Davey because they have um, usually hit me up to do the Home Alone reviews. I will do three because I'm at least curious now to at least see this so that I can at least say, well, I've seen it and can definitively state it sucks. So so what is Max's like sort of um, reasons for not giving it a chance? Because I don't I can't imagine he's aware of any of the criticism. I I think it's I think it's uh my my partner who has probably shared her opinions that they're all bad after number two so oh that has that would she be... watched them I think so um I think so yes okay interesting well so that is it. I, I I think to have a, a purely you know um um like a child's opinion of a movie like that is something I would probably like take over like a, you know seasoned movie critic so I would love to hear his thoughts maybe next year. Yes. Well, perhaps you might classify um, the first two Home Alones as the superior 
being out there. Uh, while the sequels from three onwards might be just these little annoying flies. And everyone knows that eagles don't hunt flies. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Ho, 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 Merry Christmas, post-wrestling, John and Way. It's your friends from Eagles Don't Hunt Flies. I'm Martin Bushby, and with me are Dickie Bird and Brandon from New Jersey. Brandon, I can hear you laughing already. How's your Christmas looking? What plans you got for this Christmas? <laughs> I love that intro. <laughs> like, like we're supposed to be here. <laughs> What did he, I didn't expect to be. I didn't expect to get this invite so soon. I thought we. I thought when the show gets more established, maybe we would uh, get like a like two years later <laughs> when the five year uh, post contract ends. But uh, I feel great, man. Uh, Christmas is here, man. Happy holidays to everyone, uh, especially the the Pennsylvania lottery commercials that started popping off in early November, uh, which pissed me off. <laughs> Look up the book, the ad. This old dude is trying to, to get into this lady's uh, skirt selling lottery tickets. But anyway, uh, no, I feel great. You know, <laughs> happy, happy holidays. <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, what are my plans? Uh, we usually get together, have a nice Christmas breakfast. The, the whole gang, Roman, my, my brother Simon, my sister, uh, uh, their kids. It's like a, it's like a whole uh, menagerie of family members. And uh yeah, it's it's all vibes. How about you? How about everyone? How Dicky Bird uh, with the t-shirt business popping off, man? Let's go. What's everyone else up to this holiday season? Well, what do you, what do you mean? What is everyone else up to? It, <laughs> for you guys, you're you're still the day before Christmas, but for me, it's Christmas Day right now. Mm. You, you all forget that I'm in the future. This 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 podcast has been a nightmare to 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 schedule since uh, since we're all on on separate days. But uh, but look, the sun is shining. It's powering my my beautiful estate. I'm a, a t-shirt king um, now. <laughs> two weeks after or a week after uh, launch. Brandon, do you not dress up as Papa Noel or anything for the kids? You know, what I mean, I think you make. <laughs> I think you'd make a good Father Christmas, wouldn't you? You know, with the beard, no. and you'd make a brilliant. No, I think he'd make a he'd he'd make a good elf. I think. Wait, wait. So, uh, so uh, Walmart used to sell these like reindeer uh, costumes, and I I procured one. So like every year, like I dressed up as a stupid reindeer, and uh, we just tackle my brothers and I'm being real annoying and and whatnot. So it's pretty funny. I'll send you a picture. I'll fax you one. Uh. So, like, you're, are you going to Bondi Beach to uh, hang out with uh, all the rich Australians <laughs> since you're in the state and retired? Yo, can you imagine Martin on the beach, man? He would burn up with his uh, the British skin that he has. So, but anyway, oh, yeah. I well, yeah. <laughs> got a, got a, got a. They they have a saying here: slip, slop, and slip, slop, slap. Uh, slip on a shirt, slap on some sunscreen, and or slop on some sunscreen and slap on a hat or whatever. Martin would definitely, you'd need to uh, follow those <laughs> rules, especially the last one. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I've had that issue before. Obviously, we present the show about John Moxley. What do you think Mox feels about Christmas? Do you think he's out there reading Shakespeare or Oscar Wilde looking for his next memorable quote? I think going off... <laughs> Going to Frenny's Insta, he isn't that big of a fan of Christmas, although he seems to love Rob Holford's Christmas winter album, Brandon. Mm, that's a total banger, dude. Uh, I'm disappointed we didn't cover that on the, the music episode. But uh, but uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm sure he's festive. He's got kid. He's got a kid. And uh, you think he? <laughs> they have a Christmas street fight match, him and his daughter? Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah well, anyway, you think he wraps himself up in the <laughs> Christmas wrapping and they, they <laughs> play fight with Christmas Street Fighter. <laughs> Miracle on 34th Street Fighter. <laughs> those, those are my favorite uh, WWE themed uh, <laughs> type of stupid uh, holiday uh, trope fights. Uh, uh, those are great. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm sure he, he, he's a festive guy, right? I, I don't think he. I don't think he bleeds on the holidays, right? No blading during the holiday season. 
No, I was trying to think what holiday, what uh, religious holiday would you blade on? Probably Easter, mm, right? Easter, like yeah. Right, Especially okay, the, all right, yeah. Especially on the seventh day when he wrote. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we're offending somebody, but I think I think John Moxley would appreciate it. Uh, well, he doesn't give a fuck. count anywhere match on Easter Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> well, last man standing? Or, uh, That's it, too, yeah. Uh, let me see. I, I, I reckon that he would... I don't know. I reckon... I think he'd be sort of like me, who kind of enjoys the the Christmas time period, but maybe on the day when you've got to, you know, go to all the people's houses or do all the things and stuff, maybe that's a bit of a drag. That that I'm a Christmassy guy, but Christmas Day itself, I'm not a huge fan of. And you know what has actually been my favourite thing is, is listening to this, uh, to the mm. Christmas show, because it is on Christmas Day when it appears in in my podcast feed in Australia, uh, but now I have like a child, a young child, and I'm I'm questioning, you know how long how 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 long is it going to take me to get through this like six hour show? It's probably going to be the entire day. I almost wish it was Christmas Eve for me. I might have to maybe I'll twist someone's arm to get it to get an early copy or something. Who knows? Well, it was actually uh, I, John Pollock that inspired the title of our show, because obviously Mox does throw a lot of lines out there, and that one actually passed me by. But when he did that promo on Best Friends, I remember John highlighted that on the review of Dynamite, this Eagles Don't Hunt Flies. And I was like, you know what? That would be a fantastic show for a podcast. So here we are. But I meant to ask you guys, favorite wrestling moments or story or match or whatever of the year that was 2023, Brandon? It's It's got to be... a. Uh... What was the stare the, the staring match between uh, you know, <laughs> and uh, Noah? What was what was that? Match? That that was last year. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, was right, how about the bullet train match? That was a pretty funny, goofy uh, deal. Right? Yeah, yeah, that's right <laughs> up your street, Suzuki on the bullet train. What about you, Dicky? Ah, uh, man. Well, I mean, it's got to be to me. It's just got to be the the year long story arc of. Uh, Who's the devil? Uh, nah, fuck off. <laughs> uh, of uh, WWE is uh, honestly ending the year very strong, very hot, the hot promotion. I don't care if you at me and give me hate for this, but I, this has to be the hottest December WWE has ever put on. Now, that bar is low. They usually just tune themselves out until the Royal Rumble, but CM Punk coming back, I mean, he's he's the talk of the town, as he has been all year. CM Punk versus the, the wrestling world is probably another good uh, good story, but I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, it was the other day, I think it was yesterday, that I was sitting there and I was thinking to myself, and I thought this for the first time, and I'm serious too, you know what? I think I'm ready for John Moxley to return to WWE, not as Dean Ambrose, but as John Moxley. I wouldn't have said this before. I was like, no, he's happy. He's doing his thing. Don't worry about it. And I want him to be happy, so it doesn't really matter. But what if we got John Moxley back in WWE as John Moxley? And at WrestleMania, we got John Moxley versus Brock Lesnar. Hmm? Hmm? So anyway... Yes, but I'm thinking, you know, this is what I'm saying. It's not going to happen, at least for a while, you know, contracts and all that sort of stuff. But mine, and for me, I, um, as much as, you know, it was great being there, the atmosphere and the card and everything was, it had to be all in at Wembley, you know, we had the grapple slash poison run, the live show in the afternoon, then everyone headed down to uh, Wembley to watch all in, and, you know, the card was fun while you were in there at the time, not that much memory. You never gave your thoughts on that, though. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Well, yeah, it was um, it, I, it was an enjoyable day, but uh, it, as as soon as I left the stadium, I couldn't really remember anything other than the sort of like Punk mm. Joe we, match. Yeah, we ain't got um, we ain't got time we ain't got time for that. <laughs> this show no. another like, ten hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So as our boy Mox, he's had a fantastic year as well. You know, 
match against Orange Cassidy, that blood and guts match where he stood on Ibushi flipping off Omega, Ishii on Dynamite, Omega in a cage, the Texas death match against Adam Page, you know, loads of fantastic stuff from Mox. But like the great Okan. Don't don't forget his match with the Great Khan, which I thought was the best match I'd ever seen this year. That's for sure. Forbidden wow. Door Two, st- sitting in the uh, front row. That was a. I, 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 let me amend my statement from the Bullet Train match. That, that was that was a moment for me. <laughs> Acting the fool with uh, Neil Flanagan and Robert Peterson. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, how can I forget that? Brandon live on TV <laughs> dancing and uh, high five yeah. everybody. Yeah, fantastic moment. He, he initially said the staring match, which happened last year. Couldn't remember a damn thing that happened this year. There was there was that though. Yes, it was all a blur. That's what the grind will do for you. But anyway, we've mm-hmm. we've overstayed our welcome. We're getting pushed out of the door by John and Way. You know, we've drunk too much. We've smashed someone's table, and now it's time to leave and go home. So. Merry Christmas, Postmarks, Post Wrestling listeners, John and Way. Thanks for having us on. And hopefully we'll see you next year. Ambrose. Ho, ho, ho. Oh, my goodness, Way. We were joined there by Dickie Bird, Martin Bushby, and Brandon from New Jersey. Mm hmm. Quite the collection of, um, you know, friends I would I would call um, of, of the network. Uh, not once did this I is picture... quite the MCU spinoff in the uh, the post slash Poison Rana uh, world. Yeah, not once when I picture the three of them getting together from their very very separate time zones um, on a on a I, I would say regular basis, maybe as regular as they try to. Three um, continents we're talking about between these three, and yeah. I will guarantee you, not having ever done a show with with Dicky, um, but having communicated with Martin and of course Brandon, I promise you that. Over the years of the different guests we have had on this Christmas show, dude, Brandon is among the most difficult to pin down. Like I have done, there is years I have had to wait up till midnight to record something with him. He is extremely tough to, to book and schedule. And this is someone that has uh, coordinated with uh, everyone from Hold on a second. Steve this, this Austin is... to Bill Goldberg. So Brandon Works for UPS, okay? So it's his job to be there on time as soon as possible or else, right? So maybe he, that's where he uses all of his energy. And well, I'm not saying he's not on time. I'm just stating a window of free time for him, very tough to schedule. He's a very okay. busy man, and uh, we, we appreciate whenever we can have his presence. God knows we might not be able to get him on the phone readily, but the man, I, I seriously think his phone is glued to his hand with uh, Facebook Messenger open at all times with his slew of photos that he can just share with us. At this point, I, I almost suspect that whether or not he's um, been taken over by AI and that would just randomly fish out, you know, like a, a GIF to, to send to, to the people that he knows. Um, we're getting there. I, I do like my like the the messaging relationship that we have it's perfect no, yeah. neither of us has any pressure to respond to the other if we don't need to it's largely like it's if you look and ways is probably the same very little text goes back and forth between us beyond ha 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 mainly on his end but it's just photos out of context photos that i think we know each other's humor i i enjoy it greatly like i see something goofy boom branded it's it's very um odd. Like I would gladly welcome this sort of relationship. I I still find it very interesting that you respond to it so well. Cause by all accounts, this feels like the type of thing you would hate. That you would certainly feel like would be something that you don't have time for to entertain, you know, this See, this guy. Okay. If there was an expectation of a response, it would get very tiresome and I'd probably just have the talk of dude stop there's none of that it's just like he might send me something and it's like okay i'll respond in four days and there's there's no expectation of either of us to uh have to get back i i i enjoy brandon's humor i i think in a i think in a in a different world where i was born in new jersey i think we'd get along famously he he is a a wonder i would say and uh somebody you can listen to on a regular basis on eagles don't hunt flies we're going to keep the party going because, man, the uh, the post office is getting crowded way. Um, we've got uh, Bruce Lord over there in the corner sipping mysteriously. We've got uh, uh, 
Merrick, who is uh, loading up some some hockey fights on on Wiz's uh, bad laptop, the old one. Is that how you're going to characterize? Uh, um, I'm Jeff being Merrick. very stereotypical right now. Um, but yes, we're going to keep moving on, and uh, maybe we are going to stay in the European market. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the post wrestling Christmas show continues and we are going over the pond and man, we have got the grapple invasion here on the Christmas show. JP, Benno, Maddie, all representing grapple here. Guys, a happy holiday season to you. And I'm, I'm so glad we got to have all of you here on the Christmas show as our worlds are colliding here on the Christmas show. I'm absolutely made up to be here, lads. Yeah, uh, happy holidays to you, fellas. Yes. Yeah, it wouldn't be Christmas without chatting to you guys. It's a it's a proper tradition now. I'll be uh, I'll be watching this on uh, on Christmas morning, catching up. Um, it, it's just not the same, really. It's part of a like family tradition now is to uh, to be on this show. Meadow is, is certainly a yearly guest, but but you know who he appears with it, it seems to be changing now every year. <laughs> There's something about me, I think. Yeah, I lose, I lose. <laughs> no one wants to come back a second time. <laughs> well, who are you going to bring on next year? I wonder. That's it. Oh, we'll yeah. have to figure it out. But I was thinking that, like this time last year, it was uh, not long before this, was it? We were all in uh, in New York together, wandering around, missing trains, having one too many drinks. John with his tiny cocktail. It was a uh, it was great <laughs> oh, time. Yeah, 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 yeah. The one the <laughs> Damn. Yes, that was that was quite the trip for one uh, full gear 2022, where the questions were. Um, is AEW even going to bring CM Punk back? And uh, the answer yeah. was yes. And would he leave again? <laughs> yes, the answer would be that. And it seems oh, like the, the eternal figure uh, in your mm -hmm. worlds and ours is one uh, Phil Brooks. And I would say 2023, once again, mm -hmm. um, he's the title character. Is he not, JP? Oh, he is. Yeah, he's always the title character. He never dis He never leaves our lives, this bloke. He really is. It's, it's kind of... Always, I mean, in many ways, like you would have thought with like someone like the death of the Queen that that would kind of take on board. But CM Punk <laughs> seems to have taken on that global figure that we all love speaking about, isn't it? Good old Phil. There he is. Uh, Phil. For, for video viewers. But yeah, he's... Um, I can't get away from the bastard. Lads, I, I don't know what I don't know what else to say about it. It's just like it feels like he's gonna be like on my deathbed. Somebody's just gonna put like a picture of Phil Brooks there in front of me, and it'll be the last thing I ever see. But um, it'd be a, it'd be a more boring place without him. I think me and Way both recognise that photo of CM Punk from there because that's one of the many photos we can use to uh, you know for a nice bit of YouTube clickbait. You know, just throw them up oh, there. Yeah. Up there. Oh, yeah. I've, got a, I've got, a, got a folder on my phone if, I don't, if you're the same way where it's big list of CM Punk photos, big yeah. list of Tony Khan photos. Always come in useful. You know, you're going to use them at some point. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. The, the you know, one with him cross legged <laughs> is great. You know, but this yeah. one is is great. It's got good contrast and, and good lighting on his face. <laughs> Um, but I, I'm sure you guys have realized, I mean, it's not like, um, so here's the thing. Like I, I, we, we do our shows, we talk about whatever's topical. And then at the end of the shows for YouTube, I tend to pick out like what I think might be, you know, the most interesting topics. And yeah, I, I hate to admit it, but like most of the time when we talk about the man, it, it's going to be about CM Punk and automatically you see the difference in engagement between, uh, just any other story and a CM Punk story. Um, yeah. Why? Why are people still so interested in this guy? <laughs> even when it's people complaining in the comments, even when it's people going, ah, another CM Punk video, they're there, aren't they? It's just, it's something yeah. about him. It's like, I've been saying this on the on the Grapple shows, like, when I was growing up, my favorite wrestler was Shawn Michaels. As an adult, my favorite wrestler is CM Punk. I think I just like problematic men. And like, there's something compelling about both of those figures that's mm -hmm. kind of carried me through my life. And that's the thing about Punk, isn't it? He's all, no matter what, he's always the center of the, the news cycle, always the center of, of discussion for good and bad. And we'll, we'll probably sat here next year having the same conversation. Oh, he's back at AW. Oh, he's gone back to UFC. There'll be something. Um, he'll find a way. But but I mean it, it definitely says something about um just the man himself right he he doesn't yeah. just make moves he makes the boldest moves whether it, it's going to the UFC or going back to the WWE uh, oh, yeah. your reaction to some of the big CM Punk stories of the year Maddie yeah I'm just you know I know this will Benno won't be happy this but he's home isn't he Benno he's finally <laughs> home now <laughs> and that's where like I'm just so glad you have to watch him in WWE all the way through WrestleMania he's finally gonna get his main events at WrestleMania. 
Oh. And you're just watching, and I just love it, Benno. I just can't what? wait to see your reactions. How long for though, mate? <laughs> if we go back to like September, Maddie, like th- was this was that the the image you expected that you would be seeing? Like, what would you say was the probability of you know just sides putting you know differences aside and Punk ending his way back into WWE? Did you put it like higher than most, or were you kind of pessimistic on th- seeing this kind of an image by the end of the year? Yeah, as soon as, you know, all the rumblings come out, John, I thought, yeah, he would come back. But And then when it was Survivor Series was in Chicago, it just seemed so obvious. And then, I don't know about you guys, but we got put off, didn't we? I certainly got put off with all the the reports the week before Survivor Series saying, oh, he won't be there. And that's why it was even uh, more of a surprise on the night. But, yeah, I did think he'd come back by WrestleMania, definitely. Obviously, another huge topic of discussion for uh, people uh, in, over on your side of the pond this year has been Wembley Stadium and, and All In. Uh, half a year now removed from it. Um, what has sort of been the consensus of the experience? Would you say overall positive and how much interest in there in the year, uh, in the next edition coming up? Yeah, that's been the other staple of our clickbait this year, hasn't it, JP? Um, oh, yeah. Wembley <laughs> ticket sales, <laughs> extra 5,000 on the number. And it always does uh, good numbers for us, doesn't it? Good and bad. I, I feel like we have to interview the guy who works for Brent Council as oh, well, yeah, who actually guy. does tally up the figures. <laughs> who is he? I want to know who he is. Does he actually have any interest in wrestling? Because he could really love it for all we know. But, um, just I mean, judge, the desk, isn't it? <laughs> but ju- judging on early sales, I mean, mm. it's it's there. It feels like it's definitely like kind of becoming an event. Like I hope very much like the event that you see behind me for video viewers as well. That the, the all in it show that we we did with Poison Rana as well, just to just to get that plug in. But um, <laughs> it, it does feel it, it's kind of strange in many ways because I would have thought this would have kick started a whole sort of series of tours and, and everything else, which I, I don't know. It seems to be the case of that seems to be the strategy in Canada, for example, whereby we've, we've kind of had forbidden door and now regular kind of extended tours would be there. And even, even ring of honor would do kind of good crowds uh, over here as well. I, I seem to think, but that's not really been the case. It feels like, no, we're keeping you somewhat at arm's length. We will, we will see you in August and no other time outside before or after that. So mm. it, it, what the overall impact is, I, I, I don't know. It doesn't feel like necessarily anything's changed, but the people who are going to, you know, we were very down on the build, but yeah. the people who were there at the time, it was definitely like it was a, it was an enormous spectacle because Wembley holds that kind of place in everyone's heart. Like it is, it's a, it is the stadium in the UK because it's the yeah. home, because it's the home of football as well. The idea of them doing that kind of a number there is, is going to stand out because it only ever gets beaten by, you know, Taylor Swift, the NFL and like the FA cup final, mm-hmm. even some England games wouldn't get as many as, as what, uh, the attendance oh. would do for that, but it doesn't feel like there's like a sustained impact since then. But um, mm. I don't know plenty of time. I keep them banging on the drum. Maybe Benno, they'll be on the this morning sofa or BBC breakfast, <laughs> and we'll have all all of that going on. Yeah, they're doing all the right things because it's early this year. I'd say like that. Mm. You know, joke about the YouTube thumbnails and the clickbait and all that, but like we're making YouTube videos nine months out now, <laughs> and you know, one of our big complaints last year was that. I don't think they sold to at least the North American audience what JP just said, how important Wembley is in our culture and how big a deal it was. And I think now that, you know, people have seen that and hopefully they can build on that and go go yeah. forward. But I'd say if anything this year, that's at least a positive sign that we've started early and they're already, you know, to the maybe negative effects of other shows selling on, on you know, Collision, Dynamite, it comes up, feels like weekly at the minute given you guys you know can speak to it directly how much in in the lead up to the show or even coming out of it did you find that this event kind of seeped into the everyday news coverage like was this something that you, you think you feel like got outside of just being a wrestling story and can you see that being after seeing this this visual mm-hmm. of this past august at next year's show you know you're you're out and about in town and you can kind of sense the buzz for the show or did you find it yeah. somewhat contained it felt contained, I'd say, yeah. for me. Like, I, I think, but then again, I think me and JP have had this conversation a few times when we just look at this year. Like, you know, the tickets they've sold already, you know, in the 40,000 range. Mm. Like, we wouldn't have guessed that. 
And no. I think that maybe says something to the people we're listening to and paying attention to. And nobody in our bubble, nobody in our Grapple Discord or many of our listeners sounded excited about buying tickets. But clearly it's people more outside of that bubble that are, you know, are buying those 40,000 tickets because the people are yeah. out there, aren't they, JP? Yeah, they are. Um, I mean, I think when when you all said it was contained, Benno, is it the idea of like the publicity for this, you saw it, if you were in London, you saw it on the Tube. You saw yeah. Tube posters. Right. You saw it at bus stops. You saw some advertising, like some TV adverts and, and the rest of it, but it wasn't like it was on, it was the kind of thing, because ITV is like a kind of, you know, that, that you would see it on adverts during the day on ITV or on like what big ITV yeah. programming or that you had AEW stars on mainstream shows, of which someone like an Anthony Agogo, for example, would have been a kind of prime example to kind of use in that position. We didn't really see any of that stuff. And it almost felt yeah. like, because they didn't need to, because they'd sold so many tickets, they'd kind of overshot what, what they were going to be doing anyway, that yeah. they didn't need to. Now, to do it this time round, to do anywhere kind of closely comparable to that, I think that's where they do need to, they do need to go down that route of, yeah. of, you know, cross promotion across sort of several platforms, you know, beating the drum of, of people appearing on mainstream TV, um, for example. And if they manage to do that, then, you know, you never know, you know, it, it, it could end up doing something closer to that, which is not something that you'll, I mean, I was very optimistic they were going to do a big number first time round. This time round, I've sort of said like 65,000. Yeah. And, and, yeah, and, I, and I think that's where I, I kind of sit with that. But to get beyond that, that's going to require them to kind of put in some serious investment and time. But I, I would expect this year, maybe that there might be a few fly-ins from North America because it's very much being positioned as their WrestleMania, mm. their big, big show. So mm. one of the things I can imagine the, the weekend before is we'll see a ring of honor pay-per-view. We might see a Brandon Thurston over there with a clicker at the turnstiles as well. I mean, uh, he might be investing in, a, in that. Not going to rely on uh, Brent Council, I think. Uh. Oh, he has to be interviewing him. If he's not interviewing him, then what the hell are we up to? Oh, That's, I want to uh, see that photo. Brandon stood next to a guy in a white t-shirt, white shirt, and black tie, <laughs> yeah. pointing photo, Triple H style. Got to be done. Yeah. Tony Khan quote tweets it. Always under attack. Hundred uh, <laughs> percent. Hey, let's go around the three of you. What would you each put in the main event slot of that show? Well, mm. Osprey's going to win, going to win the title, isn't he? So I don't know if M- oh, no. MJF's, you know, going to not be champion by then, or if Kenny's not going to be. You know, I would have said before is a, is a illness, Kenny and and Will Osprey for the title, but I'm not sure now what do we reckon. It's definitely Osprey going to win the, the world title, surely. Mm. Hey. It's an interesting one, isn't it? I mean, because you imagine it'll be Will Ospreay and a another. It's yeah, just yeah. what is going to be happening in terms of the MJF storyline. Are we mm-hmm. reaching the point where, obviously, because of his injuries, are they going to need to take the title off him just in order to get him fully fit for for All In as well? Um, if I was going to like sort of hazard a get, I, I would have said Kenny because it ticks so yeah. many boxes that well, it's a enough. trilogy match in the yeah. main event at Wembley for a title. So it's different to the other two they would have had. But Davicitolitis, I don't even know how to say it, but it sounds painful yeah. either yeah. way. Not um, good. <laughs> yeah, not, not good in the slightest. That That's the big kind of thing. But I'll, I'll stick with Kenny versus Osprey. Yeah, I think that's got to be the plan A um, as far as a plan B goes. Yeah, maybe Osprey, MJF, something like that. I think it will be Osprey in the big spot because, again, that was another another thing that surprised us because it was kind of like, well, Osprey's big in our bubble. Osprey's big in you know hardcore yeah. fan circles. Are oh, the seventy odd thousand, or whatever that was going to end up being, gonna know who he is? And he came out, and that was the biggest thing that blew me away. People singing his song, chanting for him. He felt like the biggest star in Wembley, and that was such a big jump from I think where we all positioned Osprey in our heads living here. It was like okay. Likes of us know him, but does a stadium that big? Is that going to go go out for him? And they did. And I think, yeah, they learned that last year. And that's why next year, I think they have to put him in that big spot. I think there's no other what, two ways about it, really. You've got to go that direction. How, how would you assess the, the health, Benno, of RevPro coming, going into the new year? Is it pretty much when it comes to non WWE, non AEW, is it RevPro and just everyone else? And do you, do you see them on like pretty, like stable ground when it comes to like this past weekend's card was just like an incredible like lineup that, that they had. How would you assess just their being long-term viable when, when you're not one of the majors? Mm. Yeah. I think that's the thing. Ospre- uh, you know, Rev Pro has always, you know, been a, a well booked 
well-run business and they've always treated it that way and you have to have your Ospreys coming and going and they always you know manage to you know have these big temple events that you know we do stand head and shoulders above the rest of Brit Res but I think the thing that keeps them running is those you know those regular local shows those regular you know used to be the cockpit now the live in London shows at the 229 like that shows you I think that you know the health the Rev Pro like that they they run those shows they run them regularly they keep their storylines going and I think that's why they they withstood the boom and bust of Brit Res because they've just mm. been staying in their lane. Maybe they didn't boom as loud as a Progress and and some of the other you know companies, but they were solid and they were consistent and they were at that that high level. They're a business set up for I think for the long term. So you will always find that I think you know they're in a in a bit you know the overall British wrestling landscape. You're right. There isn't much else. You know there isn't really a one B Progress is a very different you know thing than it used to be and then we were all at New- in newcastle for north wrestling the-, the other week and every area feels like has their own version of that where it's a lot of the same wrestlers at a certain level but yeah rev pro stand head and shoulders above that so i think while they've had tough times because of the way they run that business i think they've they're healthy enough you know um there's always that carrot being dangled of you know the new japan relationship kept them you know, uh, on on a certain level for a while, an AEW relationship in twenty twenty four. I think that would really help. You know, their health going yeah. into the, into the, into that. But you know, overall, they'll survive. They'll always be there, won't they, JP? They're always the one. It's them. Um, and you know, and that spread it to Andy Quilton the way they run that ship. It is. They feel like. I mean, while Progress are are national in the sense they run more than than one mm. UK city, it does feel in terms of Rev Pro that that's where you're getting the much more kind of complete package. You're going to get kind of yeah. big matches, but you're also getting to see the kind of next big things. So people yeah. like Leon Slater in, in TNA next year is going to be, you know, he's, he's just now become the, the cruiserweight champion. People like RKJ, I think the use yeah. of Anthony Agogo, if they can get yeah. to use him on a regular basis, just because of the name he has from boxing and being an Olympian. Um, I think all of those things kind of come to the mix and they, and it was the work they did actually during the pandemic. That was mm. like really. That's what it felt like. The copper box show that they had, which I'll imagine they'll be going back to before uh, all in as well. But they've 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 done things in a steady way, and they've done it in like like Benno says. They they're like the epitome of consistency and just yeah. building upon what they have and delivering a product that works necessarily for that audience. There are things that could help them like, I mean, a, a TV outlet and kind of enhanced production values in order to kind of the, the greater growth um, internationally as well. But it does feel like if you're going to, if you're going to be in the UK and you're going to watch one British wrestling show, then really yeah, Rev Pro is the, is the only real place that you're going to gonna go to that you know is going to deliver. Not one PW, Ben, Ben. <laughs> uh, who saw that coming John nobody nobody it was a shock blew everyone's mind the you day know, that thing just just fell apart I went back and listened to when you guys covered their return and like you mm-hmm. pretty much outlined the epitaph right there of pretty much this is what's going to happen and we will all be in this rosy period that oh it's this great comeback and then it's like let's learn from history and do you guys like pretty much outlined it to a T it was rather incredible yeah I have a I have a phrase, John, about reading history books and how you can learn from it, particularly about normally how Vince McMahon was a bastard, but it's just, it's applicable in a lot of other cases as well. And I think in this case, it's about how British shindy promotions that go away and die should really stay dead in this yeah. case. Or maybe it's the lack of Steve Carino and Abyss that did for 1PW, <laughs> because that's what that company yeah. seemed to be very much built on. <laughs> My last question for you, Maddie. On Monday, April the 8th of 2024, the day after WrestleMania, our two champions coming out of WrestleMania will be dot, dot, dot. John, you know. CM Punk and, oh, sorry, no, Matty. Oh, go on. It's got to be, for me, This it pains me to say it, but I do think it will be Cody Rhodes. And I do think, I don't know whether Phil's going to do that job. I don't know. I think he'll have to do the job. I, know, I, think, I think it'll be <laughs> Chef and Cody Rhodes, but I hope it's Roman and CM Punk. There you go. No, we'll be arguing about it either way. <laughs> yeah, either way. We'll find the way. <laughs> and uh, can we expect um, a major announcement in, in the coming months of when the pre-sale will begin for All In It 2? Is that is that in the, in the works a, at all? Because um, you guys, um, it, it, when we saw it, like, through Brayden and Davey, like, the response and seeing the photos, like, 
it looked just incredible what you guys uh, staged. And I mean, it had to be really cool for you guys just to take the podcast and, you know, in mm -hmm. in living color, see all these people come out for you. Like you guys did incredible with this event. I was. It was absolutely and and massive shout out as well to to Braden and Davey yeah, as, as just being like absolutely tremendous and brilliant to to work with in terms of getting it mm -hmm. set up. And it, it we, we were we, we were worried. Like we thought, oh, God, I mean, are we going to do any about like? So is, is it going to be us and about ten other people in a quite sort of like uh, dingy room um, at, yeah. at the Trinity? But no, it was. It was phenomenal. Um, it was it was just an absolute blast. It feels like a massive head rush at this point. I'm looking back and going, did that really happen? But yeah. um, our plans in the works for it, I, I think we'd said that like almost before we'd started doing the show itself. We thought, well, we're going to have to do this again. And, and as soon as they announced they were coming back, then yeah, I I, I, I can't see a world why, why we wouldn't be doing this. But m maybe we'll need the Copper Box and not Rev Pro. I don't know. <laughs> oh, there you go. There we go. See what's available. Those venues are getting booked up quick. Yeah, we'll have to uh, get locked But yeah, I'd imagine there'll be something. Well, guys, uh, we want to thank you. Uh, encourage everyone uh, support Grapple on Patreon. You can check out uh, Grapple on YouTube as well. Um, they put out phenomenal shows, great analysis, and uh, a great breakdown of everything across the wrestling industry, whether it be uh, Phil Brooks' uh, latest uh, comings and goings or right down to the latest <laughs> happening on MLW Fusion. They have you covered. And uh, guys, uh, I thank you so much for getting all of our schedules coordinated on uh, two separate continents to uh, bring this together. I, I would love to do this again sometime in the future. It was really fun to catch wow. up with all three of you, some for the first time. It's always a pleasure, guys. Like I think I, I always say this. I always when I need an excuse to bust out the post hat. I feel like I'm holding on to my post colours just by I'll do this. And we obviously we're doing the the big fat quiz of the year. We'll have done it on the on the poison rana side this year, but still, you know, I think it, it keeps me in the loop, keeps me in the rotation. So always appreciate the invite, guys. It's always uh, great. Can I just say for myself, thank you for the invitation. I just love watching you mm. two on YouTube. So when if this is on there, I'm going to be taking a photograph because I'm actually on screen with you two, so I'm absolutely made up. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, same here. Like, you mean JP or, or Way and John? <laughs> oh, no, I'm not used to. <laughs> Born of us. photo with Way, let's be honest. He's going to crop me out and just be the next yeah. way. Uh, with, the, with the hunter pose with the finger. As a, as another as another member of the dad club as well with you guys, like, yes. you know, as well at, this, at, this, at the same time. Like You are on a different level, JP, okay? <laughs> yeah. I have one kid. <laughs> I, mate, five. I, I don't. I don't yeah. You've got to. You've got to get another. Certainly, John. You need another two. Way <laughs> another three. Come on, mate. Yeah. Stepping up, lads. That's that's you what I'm saying. Exclusive club. I will say. <laughs> it's, we'll it's, bring it's, it's an back for the dad chat. It's, it's, it's oh, we'll get all the different generations of. Uh, of always to look forward to. I, I have to change the nappies of one, and I can have points with another. It's mad. <laughs> it doesn't feel right. That like in and of itself feels entirely wrong. But no, lads. It's honestly, it's an yes. app. Uh, like it's. An Thank honor you. being on with 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 you guys honestly uh well, thank we're, you we're, so, we're so much for you guys us. likewise man so th yeah, thanks so always. much we'll do this again and uh maybe we'll make it to all in it too we will we'll try and make it happen but uh all the yeah, best guys in the new year and uh have a great holiday season yeah all you the best, too guys. guys have a brilliant one the grapple lads jp maddie and benno joining mm. us this is almost like uh, suzuki gun breaking up and going their different ways where we we've yeah. heard from martin bushby we've heard from benno we had stephanie on as well um shout out jamesy who is uh i am sure out there listening uh as well um but yes the grapple lads happy to hear from them and uh and first time i've ever done anything with it with jp on a, on a show so uh um, right big, big fan of all their work yeah I've, i mean mm -hmm. listen to him but never I, I, the two of us have never, have never spoken um you know, in, in person or via Zoom. I'm sure they prefer the comparison with uh, Suzuki Goon rather than, um, you know, Bullet Club and House of Torture, for instance, which was something else you could have gone with. D different, a different breakup of uh, the networks. Hmm. But yes, we mentioned it there. But of, of course, uh, Grapple and Poison Rana, they teamed up for a really big event uh, over All In Weekend last last August. Mm -hmm. Might so, be an annual tradition at this point. Could be. If, if All In It 2 happens, I mean... How many how many rooms do you think uh, Davy's parent uh, Davy's mom has uh, that we can all stay at? Oh, um, can we all uh, fit in the uh, in in the Portman Estate? You know, I'll I'll, I'll crash in the garage. Do they have? Uh, sorry, garage. 
Gar- the garage. garage. The garage. garage. I'll crash in the garage if, if they've got one. Okay. We'll, we'll bring our sleeping bags and, you know, d- does your back wonders to sleep on a hard surface. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, we're, we're not above slumming it. So, yeah. um, or we could, or we could just like ditch Braden at the hide his passport and he gets caught at the border and that opens up a room. I, I, I don't think he'd have any issue um, staying there. There's no longer. way he's listening this late into the show. So I think our plan no. is pretty safe. We'll, D- Davey will be up to this point in the show, but uh, Bra- Braden's tapped out long ago. Um, or has he? Dot, dot, dot. Knock, knock. Who has arrived? It is the Poison Rana crew, Braden Harrington, and Davey Portman here on the Post Wrestling Christmas Show. A happy holidays. Hello. Hello, hello, hello. Ah, we're bringing the Christmas cheer. It's always nice to be back here in the post office live. We're feeling festive, wearing our Santa hats. Oh, yeah. You got a whole Santa outfit on. We're ready. With this I, outfit, I, feel- I was expecting a hello, ho, 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 ho. Oh, oh, that. let's go back. Rewind let's go it. Back. Can we do it yeah, again? Yeah. <laughs> we, we're live, pal. <laughs> <laughs> I, I see what you're doing here. You you get us in the morning before we, we're too merry, yeah, right? Yeah, like, yeah. that's how they do, like, derbies in the UK with football. They're like, if, if they're, like, rival teams, we get them playing right at the morning. So no one's too crazy yet. So yeah, they booked we us, see you. They we get us it. early on Christmas morning so yeah. that we haven't quite had enough Bailey's and eggnog, mold wine, just and yet. Rap. But it's it's coming. It's coming. I'll, I'll, I'll let my secret out here. Okay, I can't speak for way. I have virtually zero interest in chatting wrestling with you guys because I'm more <laughs> intrigued. Number one, um, Davy's Davy's Kitchen has become one of my favorite Instagram follows of whatever <laughs> meal he is making. Has never invited me over, but that's a, a separate issue. But unlike uh, some previous years where you guys have been traveling at different places, do I understand, will you guys be spending Christmas day together and what is on the agenda for uh, Christmas day? Or are you going your separate ways? We, we actually spent Christmas day together this last Christmas. Yeah. And we got pretty, uh, the BD was turned inside out. It was pretty fun. We had what, 15 people (laughs) over, I think. That's right. You did your whole uh, Christmas, uh, dinner together last yeah, yeah we were alone That's on right. christmas and it was it was pretty good and uh, this year you're hosting another orphans christmas for yeah a little little smaller this year yeah uh, which is nice it's it's hard like doing you know turkeys and hams and stuff in a in a little kitchen for a lot of people but um yeah i've got a few people coming over and we'll probably be spending the night I think karaoke, yeah, busting out the karaoke. That's definitely something that happened last year and this year. That's become a tradition. Uh, I'm attempting the scariest thing, in my opinion, which is uh, taking my girlfriend to meet my family and my girlfriend taking me to meet her family. So Ooh. really, like, wow. I got you know, you know, that's that's for some people. That's this this has been a long me. time coming. I mean, this is not a new relationship, but this is the first parental meeting. Well, uh, well, my mom, you know, my mom's a sweetie, but my my dad's side and stuff. So, you know, split, you know, parents we've, we've mentioned all the time, par- uh, kids who come from divorced families. Christmas can be really good or really bad. The good, you get double presents, you get to go to double stuff. But the other side is you got to travel to all the different mm. families then, and stuff. But that could be good for some people. It could be bad for some people. But yeah, my real family is right here. With John Way and Davey, because like, <laughs> man, I, I spend more time probably talking to you people half the time. It, it is. It sounds awful. Obviously, I, I miss my family. I think this will be my eighth Christmas in a row, wow. uh, not at home. Uh, I have done some like Christmases in February when I've gone to visit, but uh, it does get kind of stressful. Like my parents are split as well and and doing like the, the different days. So normally it would be like Christmas Day at my mom's and Boxing Day at my dad's. But my dad gets really uh, into like he stresses and becomes like a host. It's like I'm a, a visitor in his house because he's like, is everything OK? And one year I remember, I don't think it was even Halloween yet. It was October and I'm at work. My dad knows I'm at work. I look at my phone and I've got messages on Facebook. I've got text messages. I've got about 13 missed calls <laughs> and about like five voice messages. Someone's like, died. Dave, call me, call me. I'm like, mom's dead. What's oh happened? God. Something's oh, happened. And so I'm like, guys, I need to step out of work and call my dad. And I phone him. He's like, yeah, yeah, Dave, I was just wondering. I'm thinking about Boxing Day. Uh, <laughs> do you and Alex like uh, like grilled meats? 
Oh my god! I'm like, Dad, it's it's October 27th. Like, <laughs> I thought someone had died. You've called me 19 times, knowing I'm at work. Yes, I like grilled meat. Well, I, I just I'm worried about Christmas. I'm like, I get it, Dad, but yeah, it it brings out the best and the worst in people. Yeah. See, if I were you, I would have waited till December 23rd and texted, FYI, I'm vegan now, and just seen what the yeah. response would have been. He probably <laughs> would have like got a bit like just kick your door down and yeah and concerned well who needs christmas when you can go maybe once a year now from this point on every summer for a show at wembley stadium with aew is this going to be a yearly tradition for the two of you well we're thinking about it for sure um flights are always quite pricey like christmas and summer are always like pricier to go back home but it's also like my family home is is pretty close to Wembley, so uh, that's that's definitely something we're thinking about. Um, it, it's as if uh, WWE this year saw our travel plans last year and were like, "Huh, Berlin the week before yeah. All In? That sounds good." So yeah, there we we did the fun part was really getting to meet a lot of the post marks out there and the the like the community of of people that I've ne- we've never met. Over here in North America, we the past year we've been doing like live events and shows and watch parties and all sorts of fun stuff. But to t- to kind of take it globally was so bizarre and exciting, and that was kind of the highlight. I mean, like the whole day was just really crazy for us. And I know I'm I'm thinking about it too. Davey's definitely. I mean, you're you're from there. Your mom lives close to Wembley. It definitely makes sense. But I'm like, ah, I want to go again, but it was a it was a, a whole lot of a trip to to kind of put together and stuff. But chop-tees.com to help support my trip to go to <laughs> Wembley this year for a second time because I definitely am thinking about it because it was pretty fun. I mean, all in it too would be the draw for for, for me. I mean, that that would right? uh, that would be pulling at me more so than the Wembley show. You should have seen it. Remember at Forbidden Poor? I mean, we had a hell of a year too, guys. But Forbidden to- Poor, one of the highlights was the karaoke lucha mask thing like we can all agree that was a pretty fun idea so we recreated that at all in it over there in london and man people were were going nuts for singing luchas singing wrestling karaoke while getting gifted a lucha mask and then imagine uh on top of that you open the doors to just a load of random chavs from harrow like then all come the, in. yeah <laughs> yeah then a lot of people come in and hey can i sing matchbox 20 hey can i sing taylor swift no wrestling Oi, bro, i'm gonna do eminem right now <laughs> Like, who are you? <laughs> it's a different world over there. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Um, so you guys have been to a lot of live wrestling events here um, this year. And can you name maybe a singular highlight of the entire year uh, as a wrestling experience for either of you? Oh, I don't even know if I could name one way. That's genuinely a tough question because we do. We're 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 very into wrestling. We go to so many of the indie shows around here. Shout out to Man Lucha in Toronto. We go to so many of the local indie events but we went to all in it like being there in Wembley felt like this like whole crazy thing like wow there's another company that managed to do this that made it feel like a Wrestlemania but uh personally in my own town sitting with a bunch of my friends when Kenny Omega kicked out at one oh my god I could still feel myself being in that moment so I'm gonna pick that one I think uh, it's a tie for me uh between uh Sami Zayn's smackdown promo um when he spoke in french i thought that was just electric and just was such a cool such a cool start to the year with uh elimination chamber and this just monumental rise of Sami Zayn. i thought that was awesome to be there live and uh final countdown hitting at scotia bank arena um i know he's used it once since but hearing that for the first time and I know that song pretty well. And both of us pretty much on the first note looked at each other and was like, they're doing it. They're doing it. And uh, yes, I've seen some incredible matches as well, but I I'm a big like moments guy as well. And I thought that was incredibly special. It's been a year. Yeah. Yeah. I think that um, for sure, like th- this year you had like just so many of those kind of uh, interesting moments that, that we got to go to. And that SmackDown in Montreal was one, as I recall, like, that was kind of like not even a, a guarantee if we were even going to go to SmackDown or not. And I got to say all these months later, like uh, the, the the entrance of Sammy at the pay-per-view was really cool and stuff. I think everyone kind of knew what the outcome would be. But to me, that that promo stands out more for me from that weekend. And just the buzz you could detect in the lead up to that show and the strength of having like your big 
Quebec star that is going into a pay-per-view and that thing just kind of took on a life of its own going into Elimination Chamber and suddenly this was not just the the in-between show from the Rumble to Mania it was like its own cool unique thing I mean that was largely the reason we went was like this this feels like something worth uh covering and, and going to see and the media that that dude did in the lead up like when we were at that media day dude it was like he was talking to every last person that was there and giving them a one-on-one -on -one interview um like he just promoted the hell out of that show and probably realized like this is almost like your audition as a as a top guy and these are some of the obligations of promoting a, a show like this that was clearly he was the star of that card and as always john you had the best questions um i don't remember all my questions i remember asking him about his independent wrestling character and i don't think he uh he wanted to uh, dive too much into that uh that that portion as well um i do want to qu uh, quickly chat a little bit about um christmas traditions Braden. and i know you have a lot of your go-to christmas movies and while not a movie I think one that I am going to add to my list every year of rewatchables is now the Christmas episode from season two of the bear starring Jamie Lee Curtis, oh. which I think has replaced um, the nonstop, like one camera shot edition as my favorite episode of the bear. Yeah. I actually was just chatting with uh, a coworker about this the other day. I was like, Oh, have you caught up on season two? And he's like, yeah. I'm like, have you got to the, the dinner episode? And then his eyes just like minded right now. Like, oh, Jamie Lee Curtis just won an Oscar last year. I think she's coming for an Emmy this year for this specific episode. But yeah, uh, this this one was easily my, I think my favorite episode from the entire series as well, because uh, just like real families at Christmas time and, and get togethers, some people do get a little overwhelmed and anxiety. And the creators of the show managed to make an episode of a TV show that like, encapsulated like all of that th those feelings and presented it and i i definitely i don't know how davy hasn't watched that show yet he lo literally cooks oh, and posts wow. his instagram story this is so it's like made for him. probably Dude, too he's real, too real. <laughs> he's carry von eric is a yeah, chef he's in chicago <laughs> it's great it's great yeah. i it's on my i i've got it downloaded yeah. on my tablet ready to watch like, on my trips and you stuff, know he's gonna have... start raving about it because yeah. it's literally like definitely wait, wait you haven't watched it either have you I finished it. Yeah. yeah, yeah oh, you yeah. did well. I, I can't keep up with what shows you do watch and don't watch. Um, <laughs> oh, Davey, like you will totally love the it's bear because cooking. you've worked in that that environment that you'll have an even greater appreciation for it than we do. Yeah. That is a thing, though. I spend 40 hours a week in that in environment. Why would I want to show up? Like, uh, I do want to watch it. There, There is a, a film I watched, I think, last year called Boiling Point, um, which is uh, set in a restaurant as well which is done all entirely in one take. It's right. about 90 minutes and uh, follows, like starts the head chef arriving late to work and like follows them and the the servers and stuff. And it's it's excellent. Like it's really good. But watching it, I was like, man, I should be relaxing right now. And I just feel like I'm at work. Yeah, no, it's good. Um, just kind of closing things off here for me. Um, predictions for the new year. I have um, one to ask each of you. Uh, Braden, who will be revealed as the devil? And Davey, who is going to be TNA's <laughs> big surprise? Shall we say this after three? One, two, three. Shane, Shane McMahon. McMahon. <laughs> <laughs> as both. Okay. Here comes the money. Yeah, uh, we, uh, we, we were recently doing enough next, uh, dating ourselves now, but we, we came to the conclusion that TNA has said they've, they've got their biggest signing yet, and you, you, you told me it was... It was Shane. And I said, no, how can that be when he's the devil in AEW? So therefore, we've come to the decision that he's both. He's both. He's going to be both this year. They've worked TNA. together before. <laughs> I think it's the only thing that can save AEW. Just are, you, are you saying that the devil is hard to kill? There oh, there we go. Yeah. Devil is hard to kill. Yeah. And uh, what's 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 like more evil than money? Yeah. Exactly. That's it. And what what are the the Bean Street Posse doing? You know, they're all the guys in the masks. Exactly. Yeah. They're all the guys. It all it all makes sense. Yeah, it really like all comes together. And you know, you could cut the same promo, the the name on the things. I don't know. There's there's ways they could do it. But Shane O'Mac, the devil in AEW, and I'll be completely back. Like they are so back. Got to got to see that death match between Shane O'Mac and Eddie Edwards' wife, don't we? On TNA as no, well. No, that's Okada, oh, yeah. and uh, yeah, they got that one. Eddie Edwards' Shane wife. And Okada, the greatest yeah. in the world.
Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. I, maybe we could get Okada versus Shane in either of those companies. Wow. Anything's right. possible. Oh, yeah. The reunion of Okato and Samoa Joe potentially on the horizon in 2024. All these options. I mean, you're just opening up a Pandora's box of opportunities for these companies. Yeah. I mean, 2004 is, 2024 is going to be really crazy if if TK gets his gets his checkbook in line and does go after Shane McMahon. Just yeah. throw everything you had for that story out the window and just put him in. And like, yeah, heads will turn. Can't wait. It's going to be wild. Well, the tagline for the Poison Rana crew when it relates to chop dash dash tease.com is here comes the money alert everybody on uh, where to follow all of your your holiday get togethers in in the poison rana universe and uh, yeah. what, what can we can be looking forward to well uh by the time this show is out you can check out both our uh christmas party stream uh that we had um that's uh available on our youtube which is youtube.com slash at poison rana pod as well as uh martin bushby hosting the big fat wrestling quiz of the year where he'll test a bunch of us with questions all throughout 2023 uh and then yeah brayden what else have we got coming? yeah i mean we do a whole lot obviously every tuesday night you can catch us doing up next covering nxt here on the post feed but davy and i do a whole lot of other shows every week we drop a new poison rana podcast where we cover everything in wrestling dynamite even WWE Raw lately. Wow, look at that. I'm watching Raw again. Who would have thought 2024 is the new me? Uh, there's also so many other shows that we do. We have Shot in the Dark. Sino covers you in all the wrestling you might not watch in 15 minutes or less. We have tons of free shows on the network. And we also have a Patreon with like retro movie reviews and, and wrestling reviews and so much other things. So yeah, we keep busy podcasting about wrestling and pop culture and we can't do it without you people and our community and everything. And that's why we've, we've launched a, a new website for our, our shirts and hats and everything. Shout out Dickie bird, the, the King, because uh chop dash tees now is a place you can get like a frog on a, on a hat and on a shirt and a hoodie. And we have so many great like items out now. It's the best merch in wrestling. I think already. Better than AEWs, that's, yeah. that's definitely for sure. So, I mean, check us out, support your small-time content creators, and shout out to all the people who've been asking for, for merch and who've already bought stuff and everything. So uh, help me go to Mania this year, and or all in. Whatever. Get yourself a Kabuki Kai Pirate Hugger shirt while still available, because no, we didn't ask their parents uh, if it was acceptable, but yeah. get it while it's there. Before the CD comes <laughs> in. So, yeah, uh, lots and lots of fun stuff that we do. Poisonrana.ca for everything, or at PoisonRanaPod, Twitter, Instagram. And give us a follow hit that subscribe it goes a long long way but we couldn't be here without our two dads john away merry christmas to you guys i know it's it's probably a lot hectic in your households but you still made time to tack to talk to so many people here today so honestly things seem way calmer than maybe over at the bd uh, tower um here you know we're, 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 we're a lot not more screaming bring, bottles yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly well, uh, on a final note, the four of us will be getting back together on Sunday night, January 7th for our annual best and worst of 2023 show. So the way we are going to be doing this, um, the show will be released for everyone the following day on Monday, January 8th. However, if you want to join us live that night, Sunday, January 7th at 8 Eastern, a free, uh, well, a live stream will be available to patrons of both post wrestling and and Poison Rana. So if you are a post wrestling cafe member or a uh, Patreon member of Poison Rana's, join us live Sunday night, January 7th at 8 Eastern. Everyone else will get the show for free uh, the following day. So we look forward to going through all of the categories, the good and the bad that 2023 provided us. And uh, always a fun time when the four of us get together and we will all be doing it live and in person together as well. Bust out the bourbon. Yes, that's right. Davey's bringing the Haydens and, um, and I'll bring Brain. the Bret Hart rum. Oh, do you have some? Oh, no, I'm joking. Oh. <laughs> Why would you say that way? I oh, I just had a layover in Calgary and was really kind of hoping that my flight was delayed so yeah. I could get some Bret Hart rum from the Hitman. Isn't bar. it? Isn't it crazy that Bret Hart has his own rum, owns a bar, and yet Shawn Michaels is the one teaching the young wrestlers of today? Like, if you told yourself that 20 years ago, it would definitely be the other way. Around. Brett's having his wild phase yeah. in his 50s. And he 50s. deserves it. He deserves yeah. it. Bret Hart's bar is going to be my cho choice for best social media account of the year. <laughs> I think I annoy Davey by sending him my favorites. Not uh, annoying at all. I just love that this is our only conversations in our text stream. It's just like... 
this Let's this start. girl's enjoying her old fashioned at, <laughs> at Brett's bar. Yeah. Well, guys, we look forward to chatting with you on January seventh. Have a merry Christmas and uh, and Braden enjoy the best Home Alone of them all, Home Alone three, according to Roger. Next Ebert. year, we gonna do it. Uh, we gonna I do don't it. Know. Next year, we're Roger gonna do it. Might, might it. tempt me. <laughs> he brought it up. We're doing it. All right, it's happened. <laughs> merry Christmas. See you guys. Merry Christmas. Oh, man. So here I am going over this whole plot, and Brayden and Davey were right there at the door and uh, eavesdropping on my plan. Crazy how that timing works out. But yes, the lads from Poison Rana. And I'm going to drop the term lads now as uh, we, we continue on. A bit overused already on my behalf. Yeah, I mean, they refer to themselves as lads. But I mean, at what point do you d um, not qualify as a lad? You know, like we're, we're all we're all approaching you and I are approaching our 40s. They're ap approaching their mid 30s. OK. Do you, are you still a lad in your mid thirties? Listen, if, um, if Sean Michaels is still the heartbreak kid, I don't think we have to worry about our designation. True. True. Okay. Uh, these two have continued their evolution immensely over the past year. I mean, ever since they changed their name, who would have thought, you know, get a new logo, get a new name. And then all of a sudden you're selling out venues all across the world. You're leading world renowned wrestling karaoke sessions everywhere. Um, you're getting retweeted by, you know, uh, uh, certain um, uh, members of the wrestling community for your Halloween costumes taken over Poison Rana. Yeah, some of their live events, I think they've really tapped into something with uh, their watch parties and doing the the karaoke. Like we remember over uh, not just Forbidden Door, but when uh, when AEW came to town the first time and they did their their after party after that. I mean, these guys are uh, they're always out there hustling and we appreciate all their all their contributions. You can hear them Tuesday nights on the network right after NXT. So they will be off this Tuesday, but they're coming back for New Year's Eve. And plenty of content from Poison Rana on the Poison Rana feed, which you could subscribe to on all your podcast platforms, as well as their YouTube, youtube.com slash at Poison Rana pod. Don't forget the ad. I think they've got about nine hours of Lord of the Rings discussion up uh, over the most recent past. You ever watch any of them? I've seen I've seen the three Lord of the Rings films. Oh, and wow. um, and that was pretty much um a year in my life essentially was watching uh, th those three. I mean, it was, um, so I, I, I dated a girl at the time who was like obsessed with Lord of the Rings. So, uh, um, ringer. Um, yeah. So it was, I saw the first one and I, I think I liked the first one the most, um, the twin towers. Is that it? The two towers, the twin towers, the two towers, right? <laughs> is that the yeah. second one? I think it's I do that you're asking the wrong person I've, I I barely got through the first one this is uh, it's like the first one's about the Shire the second one is the big fight and the third one is like it just doesn't end okay that's that's the Lord of the Rings trilogy they're not my cup of tea but I also have not revisited these in a long time and they seem way too daunting to sit down and want to um digest all of uh all of the, the, the like the Lord of the Rings uh and it's yeah. history, but God bless those who, who enjoy them. They're uh, like, I'm just, uh, my wife loves the Harry Potter films and there's, she sat me down to like rewatch some of these and they're, dude, they're just the longest things in the world. It's, it's funny what we have uh, patience for if we actually like something. I mean, if, if, if you set her down to, I don't know, watch an edition of raw, I'm sure she has oh, she'd be done in, in five minutes. Okay. She's yeah, not watching any so. professional wrestling. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, L length is not my, like I, I, I can watch movies that are three plus hours and, and love them. Um, Oppenheimer I thought was fantastic, but, um, yeah. it, it's gotta be in, in my wheelhouse. Exactly. Like, one of the weirdest things I think that came out at, at about this time, maybe last year, or even two years ago at this point, and speaking of Peter Jackson, Jackson was he worked on that, this Beatles uh, documentary, like basically a restoration right. of, you know, their let it be documentary. But like this thing was like three parts and like three hours long, each of nothing. Like it's, I mean, I wouldn't say nothing. Is, is it just footage? Like how's it? Yes. Yeah, I haven't watched these, but like everyone. It's pretty much just footage it. of the Beatles just hanging out, working on, you know, what the album that ultimately became Let It Be. Um, And it's just like extended, like they're hanging out, talking. And you can tell there's like a great deal of editing just to even create the semblance of these people hanging out. Because I believe listening to interviews they were very limited in camera angles. So they had to like use footage from really all 
part, part, parts and, and pieces to create reaction shots and all that. But it's like four hours of you're seeing these guys in the 60s hanging out and talking, oftentimes just goofing around doing nothing. And I was completely engrossed by all like nine hours of this. So if it's in your wheelhouse, you'll have plenty of time and patience, I suppose. So what you're saying is rather than editing the the, the footage, they just let it be. <laughs> Up next, yeah. who's at the door? Because Wade's about to shoot me. <laughs> the Christmas show rolls on, and now we welcome in all parts of MCU later. Wade's uh, official uh, podcast of choice. He told me, you know, these are these are my favorite co-hosts, Rich Fan and WH Park, who are joining us for the Christmas show. Uh, first off, a happy holidays to you, Rich, and WH as well. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. And Wade, thanks for the uh, vote of good confidence here. <laughs> no problem. Anytime. And I truly Wade has it. his private rankings of his favorite uh, co-hosts. Um, yeah. you, got, you guys scored very favorably. Uh, Although I might have to take some points off right now from WH eating on the Christmas show. Oh boy, hey, disgusting! Listen, is it Christmas uh, related food? WH at least I'm trying to. You want to see what I'm here. what I'm eating? Uh, yeah, right. I'm eating a uh, Jap- Japanese uh, co- chocolate covered uh, mushroom shaped cookies. Okay. okay, are those drug free? Is that WH listen. energy? <laughs> listen, I, I'm totally straight edge like my boy Phil. You know, over in uh, the Wee Land, and then I have a. Uh, you, you like this way? I got some uh, authentic uh, chew high, high chew from Japan. Okay. My a friend of mine visited me last month. She was in town, so she brought me all this souvenirs, or as they say, omiyaki from Japan. I would like. I, I do like it. I would like it even more if you waited the fifteen minutes for this interview before consuming this oh, authentic high. Hi, Chu. So, don't affect your, your Waze power rankings here. He's uh, w- w- Waze wow. put, up, put up with this. I, I I might leapfrog you in the rankings. I, I'm not going to touch rich fan territory. As long, as long as as long as like uh, uh, you know, uh, Eric Marcotte doesn't jump leapfrog over me. Mar- Marcoche, <laughs> Marcoche, Mr. Marcoche. So, Rich, um, um, I hear through the grapevine that um, WrestleMania in Philadelphia it might be the greatest congregation of all people in our in our universe uh including you who i mean a pennsylvania native yourself so this is uh this is almost like a home game for you that particular weekend but it seems like all of us will be in philadelphia that weekend yeah yeah wh and i and this is going to be the full wh experience because he gets in he's going to be housed here at the fan compound with myself my wife and my son we're going to spend a couple of days in Pittsburgh, get to do some sightseeing and food, you know, food sightseeing because he's a foodie. I, I have to bring my A game. I have like a dossier of places I'm like checking off over the holiday break to make sure I don't screw this up. And then we're driving down the Philly. And uh, I think we're going to be within like, I, I want to say two or three miles, WH, of you guys, because his goal is we're going to see the non WrestleMania things, maybe a show or two in person. And do the usual, like, find a comic shop, find a collectible shop that might be cool. And then also, hopefully, see you guys for the world's awesomest WrestleMania review. And what are some of those non-wrestling tourist things? I'm, I'm curious. What would you recommend for somebody new to Philadelphia? Well, uh, as having a couple of friends uh, and family members who live in the area, the first thing, clearly, if you've never been just for uh, the, the cultural relevance of it, going to see the Rocky statue, going to see the Liberty Bell, uh, going to see, you know, the different marketplaces. Like I wouldn't go, I'm going to get a list. I'll have a, uh, probably on my Twitter, uh, Excel spreadsheet or a Google sheet of things you can do from local native folks and say, if you want to do these things, here's some of my friends from Philly have at it. And then I'm also going to try to get a couple of collectible places. Cause I realize your fine country is a little aggressive when it comes to the price points of certain things like comics and Legos compared to here in the States. Is that so? I mean, I, I guess I have no idea that much anymore, but uh, I know we do have a weaker dollar um, and maybe that that doesn't necessarily help things. Is yeah, it so too like much of a comics? Uh, there are yeah. a couple of uh, gifts I'm giving WH just so if there are any federales out there, I don't want them to misconstrue what this is. I am giving a gift to my good friend WH Park of a few Star Wars issues yeah. where in Listen, the final I, I ain't paying no fucking 
fucking tax on any of this shit coming back across the border. W H at the border with the with the border guard is is a scene I I hope to be a witness to someday. I don't care. They're carrying like fucking HK MP5s on them. I fuck them. I'm not paying any customs or taxes on this shit. Like, do you have anything? This photo might be at the border that they have up there. If this man crosses definitely pull him over and question everything um, i well i actually feel like wh has like exactly the energy i would expect of a border crossing guard himself <laughs> like that would be in another lifetime a perfect job for you oh uh, if only i i'd have a pension and like you know health health you know full-on health insurance not just the basic stuff we have here but at least it's better than america i'll, I'll say that necessary Gentlemen, you we lack you in healthcare. It. We make up for in cheap comics. What can I say? <laughs> That's it. it. You two have uh, done a great job of covering the MCU this year, uh, and I, I personally thank you for it because it's been tough for me to keep up with a lot of it um, that's that's been going on. It, um, but I would also say that maybe this year it feels like the world has turned on the MCU, and justifiably or unjustifiably, um, I'm kind of curious to hear from the both of you at the end of the year, um, maybe at, at a time when the reputation of Marvel is maybe as bad as it's ever been. Um, what are your thoughts on the MCU right now, and what could it do in 2024 to improve it? WH, you want to kick off? Sure. I mean, I think it's been a year of like some nice plateau highs and then some extremely deep lows um secret invasion being one of them um the other one being you know ant-man and wasp quantumania i i i was looking reviewing like on the site like what we what we reviewed this year on mc later and and we started off with quantumania which was like a low point for me um then we came back with a pretty good high in, in terms of guardians of the galaxy volume three i thought that was a really high point for me for this year uh secret invasion not so much. I, in fact, I think I, I dislike that more than Quantum Mania. And then, you know, we, we were lucky. We ended things off with a very good, you know, uh, TV show with Loki season uh, two, which I thought was really good. And then I and I think we plateaued really well with with the Marvels. Like it's not, not something not something I think it was bad, but not something I think was great. But it was it was it was good for what it was. And and I I I, I mean the best thing I can say about anything is like i'm i don't feel like i wasted my time or money watching it so i can say that about the marvels and and uh you know i i don't think people need to necessarily go see it in theaters you know they can they can wait for it to launch on the the streaming the streaming platform when it does come on there but you should watch it i think people should watch it i think especially if you liked miss marvel you will like the marvels See, I, I think John is like the perfect, you know, barometer of what exactly maybe, you know, crossing over to somebody who has watched at this point everything up until Endgame, right, John? But yeah. you've had very little incentive, right, to catch up with anything else. Yeah, well, and it's not even just like word of mouth that hasn't, you know, struck me in such a way that's like, man, you got to drop what you're doing and go and go see this. Like, there hasn't been that. And it's just been the the barrage of shows for me that it's just trying to to squeeze in like it's it's a big commitment to sit down once a week and fit this in when i'm not hearing like overwhelming things uh, positive uh, about it and it just seemed like they're almost like at the peak of this like post end game phase it's like me they made all these announcements for all the and everyone was so overwhelmed but then it's like okay now now you've got to sit down and eat this meal and dude it's like we're I, I think it could definitely take from, you know, some less is more. Um, but but that I, like, conversely, like we talk about that on, on the wrestling side of things, like there's just so much to keep up with that it, it becomes very tiresome. And that's sort of with me. I missed one series and it just becomes easier to then it's out of your habit to get back into it. And that's sort of, I guess, where I'm at now, where I'm I'm looking for that series or that film or that character that's going to spur me on to like jump back on and and get re-engaged rich do you me, think yeah oh go ahead way i'm sorry no i was just gonna throw the question to you yeah for me john's point made me think of something before this show i was uh talking with my wife because this is the start of my son's two week two week vacation my god and so it's us trying to figure out the plan of attack who's doing what mother-in-law tagging in all that fun stuff but to me and last night we wanted to watch he's he's big into hockey if you follow me on twitter or on instagram you'll see trey with tons of hockey stuff 
he wanted to watch Game Changers on Disney Plus, mm-hmm. uh, which is the Mighty Ducks television series. It's gone because they decided during the strike they were going to pull some titles to kind of squeeze the actors and actresses in terms of royalties and things like that. So I have to sit Sunday night and explain to my son the economics of why you can't watch this awesome show that you really enjoyed. And he's like, so they, they didn't want to send someone a check for 30 cents. I was like, yeah, when you put it that way, that's pretty absurd. And I think that's a microcosm, both with wrestling and with MCU later, what we're dealing with. This is the chickens coming home to roost of the streaming evolution and revolution. And as John, there's so much, there is so much out there right now. And I think the character that would bring you in, John, if not for the strike, would have been Amon Villani, who plays Ms. Marvel, because she is so engrossing. She is so engaged and she is so charismatic. Uh, when I went down to uh, North Carolina to visit my good friend Bruce Mitchell, the owner uh, at the shop there was mentioning that so many people bought her Miss Marvel run just because they saw her in the show. They loved her in the show. They saw her in the Marvels, and now they want to buy the comic that she's writing and part of starring herself, her character, her analog in Marvel. And they're missing that, and it's in part because we're so tied now that just like when I was on recently with you and we were talking with WrestleNomics with the idea of uh, ratings and and what's the next big deal. I think with Marvel, the biggest issue they're running into is the surfeit of shows that people are getting tied into as much as the beasts they've created. If you look at Variety, if you look at Deadline, if you look at any of the trades, it's always about Marvel as the industry leader failing in some of these regards. And some of it is they're risking adding these new characters to the fold for the sake of growing that next audience. And they're taking that growing pain and they're taking it on the chin. Uh, you look at what's coming out now. In the next few weeks, we're going to be reviewing Echo as well as uh, what's about to happen with uh, the What If series. And a lot of that are going to be experimental moves, much like with the first season, that'll tendril into other movies, other series, other ideas. And you got to kind of like bed it in. And I think Marvel can afford to do it. But right now with DC, with Warner Brothers Digital, with some of those predatory practices that Zaslav and those in the executive wings are doing to some of these properties, I think just like with AEW and WWE, we're seeing with Marvel and great and in a greater scale, some of the larger uh, comic book universe, there's a lot of money to be had, but it's not going to be all good money. I use the example uh, kind of to conclude of. Let's take Marvel, let's take DC out of the picture. Look at Image or Independent Works, and you look at Kirkman, who created The Walking Dead, which was a runway hit that they have now squeezed the blood out of the stone, re-jiggered it back into the stone, and they're squeezing it again for the sake of making more money. But then on Amazon, he's making money hand over fist with Invincible to the point where he got access, and this is more, I think, maybe way less WH because he makes fun of me, as always, about this. He bought access to Transformers. He bought access to the Universal Movie Monsters. He bought access to G.I. Joe. And he's making his own little universe of comic books and entertainment with those properties that are doing quite well, but they don't have to explode to the level of, I need a TV show. I need a movie. I need the lunchbox. And I think that's the issue with a lot of these comic series where they want it to be this end all be all. And sometimes it could just be a good movie or a good TV show. W.H. mentioned Loki. Loki season two is when I looked at it for MCU later, it wasn't something like when I'm reviewing stuff for the torch or I'm here talking about wrestling where I have X number of hours in a day with a family, as you guys are aware, and there's only so much you can do. I loved watching season two of Loki because it was good television period. And it just happened to be a Marvel property. And if they make more of that stuff, I think they'll get people in, but it has to be less shotgun and more focused But it's hard to be that focused as you bring in diverse actors, as you bring in new directors and new styles. And also as you deal with a media landscape that really wants you to kind of fail so they can point to that as this is why we need more movies like X when X isn't supported as well when it goes out. Like, look at last thing, I promise. Willy Wonka came out, made $30 million. They're talking about a property that we've seen five to seven times, just like anything else in comic books. And it's like, you made $38 million this weekend? Good job, guys. You tried. <laughs> the Marvels comes out, and it's like, this is the fate of the entire Marvel universe, and its failure is an onus upon us all. What? What is that? As well, WH, just before we, we wrap up, 
do you see DC getting a shot in the arm with this deal with Netflix to put some of their titles onto that platform? Because we're starting to see the strategy now that even for these other streamers that you piggyback off Netflix that has the largest reach and it's almost this belief that you like look at the phenomenon with suits just getting onto Netflix. Do you see DC getting any kind of like bump as a result of this? Do you see this as a good move for DC? I think anything that it widens their exposure is a good move for them. But ultimately, it comes down to how good is the content that they're going to send to Netflix. And I have little to no faith that they're they're going to do that because regardless of like, you know, like, you know, Nate's boy, uh, you know, what, what's his fucking name again? Jermaine. Jermaine, like, thinks like James Gunn is not the savior for the DC movie universe. It's not. It's 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 com- he's he's going to run into the same problem that everyone else did, which is Warner Brothers Discovery. They can't make up their minds about what they want to do with some of these characters. They can't make a cohesive universe. The thing is, like, Marvel decided at some point, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. is is on ABC. We're not putting it on ABC more. It doesn't exist anymore. It's not part of the MCU. Some of it is part of the MCU, but they, they can pick and choose. They don't know what the fuck they want to do with Batman alone. You know what I mean? They've got the fucking Robert Pattinson movie. They they've got the fucking Ben Affleck version and whatever the fuck James Gunn wants to do with this character, they got to d- deal with that. And then they're gonna have like three, four, five different characters, versions of this character that no one can decide which one do I invest my time into because that's the thing is like people don't have endless amounts of time anymore because there's so many options out there. Forget forget just Marvel and DC. You've got all this stuff on Prime. All stuff on Netflix, on Disney Plus. You got Star Wars. People are invested in. I, 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 I have so many interests, and like these are things that are in my wheelhouse. But I don't watch everything. I'm not. I'm not making the time to watch DC stuff unless someone tells me. Oh my God, it's so good. For example, Peacemaker. But that's not. I don't think that's going to happen with DC because they can't decide where they want to put their characters, especially their big ones: Superman, Batman. And, and poss- possibly Wonder Woman, but I feel like Warner Bros. Discovery is a bunch of misogynists, so they don't really care about Wonder Woman anyways. But the, if you want to just look at Batman and Superman, they don't know what they want to do with these characters. They don't know, where do we put them in movies? Do we want to put them on TV? Do we want to get rid of all the spinoff shows that we, we build around these characters, like Gotham and, and fu- fucking Smallville and all this other stuff? Whatever new versions of that is going to come out, right? They, they don't know, and that's the thing. They don't have a Kevin Feige. They don't have someone at the top level executive level saying, listen, this is what we got to do. Don't do anything else. And it bleeds over into their comic book division. And and like the comics, I think are a mess. They're, they're, they're like collected edition division is complete shit compared to Marvel. Like I'm still like, why haven't they collected this? Why haven't they collected this? This movie came out. Okay. They're going to relaunch this and that, but you, you, you miss the boat on this and this. Uh, it, anyways, it, it's just a mess. It's because of the parent company. Disney at least knows what they want overall. And, and John, like when, when it comes out, I think you should just start watching Daredevil because I have very oh, high hopes. I, I, I love Daredevil. I will jump in to Dare, whatever the hell they're doing with it. They shot like what half the season and just start from scratch. I'll wait. Get it right, okay? Rather That's than right. rush it out. So I, I Daredevil, I will watch. I will make a concerted effort because I love the first two seasons uh, of of that series. So. You will never mistake this man for the head of PR with uh, Warner Brothers Discovery, but he is the host of Post Pro Res, The Long and Winding Royal Road, and MCU Later, WH Park. And uh, you can catch him with Rich Fan. I may not be watching all of these, but I love listening to you guys uh, chat about all this uh, because you're a a tremendous uh, duo. Lucky to have you on the Post Wrestling Cafe. And I want to wish all of you a uh, happy holidays. And I look forward to hanging out with you, Rich, in Philadelphia. And uh, WH will be be getting breakfast at some point in the near future. Oh, yeah. By the way, Rich, is there a Waffle House in between Pittsburgh and Philadelphia that we can stop off at? Unfortunately, Waffle House is more Midwest and South, so there oh, are not. Denied. Again. Overrated. Overrated. <laughs> Listen, like I told Karen Peterson, if fucking Sami Zayn and Jey Uso are, are going to endorse that shit, then I'm down for it. <laughs> Since Happy one. holidays from WH Park. Rich fan and WH Park stopping by. WH Park, I think the the most uh, the most enigmatic figure here at Post Wrestling. Somebody that I think is um, 
he he's the touchstone of of the site. I think everybody, you know it's a party when WH is here. You know, it's just not complete unless you have WH Park here. The man behind the long and winding Royal Road, co-host of Post Pro Res with Karen Peterson, and MCU later with Rich Fan and the occasional waiting drop in. So, um, I guess I can reveal this now, but like WH asked me to do the long and winding Royal Road, and I was like, hell. No, <laughs> Whoa. no, maybe it's just because, like, I mean, I'm actually in charge of like put you know uh, uh, uploading the shows every month, and they're great. So I just understand the standard of like knowledge and analysis that I think is required for that show, and I'm like, I'm not touching that. I have nothing to add to this conversation. Like, I know the wrestlers, I've seen the matches maybe like decades ago, but like, I don't know the history like like a lot of their guests do. So it's like the the one podcast that I'm like, I don't want to do this. I like, I just, I, I have nothing to contribute. Then he sent me a message this week. He said, "So I seriously want you to be a part of the Long and Winding Road Road in January." And and when WH, the person who usually is just like you know, he doesn't beg for anything. Okay doesn't doesn't ask even nicely okay he demands and you listen he firmly firmly states we are doing this it's when not if right so when he asks as nicely as he does well i guess i have to reconsider so maybe you might hear me on a january edition of the long wind, winding Royal road coming up well i am already excited i think way you will contribute a ton to that show and you are more of the standard to meet the requirements of the long and winding royal road so um also great to hear from a rich fan um Someone I'm I'm a huge fan of, and not trying to make a pun there, but um, yeah, someone that uh, we will get to see WrestleMania weekend, which is shaping mm-hmm. up to be quite the congregation of people in and around the site. It seems like Philadelphia seems like a uh, quite the the meeting point for a lot of people. Like a, a, not uh, not the place you think of as like a central base to travel to, but it seems like it's going to be plenty of people coming in that weekend. I've always wanted to, to visit the city. Never really had like an excuse to go. So I, I think this is perfect. I think we should all race up the Rocky steps. That's where we should all meet everybody. I think that's going to be the most stereotypical thing you can do. Like that seems yeah, like I the know. Niagara Falls of Philadelphia. Oh yeah, it is. You have to do it though. Okay. Well, we're going to fly now to the door to answer <laughs> and see who is joining the post wrestling Christmas party. What's going on, brothers and sisters? Happy holidays, of course. It is the NWA podcast, the Nubian Wrestling Advocates back in your ears, not for a long time, but for a good time here this holiday season. I am the Godfather, Nate Milton, once again, joined as always by my brothers, by by my friends, by, by my fellow advocates. Of course, we got the Reverend Dr. Good Brother Chris Ely from L.A. What's good, Chris? I just chilling, left my Santa cap in the uh, living room, so we're gonna have to go out. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna you gonna have to fix that, remedy that, brother. And then, of course, you know what? What would Christmas be, Chris? What would the holiday season be without seeing the joy in a young person's eyes? And that's why we got this man on, on with us, uh, the youngest in charge, our good nephew, the hardest working man in the game right now, Andrew Thompson. Was good, nephew. What's going on, fellas? Pleasure to be here as always. Pleasure to be here. Yes, so we are here for our, uh, you know, year in thoughts, kind of, sort of, but but we we we're not just gonna stay stuck in twenty twenty three. We're gonna look forward to twenty twenty four. But but we got a bit of a surprise for the people out there, nephew. It's kind of like um, you know, those commercials you watching late at night when somebody trying to sell you a bunch of pots and pans, or maybe mm-hmm. they're trying to sell you some kitchen utilities, Chris. Yeah, four easy payments. Of four money. easy payments, and at the end of the commercial, <laughs> at the end of the commercial, they're like, "But wait, there's more." Yeah. So not only are you getting me, Chris and Andrew, but wait, there's more. Making mm-hmm. his first appearance ever on a post wrestling Christmas spectacular, y'all give it up for for the brother that is on day nine, hour twenty three and a half of his ten day contract. He didn't forget his Santa hat. Y'all give it up. For the rookie, ten day Ray Williams, aka Sugar Ray, Raymondo Williams. Hey, hey, what's going on? It's a pleasure, honor to be here. I can cross this off the bucket list now. I'm I'm going to be one of the many faces on a uh, <laughs> on that beautiful screen, on that beautiful title screen. So, yes, I don't know who all John and Way have uh, 
invited to the party this year. Hopefully not Terry Balea. Uh, but <laughs> just just seeing all those faces and seeing Ray in with those faces. That's that's gonna be that's gonna be a, a highlight of my holiday season. But speaking hey, of highlights hey, of the holiday, Ray, Ray, yeah, Ray, Ray, Ray got the longest ten day contract in history. I'm, 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 I'm just waiting for you to tell him he in the three sixty deal. And he he got, don't know it yet. Ray got like the Shohei Otani ten day contract. Like it's <laughs> Like, like we we'll give you like twenty dollars right now, Ray. But then for like mm-hmm. the next thirty years, <laughs> yeah. we're gonna give you a hundred dollars a year, right? Remember when uh, uh, Merrill's place where Heather Locklear was like a special guest star oh on every episode? <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Yo, yeah, she was like a special guest star the whole first season. Yeah. yeah. Uh, shout out to Melrose Place. Uh, shout out. But you know, we 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 might have fond memories of of shows like Melrose Place or Nine Hundred Two One Zero or The Heights. Who remembers The Heights? Uh, oh yeah, I remember how to talk to an angel. We're not yeah, we're not here to talk to angels, Chris. Uh, except for maybe the angels that we have heard on high, uh, because we want to talk real quick off top about some of our favorite holiday memories or traditions, or maybe a, a favorite gift that we received that we've given over the years. Uh, so let's start with the uh, with the guest of honor. Uh, I have a lock there in, in this building. Ray, uh, what, what's a Christmas memory, man, whether whether it's like a recent memory or from when you was a kid, that, that always stays with you? Well, uh, I'm a big gamer, and so mm. I, I grew up gaming, and I used to always go over to my cousin's house, and I used to always want a Sega Genesis. And they okay. used to okay. always have a Sega Genesis. And I would think every Christmas, I'm getting a Sega Genesis, but really it's like uniform clothes. I'm like, how? what kind of gift is this? But then I believe it might have been, I was eight or nine that we got the NES. We got the Nintendo Entertainment System. And it had the pack-in with Super Mario Brothers 3. And that's like the greatest, that's like, in my eyes, that's my favorite video game of all time. And Mm -hmm. It is due in part because just spending time. I had a back then. I had a, a brother who's like a year younger than me, and we used to just play that thing like day in, day out. Like mm-hmm. go to sleep with that thing on, with, with with the TV screen still showing. So that's one of my favorite Christmas memories. Yeah, man. Yeah. See, I was on the opposite end of the spectrum, Ray. Like I was a Genesis cat, and all my mm. friends at Nintendo and at first I felt like you know the outcast nephew but then it was like I realized I wasn't you know the outcast I was special because everybody knows <laughs> Gen- Genesis does what, what Nintendo, Nintendo don't, don't. don't. Yeah, <laughs> that's all I'm trying to say shout out to Evander Holyfield's real deal boxing which I wore <laughs> out on the yeah. Genesis I beat, I beat Holyfield so bad Chris like when I started the game he was a champ I played that game so much like he had like a record of thirty and two or something like that when the game start. By the end yeah. of the game, he was like thirty four and twenty eight because I whooped up on Holyfield so bad. <laughs> like who keeps sanctioning these fights? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> nephew, any any great Christmas memories with the fam or any gifts in particular that you received over the years that uh, always stick with you? I, I say just over the last like the my my adult life. Like I'm just thinking about. Most of just being around the fam, honestly, mm. like that—that's kind of like one of the things I enjoy most, and like seeing my younger cousins and stuff. Like they get the gifts, and now I'm the one helping get right. the gifts and stuff. Like I, I think that's more so just mm. the, the fun part, man. It just, I, I just like kicking it with my peoples in general, so that's always a good time. But like just to just to keep it like wrestling themed, I remember when I—I I think I was like eight or nine. I, I remember my mother had got me the um the the John Cena spinner chain. <laughs> with, 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 with the with the CD from his new album, the Go. Oh wow! I, mm-hmm. I, I, I still got that CD. Uh, I, I think it's somewhere. Like I got this little um, thing where I keep like a bunch of like old like DVDs and old games and stuff like that. And I got that John Cena DVD sitting over there, man. And uh, it's always fun. I, I don't know what happened to that chain though. I don't know what happened to the spinner chain, but the, and I, I used to be walking around the house doing the little thing all the time and all that so yeah, yeah I, I, that's a that's a fun christmas memory right there yeah, so, the so little, little young andrew when he was growing up watching jorge blanco's planet 51 was also <laughs> a, also a member of the chain gang <laughs> <laughs> uh low-key chris that john cena cd wouldn't have bad it was, that was all right with the trademark yeah it was cool yeah yeah bumpy knuckles and them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh chris since this uh 
you know, uh, I know you didn't, you didn't been many places around this great land of ours, Tennessee, mm -hmm. New York, California, yep. the, the DMV. So I know you got a lot of memories, Christmas time with the fam and the friends and everything. Uh, what's a memory that always sticks with you, brother? For me, it's just always every year, just get like if it was like anytime I got like a video game system, like a Nintendo mm -hmm. or Sega Genesis or something like that, that was always like a big, big deal. And then just playing that, opening it up on Christmas Eve and then just playing it all night. until you know, mm -hmm. uh, that was cool. And then, you know, this year I'm staying in L.A., which is I, the first time I've done this in a long time you know usually i'm down south but because i got a lot of stuff i got to do next year um i gotta sacrifice this time um and my grandmother's 91 and she's like i ain't going nowhere so just come <laughs> next year so uh i'm taking her i'm taking her word for it but yeah yeah just you know like chilling with the fam and all that cool cool yeah for me real quick um my memory is, I mean, to Andrew's point, these days, you know, as, as I grow older, it's more about time with the family, particularly these last three years, man, where time has been so valuable, you know, given uh -huh. the pandemic and everything. And so the time we do have with our loved ones, we got to take advantage of it. But I remember when we moved to Japan and I was like feeling some type of way about moving to Japan because uh, I just finished my freshman year of college. And so, you know, I'm thinking of all these. I was on the baseball team at college, Andrew. I hadn't met this girl at college. And then it felt like all that was kind of ripped away when my peoples moved to Japan and Pops was like, yeah, you coming with us. And so I think they they realized they like how, you know, I was feeling some type of way. And they're like, you know what? We get this man a PlayStation. I bet you he's going to be a little bit more happy around the house. <laughs> so they got me the PlayStation, right? Uh, man, they love, love, love mom and pops, man. They, they, they the best. But uh, they got me the PlayStation. They had, they got me two games though. Well, number one, they got me one game because the other game was like a demo game that came with the system. Oh, yeah. It had like yeah, five yeah. games on it, but you could only play like five minutes of them games. Yeah, I hate those uh, demo games. And then uh, <laughs> the the, uh, the game they got me was uh, like the Madden, whatever the Madden was that year. Uh, and so yeah, I was playing that, and I was just sitting there playing my little five minutes of Tekken or whatever was on the demo disc and then play Madden and then go back to playing five minutes of Altered Beast and then go play Madden. Uh, uh, but, but yeah, it, it was cool, man. So like uh, whatever your memories are, you know, of the, of the holidays. And I know this time of year can also be kind of a sad time for a lot of folks, but you know, those memories we got to cherish and we got to keep them in their hearts um, real quick though. Cause you know, we, we ain't going to be here for a long time. Just a good time, fellas. I think this time of year is also a time to kind of reform, reform and reframe things in your life, like stuff that is negative or has negative connotations. We can take ownership of that, Andrew, and make it a positive. And for the last couple of years, there's been a negative phrase, at least to me, in the world of wrestling that, that feels like a cop out when people talk about these storylines or whatever. Uh, we all know it, fellas. Can we say it on the count of three? One, two, three. Let, let it, it play, play out. out. <laughs> so, so, so I'm sick and tired of hearing let it play out in a negative sense. So I want to take this time to use let it play out in a positive way. So the four of us are going to give our let it play out moments for 2024. And these are things we are excited to see. To see. These are things that we want to see next year, whether it's an in storyline, whether it's a business thing. Uh, so we will start in reverse order. Well, I guess technically I'm still going last, but it's modified reverse order. Uh, Chris, what is your let it play out for 2024? What's something that you actually do want to see play out next year? In wrestling, I definitely want to see what's going to happen with Swerve. I'm interested mm. in with that. Cautiously optimistic, and I'm willing to be patient with that. Um, that's pretty much it. Uh, everything else, I'm kind of wait and see that's my okay. you know I, I, i'm we'll see you know shout out to swerve the the new mayor of duval county out there dancing with the jaguars and whatnot <laughs> you got love for that brother our future champion i'm calling it right now putting it out there in the universe andrew what is your let it play out moment for next year uh I, I, I'm, I'm gonna say my let it play out moment is for, for this for this podcast i think we're gonna have I'm gonna say I'm gonna say three guests on the podcast next year, wrestlers mm -hmm. with personalities, and I'm gonna say mm -hmm. one of those is gonna be the big boom 
I don't, I don't know whoever whoever this individual might be, but I think that's going to be a I think that's going to be a thing that we will see next year for the okay. NWA podcast. Okay. I let it play out. I like that. I like so Andrew, you heard it here first. Next year, Glenn Gilberti on the UBA wrestling. Yeah. <laughs> Even that up yeah, to the now. Uh, but yeah, I, I definitely, I definitely feel you on that with nephew. Uh, Ray, what is your let it play out moment for next year, brother? Well, besides holding out for our Braxton Witherspoon and the Smart Marks reunion, mm. um, I think my let it play out moment is going to be, and these two young ladies are kind of tied to one another, but. Hey, let it play out. Athena is going to be on the main roster coming up soon in AEW. And let it play out. Willow Nightingale win, will win a championship Ooh. next year. It may be the TNT title or the TVS title, I should say. It may be the ROH TV title. You never know. But I believe she is going to be a champion on the North American side. And stateside coming up, so let let okay. it play out with those two young ladies. Okay, I like that. I like that. Shout out to them two good sisters. Uh, my let it play out, fellas. I got two of them. Uh, number one is obvious in terms of an in storyline thing. Uh, I want to see Devonte finish this story mm. in Philadelphia. Please, please, Cody, finish this damn story, man. I, I ain't got another year. <laughs> I can't. I can't keep doing this, Cody. Uh, so, yeah. so uh, Devonte beats Roman in Philly. Finally finishing the story. That that is my let it play out in terms of an in storyline thing. My kind of real world like my business thing is I'm interested to see what happens with all these TV deals and mm. it's changing TV landscape, particularly when you yeah. talk about AEW and Tony Khan and, and, and Ring of Honor to Ray's point. Like where do the pieces kind of line up in terms of this sport that we love, this business that we love, being able to be flexible and move into this new era of TV. Uh, you know, post Hollywood strike where everything is up for grabs now. You know, I'm watching. I'm pulling back the curtain right now because I'm on vacation this week, y'all. I got my tropical smoothie. Andrew saw it earlier. I also got Pluto TV on in the background, and Wow is playing on Pluto TV. Like right. low key, Wow might be like one of the best TV products right now because it's just the hour. Andrew hmm. is playing in his little suit, and AJ Lee will. Uh, on the Pluto episodes, AJ's there, but she ain't there no more. But but it's just they just telling you three stories. It's a opening opening match story, a middle match story, and a main event story. And you ain't got to go into all this other stuff, Chris. They tell you three yeah. stories for three matches, and David McClain wearing his little suit with the bow tie, looking like a, a white uh, Nation of Islam member. It's, <laughs> it's a beautiful thing, man. So I uh, hope Wow has continued success in mm. in twenty four. Shout out to the good sister Jeannie Bus out here. Got wild and an NC mm-hmm. tournament championship. Genie Bus is living right now, Chris. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I do. I don't like the way that it's the the, the in season championship looks next to the sixteen banners we got. They got to find another quarter for it. But I mean, it's, I'm it's, here it's, for it. More like if you win three or four of them, then it'll start looking okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But you still got to put it to <laughs> to the side. The side yeah. it doesn't belong next to the sixteen. No, mm-hmm. it does not belong next to those 16 main championships. Uh, but you know what? I feel like this man, Ray Williams, proved that he belongs on the post-wrestling Christmas show this year. We just snuck him in through the side window like that cat at the end of the Flintstones that sneak in through the window after Ray came out. <laughs> we done brought Ray in the building. We hope everybody enjoyed our conversation. Chris, Andrew, anything you want to say before we get out of here? Uh, the only thing I want to say is just um, I'm hoping 2023 was a very tough year for me health wise. So I'm hoping mm-hmm. yeah. uh, 2024 it gets back to where it needs to be. Um, take care of your health, y'all. That's more important than anything ever. Talk and that's, it go, that goes for wrestlers, too. That's the, yeah. Real talk, Chris. That's, 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 that's truth right there. Ray, <laughs> anything you want to say before we get out of here? Hard for me to follow that. Just. Happy holidays. Take care of yourselves and just uh, be safe. And we hope to see you all on the other side in 2024. Absolutely. Everybody have a safe and happy holiday season. Merry Christmas. Happy Kwanzaa. Happy Chinooka. Uh, Festivus for the rest of us. All of that, man. Y'all be safe. Y'all be good. Shout out to John and Way and the rest of the Post family. We love y'all. And Lord willing, we will be back to talk to y'all again in 2024.
the NWA podcast themselves, Nate Milton, Chris Ely, and Andrew Thompson uh, filing in that wonderful message. Mm-hmm. Felt um, oddly brief for a, a, an addition or at least an interaction with the NWA podcast. I think we're about three and a half hours short there. They um, That was what they call the warm-up. Um, their most recent show, which I, I am a faithful listener of, Nate Milton says the words, well, that brings an end to the show. One more segment to go. Did I look down? There was an hour and 24 minutes left on the show when Nate started to wrap up and uh, and they were making their um, going through their their cookout invites. I mean, it's just yeah, they, we li- we listen to every second of it. You know, it's like I mean, if they're willing to talk, then we're willing to listen. So they're just yeah. um, they're a great show. I, I have enjoyed the uh, the recent additions with uh, Chinieri joining them. Uh, Ray getting that full time contract, I think, under the table. I don't think the 10 days is any longer in effect. Um, it's it's just great. Um, mm-hmm. Nate is a phenomenal host. I just think he is so such such a talent. Chris has great, great analysis. And Andrew just uh your newsman that also allows Andrew to uh, to get his uh, thoughts and opinions out there as well. It's just a great mix uh, that we're lucky to have each month here on the site. Do you think 2024 might see the return of TN8? That's a great question. January 13th, we will see if, if Nate um, samples the new TNA. Will it be a 6 out of 10 or above? Um, mm. We will find out. I, I think... Uh, to be quite fair, I, th- I think the Impact Wrestling era did a number on TN8. I think he was really driven. Um, driven Somehow away. he went from that to WCW in 2000. Well, you know what? Y- you go th- you go backwards before you can go forwards. Mm, gotcha. And he's always forward. <laughs> Killing. Dude, I'm on fire today. Can yeah. you? Can I? Can you, I think it's the really... eggnog and uh, the Aberlauer. It's it's this it's this milk coke and rum concoction it's that you everything. handed me during the break. Yeah. So let's keep on going. Reef- the uh, the uh, the fire marshal is uh, going to be shutting us down soon. I think we're we're hitting the uh, the max capacity here, but we we have room for a couple more. The post Christmas show continues, and joining us now, he is Brandon Thurston of WrestleNomics Trade Publication. WrestleNomics, who is here with us after a uh, a tremendous year of shows from the WrestleNomics brand, which included a brand extension and the uh, the brand unity of post wrestling and WrestleNomics continuing with our own standalone show that will be co terminus with uh, future shows with Pollock and Thurston every Wednesday. On the site. Hello, Brandon, and Merry Christmas. Hello. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Yes, the uh, the incentive and the and the orders are to create more content, uh, make it go longer, so we can better monetize uh, the 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 flywheel here for for WrestleNomics and and any cooperation we can have with our, our partners at Post Wrestling is is very much appreciated. How, can you guys was... branch branch into a stand up uh, comedy act um, for twenty twenty four? I would say it's, some would say that WrestleNomics Radio is is a comedy podcast. I would say that certainly. Right. Well, how would you assess the WrestleNomics flywheel? If if you always seem to enjoy when WWE puts out their their like annual uh, report and who is going to be put on the cover. If WrestleNomics was going to put out, which you probably will, the business of 2023, who's on the yes. cover this year to summarize the year? One specific figure in the industry. It's a good question. Maybe I don't know. Um, Ari Emanuel, maybe for putting together the TKO deal and. You know, Vince is Vince is a fixture. He made his way back. Um, I was just thinking, I was wondering what you guys are going to ask me about. And I remember, I think we were sp- speaking a year ago, right? And talking about how Vince was, Vince is gone for good, apparently. Little did we know. <laughs> Little did we know what Vince McMahon's Christmas uh, exchanges with the board of directors was going to be over that ho- that tumultuous holiday period that included. Um, I wasn't asking to come back. I was no. informing you to get who's ever out of my parking spot gone by the end of tomorrow. And I was working on a tirelessly on a on an audio documentary about the the fall of Vince McMahon. As if it was all done, it was all all done in the pro wrestling industry. And then, like days later, he came back. I mean, he did give you the uh, at least some leeway. It's it, he waited until the first week of January, so yes. you at least did get such an audio documentary out there. But I guess this is 
a year that, if for nothing else, will be remembered as the year that this is now a WWE that is not under the control of Vince McMahon or the McMahon family. And while that seems like a pretty sizable story, it it does almost feel as though we had this this cushion period of what is life in WWE like without Vince McMahon? And we got to see that in 2022. And something that you had stated for a long time was this belief that, man, Vince McMahon, it's just will people have faith in WWE without Vince McMahon? It turned out to be that much more so that this was someone that you could certainly argue, at least on the creative front, was inhibiting growth. And the transition was a rather seamless one in 2022. And he came back with the protection of, hey, I'm coming back. But it's only to sell this company. Yeah, and and, and we have reports uh, as of a few months ago, at least from what Sports Illustrated saying that Arya Manuel has separated his duties, so he is not at least deeply involved in creative at this moment. That's what's been reported. You can your mileage may vary on on how much you believe that, but there does seem to be a distinct difference. I do wonder if there's not a pressure from Paul Levesque, who's leading creative now, to not you know, not get uh, angry calls or angry texts from Vince based on things that he sees, sees on television. Uh, so there may be there's some pressure to keep some of his habits and values alive to some extent. Um, and according to Paul Avecca at, at the uh, in Detroit, I think when I asked him how how involved is is Vince in the creative, I think he said you know he's always a phone call away and he's got he's got so much experience and he put put him over strong. Um, but yeah, it's a distinct difference, and the fans have reacted favorably to this we're we're ending the year with uh raw ratings starting to, to flatten out but um for the whole year i think they're you know ron smack are going to be up strongly i don't have the numbers in front of me and, and attendance is doing really well also as you know it seems like people like WWE again does it surprise you brandon that um at this point at least it seems like vince is is not back um in control or at least complete control of creator well, he's not the boss anymore. It's not really not up to him. He's he's got about well, he sold, sold some shares. I think he's down to like eleven or twelve percent of of the stock. Um, as as soon as he made the deal to merge UFC and NW into, into TKO, he he relinquished all of his control. So, as of the merger, I it's not I guess not that surprising. It's 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 a really curious thing to you know to imagine what, what the real thoughts are of, of Ari Emanuel. I can't imagine Ari and Nick, uh, you know, who are smart people don't recognize the difference in creative and, and aren't listening to people who understand that even more deeply. I can't imagine that's over their heads. And I think everybody in that company recognizes that creative has improved. And that's the big reason why fan interest is up. So, does Ari really, as he's sitting here in this image that you have here, where he's, you know, where contrast. he's saying, oh, this, this particular set of images on their two faces. I mean, yeah. From the CNBC interview for people who are right. Yeah, right. Saying, when the where he's saying, oh my God, yes, we had to keep Vince. It's, you know, Ari insisted. And and we have details in filings to, to that effect of that. The WWE shareholders got a larger portion of this merger than they would have otherwise, apparently, because Ari insisted that as part of this deal, no, no, Vince, you can't go away. You have to stay back, whether you want to believe that or not. I, I don't know. Um, but that's that's what they said. But I, th- I would think that Ari ha- has to understand that Vince, that, that creative is better without Vince involved. And that's why, reportedly, he's he said, no, you go work on the TV deal and let you know the creative be led by Paula Beck. So as you go into this year and we go with the assumption that Ari Emanuel wants Vince McMahon inside of TKO as opposed to outside of it, what do you see as the value, the best course of action for a Vince McMahon in this present day company? Like where where do you channel his efforts or is it simply that this is you put him in a role and he is kind of, you know, at arm's length from some of the day to day business? I don't know if I really understand what Vince contributes outside of creative he may he may have a lot of relationships i can't imagine he doesn't have a lot of relationships with a lot of their business partners that are valuable um given he's the Saudi deal for, for ufc was already <laughs> there you go he's already we've already had big synergy when it comes to ufc making what was it a 20 25 million dollar deal for one 20 UFC million fight night. for the fight um, night, yes so there there you go and, and he went over there with the undertaker uh, a few months ago um so there's maybe there's things like that um 
I, I think WWE was fine and would be fine probably without him, given they have Nick Khan to make TV deals. And even more than that, they have Ari Emanuel and Mark Shapiro would help them make TV deals now and make other business partnerships. Um, but I, I just feel a little bit uninformed about what really his, his value is in terms of outside of what he contributes to creative, which I think is a negative, obviously. But, um, you know, I, I think he's made some good decisions, though, over the years in, in terms of on a, on a wide scale, you can point to the brand split SmackDown 2016. SmackDown's now a much more valuable property because of it. Um, you can point to licensing the network, taking it away from direct to consumer. I mean, those were his decisions and those those were beneficial to the company. Nick Khan hiring. I mean, that was sure, ultimately yeah. a, a Vince call. I mean, it was maybe not the uh, the smoothest transition from uh, one set of presidents to the next, but it was overall like a great hire on on his behalf. And I think it, it remains to be seen. I think in 2024, we'll certainly get probably as clear a sense of what synergies we see when WrestleMania is staged one week before UFC 300. So you're going to have the company's biggest events of the year on back-to-back -back weekends. That would seem to be the real, um, the, essentially putting out like where where is the value here of kind of merging these fan bases, piggybacking off of one another uh, to hype up these back-to-back -back weekends for the companies. And, and you've been watching UFC. I have not. Has UFC promoted, like, have they have they ran, you know, ads for upcoming WWE events on UFC shows? There, there's nothing that stands out to me. There's been a little bit of that on WWE programming, right? It's been a little bit of promotion of, of UFC. Ads. They have aired, uh, like, it, like the... I know that they've run some UFC ads like the in, in like the lower uh, screen that they have had a, a, a handful of. But I wouldn't say it's, it's hardly been overwhelming. Like if you're a WWE fan, it's not like you've been in. It's been intrusive advertising of UFC or vice versa. Like they have, if anything, it's been a lot lighter than I have expected since this closed in September. Mm -hmm. I should I should mention since I do have the tables up now. Raw is looking like it's gonna be down two percent on the year uh in total viewership. It's gonna be up thirteen percent in the demo, and SmackDown is up six mm -hmm. percent total and what sixteen percent in the demo. So better in the demo than the total viewership. I'm curious, maybe just for your own, you know, WrestleNomics uh you know a, a, accounts and, and everything, what what have been the topics of biggest engagement for WrestleNomics specifically this year? I guess the, the, the quarter hours of, are of great interest. Um, hopefully I'll be able to continue to report them. I mean, the collision, anytime a show debuts, you know, when, when Rampage debuted a couple of years ago, that was huge. When Collision debuted, that was a big deal. And people having, you know, you know, post-traumatic, post-WCW traumatic uh, stress about whether or not AEW is going to fail and go out of business or something like that and, and to see where Collision is going to end up. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of the, the ratings improvements, I think, with, with WWE have increased interest in, in WWE ratings. Um, the, um, oh God, the all-in um, current style count. Yeah. As, as, as Tony talked this about. Too. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't know when people are going to listen. They're going to listen to this on New Year's Eve or something. But as Tony talked about in the last uh, press conference, uh, the turnstile style count that he has never heard of uh, mentioned before. Um, but yeah, that was a big deal that we got um, a count of the people who used their tickets, whose tickets were counted as scanned uh, at Wembley Stadium for all in 2023, 72,265. Um, a difference from the, the number they announced as tickets sold 81,035. So a, a totally normal and actually above average redemption rate, according to Tony. I'll let him have to say. So if we look currently of WWE and AEW television, linear hours per week, we have, I believe, 12 hours with Raw, NXT, SmackDown, Dynamite, Collision, Rampage. One year from now, with the deals going into 2025 and beyond, do you expect that many or less, more or less, linear hours of, of television of those of those 12? If they're not all on traditional TV, then one, I don't think, I think W will still all be on traditional TV. I think, I guess, Prime Video is the most likely one that would go to, go to streaming for for Raw, but I don't think that's going to happen. I think that's less likely. Um, I could see one of the AEW shows going mm -hmm. away from WBD and going on to streaming. I guess or even going on to Max. Um, so I guess there's there's a pretty good chance that it would be less, not a lot less though. And you're still going to be it's still going to be like in the wrestling community conversation because I think it would still be airing live or 
I guess Rampage does not air live, but still be, you know, have a regular time slot. I just don't see it being less <laughs> ever. Well, I I'm basically asking, more, like, more, I'm more, seeing, more. like, what what you could see moving to streaming. And I think Rampage would be a prime candidate. Um, you know, may, maybe more of a left field pick, but that third hour of Raw, depending on who is interested in it and does uh, an outlet feel that a third hour, you send them to a streaming platform, for, for instance. Um, mm -hmm. I think that we can all look like we know the fates of SmackDown and NXT. I think we all expect that Dynamite will, will land on its feet. And uh, and collisions up in the air. I guess you you look at that. I would say overall they have gotten off to I would say like a fine start. Like this is not you know setting the cable world on fire, but I would hardly call this uh, a failure at the same point either. Like it's it's a clear number two show in a company that produces three shows. It's it's solidly between Rampage and and Dynamite. I think in terms of interest and depending on what's competing with it on Saturday night, that it is ahead of Rampage in terms of viewership. You mentioned briefly maybe um, Tony Khan's latest press conference. I would say this year, um, the wrestling audience perhaps has been a lot more focused or at least conscious of um, maybe Tony Khan's, mm, uh, I don't know, PR presence, um, especially at these press conferences and his uh, avoidance of, of, of certain questioning. Um, how aware do you think Tony is of, of this itself? And do you think there's any incentive for him to change? That's a good question. And I think that's a question you should be asked. <laughs> um, um, I don't know. Why are you guys putting him under attack? <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it, and, and to that point, I like, it's kind of true. It's true that the people are, are constantly, I think there is like a real wrestling media dynamic in that. Like if you, if you post something that is like doom and gloom about what's happening with that company, you're going to get more engagement than you would if you, you know, more dispassionately reported what's going on. Um, like, I think one of our more, in, you know, more watched podcasts of the year for WrestleMonics Radio was when um, we talked about how popularity was going down for AW, which it was, and it did, and it did throughout the year. Um, but when we were, like, definitive about that, and it was, you know, it, it led to all this intrigue. And I heard so somebody say, you know, ab about, a, you know, wrestling, a wrestling news site that, the kind of ad revenue that you can generate from WB news might be pretty good. Uh, you can't generate as much ad revenue off of AEW news unless it's, it's negative news. So, you know, I haven't experienced, I've experienced a little bit of that. It was, you know, some, some microcosms of that. So I, I kind of believe that. And that sort of reinforces this, this cycle of people going after AEW. Um, that being said, the way to handle that is, is not to, you know, throw a pity party or to, you know, to paint yourself and, and envision yourself at least publicly as a victim, you know, uh, billionaires are victimized enough in this country. Uh, so, you know, you have to be somebody who, who doesn't complain and, and just sort of looks past it and doesn't quote tweet, uh, Glenn Gilberti the next day. Uh, is he aware of that? I don't think he's, he's not aware enough of it to, to change too much. Although I did think his, his performance on the press conference at, at, after final battle was, was a, a more professional Tony than usual, a more, a more CEO like Tony than usual. Well, Brandon, we want to uh, thank you, not just for a, a great year of shows, but uh, many to come. Uh, Brandon and I are going to be off this coming Wednesday, but we return the season premiere of Pollock and Thurston on Wednesday, January the 3rd. So uh, we, we look forward to that. Uh, have a great holiday season. And uh, thank you so much for joining us on the, uh, on the post Christmas show. Thanks guys. It's just great to be a part of uh, of post wrestling. Thanks. Brandon Thurston of WrestleNomics and the rookie show of the year, Pollock and Thurston in 2023, joining us on the Christmas show. It's our only new show this year, I think. Oh, well, no, that's not true. We have Collision Course. Technically, it is a rookie show, but you two are, are far from rookies. You know, really, I would say leaders of the industry in, in your own way. So um, I, I certainly a destination listen for, I think, all of our listeners this year yeah i i honestly I, i've had a ton of fun doing this this show with uh brandon every week we always uh I, i've i've told you like I've, I've wanted to find a show that can be the place that we put an interview i really am not a fan of just doing an interview cold and then throwing it up um i like to have it like a theme around it we can discuss the interview and brandon and i are very very similar i think in a lot mm -hmm. of our um 
thoughts and uh, ideas of how we want to cover different subjects. And um, it's probably outside of you, the person I, I probably in, in in the most communication with of the uh, the post wrestling world. I think we should, I mean, um, maybe make more trips down to Buffalo, I feel. Like, we're actually not that far away, yet. Um, it's, I, I honestly it's consider, weird. I knew he wanted to see the Iron Claw, and I was like, he could, if if he wanted to come up, we could have, like, taken him to the screening a few weeks ago. It's like, it's not mm-hmm. crazy, but it, it is maybe a little, uh, to, you know, you do have to come into another country and such. You but yeah, we're, we're, like, very country. close. We're, like, we're 90 minutes away. Maybe meet halfway, you know, in uh, uh, St. Catharines or something. We'll go to the the St. Catherine Cinema and uh, and catch a movie together, all three of us. That's it. Yeah, that's it. Well, we thank Brandon very much, and of course, follow all of his great work over at WrestleNomics with uh, friends of the show Chris Gullo and Jesse Collings. But the doorbell is calling for our next guests. everybody we are back it is the holiday show here at post wrestling and look who has walked in through the door i just feel an overabundance of wellness that has just walked in and that is not <laughs> a drug reference instead jordan goodman eric marcotte and neil flanagan all showing up for the post wrestling christmas party hello jordan hello neil and hello eric hello well, when I it's when, when it's neil it could be a drug reference typically <laughs> yes, after my big admission on Rewind to Smackdown. Um, uh, yes, some recreational usage. But but it's legal in Canada, so that was fine. Yes. Uh, shout out to Steve Grows Weed, who got very accom- mm-hmm. uh, a- accompanied by one Neil Flanagan and his favorite <laughs> recreational activities and your assistance <laughs> that you made your way to the front row of Forbidden Door. And thankfully, you had Brandon from New Jersey at your side to get you through. Yes, he was guiding me by the elbow like an old man at that point. But I woke up. How Jordan, did we uh, come upon this com- combination of guests? I thought that this would be a fun uh, combination of sorts uh, to to put all together because I figured that we had Eric Marcotte just seems to blend in with with everybody at uh, post wrestling. I know I know that there's some uh, some deep rooted uh, bad blood between Jordan and, and Eric, but uh, hopefully for the holidays we can all come <laughs> together. I know I know Jordan, you do hold some grudge against Eric Marcotte. Yeah, well, I, it just feels like a one sided relationship from the beginning. Eric, every now and then I would just randomly call you on on messenger and we would talk in uh without sincerity just complete bullshit uh but you never really did it in return so i felt like why am i investing all this energy on our relationship i i kind of felt that was just the way our our relationship worked you you were the initiator of conversation and i would always just roll with it and i thought we had a good thing going but uh, (laughs) apparently you felt (laughs) otherwise you feel like we're more just wordle sort of friends which is fine but i was a bit hurt friends who are your, friends, stretch? Go ahead. Who are your friends jordan that you expect in in the post community that you have the comfort level to just call up cold uh uh neil eric way sino i think everyone but you john well yeah um i would take your call would you most likely if i was so, busy i wouldn't i do let things go to voicemail if i can't so if I can't engage in a call, I feel bad picking up to state I'm busy. I've texted you more recently, often yep. to to offer you professional compliments. But even the last time I did it, I I felt the need to preface it with like, sorry for all the texting. But I don't think that is accurate that you apologize. First of all, uh, I, I love to hear from you because uh, typically it's very nice to hear from you. Um, I'm, I'm trying to look here, but uh you know, we, we've had some good, I'm just scrolling back here. We've had like quite the text conversation. I think things really picked up in November for us. You, 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 you reached out when I got engaged. That was very nice. From Jordan, just finished your thunder review. You were on fire. Hilarious. John, the material provided me plenty of layups. Then I sent you congratulations on your engagement news. So that was me initiating with you, Jordan and your response. Thanks, John. I appreciate you texting me. That felt like a, I, I feel like John, you do care about this friendship. That's what I took from that response. And, um, and then I, you know, I think we've made some inroads, you know, we have work to do, but I Mm. think we're on a good path. Well, we will all, Eric, are you coming to Philly in April? No, I'm not. 
Thank God. But, but John, <laughs> you will be there. I will be there. I remember when we when we were last together in uh, in in Manhattan, I gave way a hug at the end of the first night. And you were like, well, well where is my hug? And I was like, oh, shit, John, like he he's wanting like, uh, let's let, let's go, as they say. A lot of a lot is assumed of me that is ill founded. I blame a lot of it on Way. I think he does uh, cast me in a certain light that he I does. Know. He does. He's does. and I yeah, remind you back. Yeah, I, it's terrible. I, I think there's definitely a bit of a shadow campaign against one John Pollock, but um, mm. yeah. <laughs> well, I feel I'm like I'm always open for a hug. Chat. Wow. Well, this has been very productive already. Yeah. I recall offering neither of you a choice when I was in Toronto. It's sort of like it was like bring it in. Come on. Neil would be the person I Neil and Brandon from New Jersey and Andrew, I would say, like excluding way. Those would be my the people I am in most communication with it. To be fair, I, I don't call anybody, basically, unless it's an emergency. Um, but Neil, you and I talk quite a lot. Uh, we do the wonder of WhatsApp. Absolutely. Yeah. And more so this year, I think, you know, I think our, our friendship has uh, blossomed. It has. We got a photo together guys talk in about? Toronto. What do you guys talk about other than pro wrestling or, or work related? Well, it's mostly that, but you know, it's just some side notes. So, you know, we were joking around the other week about the um, the UFC messages between Dana and uh, Fertitas and all of those people. You know, the yes, the hey, ne- hey, homie, yeah, ne- <laughs> R U letters. Neil would address <laughs> me as bro when he would uh, he, he would message me. So yeah, we we got a lot of fun out of the antitrust discovery emails way. I, I'll bet you did. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, guess, I guess at this point, um, we all are friends, I think we could say, you know, and this is a, a quite quite the the sort of a union of uh, five uh, of very close people, I would say. Um, we are here to talk about maybe the end of the year and wrestling stories. And, and in particular, I'm, I'm curious from um, all three of you, what have your consumptions of wrestling been like over the past year? Was it more or less than maybe the year prior? I'd say about the same. Uh, however, this is the hottest WWE has felt in a very long time. Dare I say uh, 10, maybe 20 years, at least for me. Uh, so going into WrestleMania season, I am uh, much more engaged by their product. Uh, I love AEW. I still get that feeling on most Wednesdays that I got as a child on most Mondays. And I don't want that to go. But um uh, but yeah, WrestleMania season feels like, like I'm excited to go to Philly, whether I go to WrestleMania or not, I'm excited to feel the energy of that city. How about you, Eric? Uh, my, my wrestling consumption probably mirrored last year's, uh, I keep up with the weekly product for the WWE and AEW and I'm all in on new Japan. I dip my toes into stardom, Noah, even all Japan this year. So uh, I've watched a, a lot of Japanese wrestling from promotions like DDT, which I haven't in previous years. So uh, lots of really good stuff out there, especially when the AEW and WWE products don't entirely appeal to me. I, I kind of watch it more for the community aspect of discussing it, but they're not products that I, I love but what I see on TV. So I get that elsewhere. And you, Neil, as somebody who now kind of like, you know, does pretty regular reporting on it, how has your... Yeah, been? that's what a, that's that's kind of my inroad to, to watching a little more this year, probably, um, in the sense that um, for most of 2022, I was really doing one weekend day a week on the site. And that's still mostly the pattern, but there have been weeks, as you know, John, where it's been three or four days. So... Um, and I, I don't, I really hate attributing um, quotations to other sites. So I'll, or um, results, you know, ripping them off from someone else, you know, so I would always ap- attribute if I do do that, but I'd rather watch it myself, even if I'm skipping parts. To How get was Tag now? I did watch some of the Tag Oh my God. <laughs> Eric, yes. <laughs> I saw the, uh, the momentous uh, joining of House of Torture by uh, Gates of Agony, which is like one of the biggest stories of the year. <laughs> a huge so, addition to the the house of torture that uh I, i'm sure we we might uh hear more from from wh park later on but mm. uh no neil has been i i think just a phenomenal uh addition on, on the news front that has uh made my life uh, a lot easier i think neil is uh he's he's a, he's the quiet mvp that won't that won't take the such accolades but i mean <laughs> for anyone that's just deep into the christmas show um that that intro off the top neil i mean stellar work by the way another year for one Neil Flanagan, 
e- even way was like he was just in disbelief uh when he heard it i think he's gonna go I, back and listen to it now i can imagine yeah this being christmas eve you know way you probably um need to refresh I, your memory you know on, on it yeah i've had a, a, bit, a bit too much eggnog in rum i would say <laughs> um Wanted to maybe ask you guys about what, in your opinions, were the biggest wrestling stories um, to to you, and uh, maybe let's start with Jordan here. Uh, the, the WWE Vince McMahon in, the endeavor. Like I don't know how that could not be that. Um, personally, for me, when as, as far as me coming onto this platform, uh, Jamin Pugh, Jay Briscoe mm-hmm. was the one that was the most personal to me. Um, as evidenced by you guys inviting me to share my my thoughts and feelings uh, pretty candidly um, almost a year ago, I think at this point. Um, I still feel the loss of that. And it sucks. Um, just because, I mean, for many, many reasons, but the potential of him as a professional wrestler uh, that I was feeling a, a decade ago, thinking like, man, this could have been a monster heel to go up against Cena for a few months. Um, I just always felt the the potential in him as a performer, as as a man, getting to know him as a human being. And for me, that's when I think back on on this year, uh, I feel that the most, his loss. Yeah, I mean, it was just such a tragic story um, in, in January. And I mean, it's it's obviously not the the most important thing. But I mean, just the, the fact that here was this, you know, incredibly gifted tag team that should have been on national television for all these years. And it took something like this to basically destroy this edict that had been set up. And Mark Briscoe, I mean, at least professionally, probably more people have gotten to see him this year. And it's just, it's just tragic that that's what it took to kind of um, break down this, this barrier that had been put up there. Um, The people that it just seemed to be like this snap decision and not more so being, I think open-minded to what this individual had had gone through in all of these years and coming off probably like the, the most famous matches in their careers with those three with FTR that so many people did get eyes on and, and even more should have seen. Agreed. And with all that said, I'm very happy that Mark now has uh, the opportunities that he has. He's earning money for, for his family. And when they said top five dead or alive, they were not lying, and dare I say, um, a bit higher than top five for me. And you, Eric? Um, when I think back to the biggest stories of 2023, they're not that different from 2022. It felt as though the headlines were dominated by one Phil Brooks, CM Punk, complete with his return to AEW, the numerous incidents that took place during that short return, his uh, departure from the company, and of course, his return to the WWE. Um a very controversial figure, of course, but uh, I don't think there's any denying that he's someone who piques a lot of interest in the community. And this felt like another year where he was the biggest player in the game. It's incredible Neil, the year he's had. Honestly, Neil, do you wear your watch on the right or left wrist? On my left wrist. Okay. CM Punk is a right wristed watch wearer. If you notice in that in that photo, oh, yes. there, is, uh, an awkward one for me. Like I'm. I'm right-handed, but what, when, when I did wear a watch, it was always on the left wrist. See, this is why I'm a long-time patron. Mm. Look at that. Mm. Is this I, I have not analysis? seen this aspect dissected yet uh, in, in any of these you know, <laughs> CM Punk think pieces. Is that um, I would be curious what percentage of, of the country wears watches on their right arm. Clobbering yeah. time, he, time is told on the right side. That's it. Well, folks. It's, uh, I guess it's lefties mostly, but he's not. So that's, that is an odd one. And I've got nothing to add on 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 the um, on the news of the year because they've been covered. Although we'll just add very quickly that uh, I love the human drama of the TKO merger, the run up to it. With um, it really stretches back into the end of the year prior. But Vince, you know, um, we don't want you back on the board. Uh, well, that's very nice. I'm coming back to the board uh, because I have all the voting uh, rights. Uh, back in January and what led then to the TK stuff, that kind of human drama always is quite gripping, I think. Yes, especially when you have to release all of this in SEC filings afterwards mm-hmm. for all of us to, to see these emails back and forth. Uh, but guys, I want to thank you so much for uh, for joining us on the on the Christmas show, uh, a tremendous year of shows, reports, news. And uh, and I look forward to at least texting all of you in the new year and 
and dare I say, a, a hug will be had in Philadelphia, Jordan. Yes, yes, I, I will be practicing until then. <laughs> Well, ladies and gentlemen, that was uh, the wellness policy coming after myself and Mr. Ting. Jordan Goodman, Neil Flanagan, and I thought a natural attachment to that group, Eric Marcotte, despite the objections of Jordan Goodman. Um, you know what? Um, he seemed I, – I, th- I don't think he can escape Eric Marcotte for whatever reason. Um, they're, they're very interesting peop- people. People. <laughs> oh, wow, that sounds really no, – um, like, why don't you just put up air quotes? I, I i mean What's it came out way? of my mouth and i mean i meant it i i guess it what just interesting people well I, I mean that's how exactly i would describe them they're all incredibly interesting people but that's i i didn't mean it in a negative way you know i mean it's the cleanest way. connection in pro wrestling media because i put him right at the top he he has a crystal clear connection that when i did rewind to smackdown with him a few weeks ago i mean i said it like literally feels like he's he's right here with me in this room yeah, um, maybe the internet gods are 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 with uh with our man, you know. Um, I I I can't explain it. He might be the yeah. only person that's that's using the internet at that time of the like he's he's joining us at like three in the morning for some of these shows. That is true. I I found it with him. Like he he definitely does keep odd hours. And when I say odd, he seems reachable pretty much at any hour of the day. Like, oh, I I think if I texted him at, at around the clock, he'd be back in thirty seconds. Yeah. Hmm. He's on your schedule at, at a at a different point in your life. I, I think he's on everybody's schedule. I think he's awake That's at true. all the That's time. Very, he just doesn't sleep. That's the yeah. secret to Neil. Hmm. Uh, but great to hear from uh, the three of them. And we're winding things down, way because we have a uh, man. We've heard from everyone, have we not? Pretty much. It's it's a pretty packed house. I think we only have room for one more. Oh, you know what? We have that empty seat at the head of the table. Who is going to be occupying that very seat? Well, way the post wrestling Christmas show rolls on, and like any Santa Claus parade, the biggest guest comes right at the end. And here we are, joined by AEW's own, Canada's own, Renee Paquette. Renee, a Merry Christmas to you, and welcome to post wrestling. A long time coming, and we thank you so much for joining us here on our big. Christmas show, our biggest show of the year. Yeah, thank you guys so much for having me. So excited. Great to see you guys. Merry Christmas. So tell us a little bit about uh, Christmas in Cincinnati and how it might differ from Christmas in, in Toronto now that you have uh, a Christmas or two under your belt in, in your new your new digs. Yeah, so I've definitely got a few under my belt. Here's the thing that really surprised me when I moved from Las Vegas to Cincinnati. I was like, oh my gosh, winter again. This is going to be great. And then I was like, oh, this is not a Canadian winter. It's actually really nice because it still gets cold. We obviously still get some snow, but we're not like beaten over the head with it like we are in Toronto or other parts of Canada. Um, So it's nice. I don't know that like a white Christmas is always on the docket, but it's always kind of up for debate in Toronto too. So um, it's really nice though. I love it. The only problem is that our house is really old. um, So she's a tad drafty. Mm. I see. Yeah. As someone that uh, bought a 100 year old house, um, a nightmare, an absolute yeah, nightmare. It's cold. Uh, Certain, there's little like cold pockets that you got to be prepared for. Um, so, you know, we, we are, of course, speaking to a fellow Canadian. And, um, you know, we actually maybe share a little bit of um, history in, in the same circles working in television in Canada, uh, principally spending some time at Byte Television. Yes. Um, so, you know, we I mean, we, we've both been very familiar with your work ever since the days of ripping it and lipping it <laughs> on Byte TV. <laughs> oh, no, there's a clip. <laughs> Yeah, I, we will not play it. Don't worry. People can, can type it in and look it up on, on YouTube themselves. But to really see your evolution, you know, uh, through the ranks, maybe, as, as we would say, uh, from Canadian television on cable um, over to everything that you've accomplished today really has really been uh, amazing for us to watch. Um, maybe talk to us about, you know, taking take us back to Renee Paquette at the Sound Academy doing this uh, edition of Ripping It and Lipping It with preposterous and uh, did you ever see yourself where you are right now? 
Well, you know, I think I always had pretty lofty dreams for myself. And I knew that there was a ton of things that I wanted to accomplish, but you got to start somewhere. And, you know, I always give that love back to Bite TV, back to the score. The people that took a shot on me really early on in my career, I mean, Jason Agnew was that guy that really helped me get my foot in the door, especially at Bite TV, to start doing Rippin' It and Lippin' It. Um, you know, when I <clears throat> went in for my audition, which was for a different show, which ended up becoming Rippin' It and Lippin' It. Um, I was really just trying to figure out who I was as a host. And that was something that I'm always so grateful that I had the opportunity to do was like start somewhere in like, you know, a smaller space. So you can try some stuff out. And boy, was I trying some stuff out. Does this work? Is this funny? Do, does this voice work for me? Um, so it was really trying all those things out. Um, and then it was those building blocks. You know, you start with one show. That got me, uh, I don't know that that got me on the radar of the score, but it gave me enough of a demo reel to feel confident to go and bang on the door at the score. So exactly, that's what I did. That young woman right there was literally banging on the door at the score being like, can I send someone a demo reel? Who do I need to email? This is the days of when you had a headshot and a resume in your hand. Um, so I was out doing all of those things. And it was just looking for different opportunities. You know, I never knew going to the score, which the reason why I went there was because they did more comedic style interviews in the sports world. And that was more where I wanted to hang. So to get there and then have pro wrestling land on my lap there, um, we had the rights to WWE in Canada. So that's where the opportunity came to be like, hey, do you want to do a post show for Monday Night Raw? And I was like, uh, yeah, of course, sure. And then I guess sort of the rest is history from there. I mean, that was really me dipping my toe into the pro wrestling world. And then that led to me joining WWE, but just being so familiar with their product specifically to know that when I started working there, I knew the talk, I knew the vernaculars, I knew all of those things. Obviously, I knew who everybody was. Um, but yeah, it was, you know, it's really kind of fun to look back on the journey of starting at one spot, and then ending up where I am now. It's it's really cool. It's fun. I'm it's I'm really, I guess, Grateful is the word uh, while we're in the holiday spirit of just feeling happy about where things are. Just, you also just, have like a huge foundation in improv. And I'm kind of curious as we look at the current state of professional wrestling, where like the in-ring quality is just, it's so huge that yeah. all of these talents are looking for ways to differentiate themselves. I'm curious if like those aspects are going to more be seeping into performers as they're breaking in of like the personality side and what you can get at, get attention wise online for yourself. It seems like that's that's been a huge advantage for those that have taken that route and worked it into professional wrestling. Oh, certainly. You know, I think there's so many parallels. I think. You know, it's like that phrase that everything is pro wrestling. And that is the case. I think so many different things can apply to that space. But I mean, you look at the way that people are able to break in now. And of course, social media presence, being able to have different matches on the indies and be able to like kind of blast that out in a certain way. Um, but there's there's definitely like a space for everybody, whether you're somebody that wants to go out and have these amazing matches, you're an incredible athlete or you're somebody that's a really great storyteller, or you're somebody that's a really great personality. Um, you know, you look at somebody like Danhausen, for example, is somebody who's like, he's really taken that tool of being very funny, being this great character, but also like he worked his ass off, especially during the pandemic, to like stay relevant, stay in people's feeds, stay creating content, and just stay, like staying creative and inspired um, to, to where he's at now to, to be able to be as a part of AEW. Oh, look at us. Are you guys ready to go? Producers ain't messing around right now. I love it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I feel like Dan Housen's like a really great example of somebody who, who can dabble in so many different spaces. And, you know, I think the orange Cassidy is another one of those guys too, that he is such a great character and that's the thing that you lean on. And then you get him in the ring and you're like, Oh my God, look at this guy go. He is so versatile. He's such a great asset to AEW. I mean, to really anywhere he is. But yeah, he's he is awesome. You have started working as a backstage producer for AEW recently. And um, I, I, I really am curious, speaking as somebody who has been in front of the camera 
what do you kind of take into your producer role uh, with your approach to making backstage interviews feel as organic as you're able to make them? You know, I think the thing that I always kind of go to is how can we simplify this? Hmm. A lot of things are so complicated and complex, especially in AEW when there's so many different storylines going on. There's many different championships uh, that we can have 90 seconds in an on cam. And it's like, wait, we've got three different titles, three different matches that we've got to plug. It's like trying to find what is the root of what we're trying to achieve right now? What's the easiest way to get to that while still, still being entertaining and making the most of that TV time. I mean, we all know when the camera's on you, that is so important to make the most of that time. So yeah, it's just trying to, to simplify things and make sure that we're sort of checking those boxes in terms of the storytelling, but then there's also the other aspect of the lighting, the making sure people are standing in the right spot, um, having your character shining in the best way. I think it's all those things that you really just need to look at um, to, to make the most of those backstage interviews. In in terms of, uh, you know, you've been now with AEW for just over a year. Uh, the big announcement was made here in Toronto. Tell me a bit about just the balance um, that you and John have found being on the road every week uh, with, with a daughter on top of it. Do you guys have yeah. like a kind of <laughs> solid routine? And, and how often is she on the road with you guys? So we take her only when we do pay-per-views because that okay. then we'll be gone longer. <clears throat> Otherwise, it's like we fly out day of the show and we're right back home Thursday. So it's harder on her it's obviously harder on me i think to bring her every week that i just think is it's weird when I mean, you're figuring out being a parent and you're like what is the best for everybody here is being with her mom with like is her being with me all the time going to be the thing she needs or is it being able to be at home be in a better routine i feel like carding a kid into different time zones oh my god that little honey bunny she's so little there um yeah it's 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 figuring it all out you know I remember talking to Becky Lynch sort of early on asking her advice on like what her and Seth do how they balance that and she said she's like you know you really just kind of figure out what works best for you and and that was the thing for us is like yeah when there's pay-per-views and we take her and we're gone for the weekend and we can make the most of it if you're gone from a Wednesday through to a Sunday she'll come with us uh, but otherwise we're in and out but in terms of like an actual routine not really we never know what we're doing we're winging it most of the time um but yeah for me you know we're so lucky that that john and i get to be on the road together we get to have those moments where it's just like okay it's just me and you we're in the hotel we can kind of unwind together and just him and i get to connect in that in that moment um and then we get home and then it's you know sort of all hands on deck for that um but then when we're home uh for me particularly is like when i'm home i just get to be with her then i get to like put on my mom hat and it's, we're baking, we're doing crafts, we're, you know, just going out and doing kid things to keep her entertained. So it's nice to be in both roles, because I was definitely feeling that a little bit before I joined AEW I was like, what am I doing? I love being a mom, I love being in that role. But I was really missing that work aspect. So now that I feel like both cups are full, it's very nice. It seems that this industry overall has taken major leaps towards being able to have th that that balance that, I mean, totally. even t 10 years ago, much less when we're hearing the horror stories of the 80s and stuff where it's like <laughs> no. you, you grew up without a parent. Yeah, I know. It's, it's funny. John and I were talking about that not too long ago where it's like I think so many families got used to – we'll use like the, the men for example in this because that was predominantly what it was mm -hmm. there wasn't a lot of women or like moms on the road of course there was a few but not a ton but the dads would be gone and then you come home and then it's like wait we've been living life without you it's so cool that that's not the case now like thank god i used to always kind of think that being on the road before of like oh my gosh like how do these guys juggle doing that you're on the road because I, I know how exhausted you are coming off the road I can't imagine what it's like when you're wrestling and having matches and your body is beat up and then you come home and now you're like, okay, I'm down on the floor playing with my kids. Like it's rough. It's really hard. It's, it's very hard to strike that balance of uh, doing it all. What, what of um, AEW's bigger hires, I would say, um, maybe to to us, you know, who are maybe fans of um, studying not just the in-ring product, but also the production of the show this year has been Michael Mansuri and Hi. somebody you've you spent a lot of time working with in the past. I, I'm just kind of curious to hear from somebody who works in production. What sort of changes would you say that he's been responsible for? 
responsible for? Um, you know, I think for for Mike, it's it's trying to 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 get that cohesion of the show. There's so much going on in a young company that has grown leaps and bounds in the last couple of years to be tacking on more shows, to be doing more live TV. Uh, he is like the creme de la creme when it comes to live television, especially in the wrestling space. He was always so great and still is, but taking that time to work with talent, help them maybe on entrances. He's really great at finding those big star moments. This is what an entrance can look like. Take your time with this, find the camera for this moment. He's so great at working with talent to help them figure out those things, especially when you've got talent that have worked, you know, they've been doing live events, doing indies for so long. It's so much different than doing television and hitting TV times, hitting commercial spots. Uh, to be able to find the hard cam, find those moments to find the camera and, and have those times that can really separate somebody into uh, to feeling like a gigantic superstar in this industry. So he's really great at that. Um, he is somebody, you know, even when we're doing zero hour and whatnot, he is always in my ear. I know that I can trust him. And that's something that uh, I think is so important. As a producer, I know that he's going to get me where I need to be. I, I could go out. I have done shows with Mike without having any papers, no truck sheets, not knowing what's going on, uh, you know, over the decade that I've known him. And I, he's always gotten me where I need to be. And that trust to be able to have with somebody is really great for a performer to know that I'm in good hands. Uh, but he's, he's just the best. He really is such a huge asset to AEW. Bringing him in was clutch. I mean, it was it, it was quite quite surreal to be watching uh, All In and seeing uh, two past hosts of Catch Twenty Three here at Wembley <laughs> Stadium in Renee Paquette and RJ City uh, yeah. here in front of eighty thousand people, and uh, and I I can claim that I was there to see them in front of uh, about uh, sixty people at Coney. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. It's so funny when we were like, re like when I was able to kind of like reconnect with RJ. It's like, do you remember when we met? And he was like, yeah, it was a comedy bar when I probably, you know, one of those shows. I'm like, a lot of those nights at comedy bar are a little foggy to me, so uh, you might need to run me back on that one. Um, one thing I, I did want to also ask ask you about is um, uh, both both Wayne, I read um, uh, your husband John Moxley's book. And I found this book, like there are select, um, like there's a million wrestling books, but in terms of someone that found his voice, like on the page instantaneously, like this guy is just a phenomenal storyteller that if he came out with a true crime novel, I would be <laughs> greatly intrigued Don't to read him. I hope, I hope we get more writing out, out of John because I, I thought his book was just so different from so many others that, that I have read. And that voice, I was, I was captivated at this man describing how to pre prepare the perfect sandwich. It was just like, he's just really, I don't think hey, it comes as a surprise. He's very good with his storytelling, as you see on television with his wording. But um, his book, I think it just was one that... Um, deserved the big spotlight when it came out. I agree. I agree. I mean, obviously I'm biased when it comes to John, but I just think he is the best. I think he is so captivating when he is speaking. You, t you listen when he has a mic in his hand, you want to listen when he's having a match, you want to pay attention. But when he started dabbling in this book world, which by the way, he wrote my coattails because I wrote a book first. Um, but anyways, when he started working on this book, um, and he would just, he was so submerged in this world. I like gave him one of my old laptops. He's like typing away on it. And he was trying to like craft how the book was going to come together. Cause he wanted it to be different from most pro wrestling books too. Of course. I mean, he's read every pro wrestling book I think that probably exists. So he knew what he liked. He knew what he didn't like. Um, and for him to just, you know, really put pen to paper and to have his voice come through the way that it did. I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised at all. I mean, the guy really is an artist, no matter which uh, avenue he seems to be working in as a pro wrestler, as a writer, as a creator. He's just, he's so good and he knows himself so through and through. That's one thing that always kind of, not that it surprises me, but I guess it inspires me more than anything. It's sometimes when I'm like talking to him just about anything. Cause I'll flip, I'll flip flop on things of like, whether I want my hair long or short or what I want to wear one day, whatever. And he's like, I wear this, this is what I do. Like he is just so sure of himself. 
in every step and every breath that he takes. And it's, it's really cool to see someone exist in the world like that. Something like we've always wondered while watching the shows, especially since you've been um, back, you know, in AEW and reunited with John is um, uh, what sort of thought has um, gone into discussing how much to recognize your relationship with, with each other on screen and in storyline. We actually, it's never a conversation. Um, yeah, it's never come up. It used to come up in WWE a little bit more. There was a couple moments um, when it kind of had to come up, especially when I'm on commentary and I'm calling his matches. It's kind of hard to ignore that. And some days we would ignore it. Other days we would lean into it. So that was always a little bit confusing for me on navigating that. But in AEW, it's different. We've literally, we've been on camera Gosh, I think only once together in AEW when I had to give Eddie Kingston the business because he couldn't get his shit together. Um, but that's really the only time that that's happened. And, you know, I think the nice thing, I love that we get to work together. I love that we get to spend all that time together. But I also love that we do completely separate things. We're not getting in each other's way. He does his thing. I do my thing. Honestly, we show up to the building separately. I go ahead of him. He comes at whatever time he shows up. He goes and does his thing. I'm busy doing my thing. And then we get out of there together and we go back to the hotel room and kind of go through our days and stuff. But we really keep our work separate despite working for the same company and doing the same kind of thing. Has there been much thought, um, you know, like oftentimes you might be interviewing one of his opponents or reacting to or like being uh, on screen for a backstage segment right after he goes through, you know, a really bloody match. For, for right. Instance. Have there been much conversations about how you would might handle those? So we don't have those conversations, but those are things that I think about as a broadcaster. I mean, he, yeah, that's never something him and I speak about, but there's definitely been moments with like Hangman, for example. I've had moments with Hangman when Hangman was doing a, a, a program with John uh, when I had to do some stuff with him on camera and he's, you know, mentioning John or throwing a dagger my way. He did it not even that long ago uh, when we were doing a contract signing between him and Swerve when he kind of still threw something my way. I'm like, buddy, this is not my problem. You guys worry about your shit. I'll do my thing. Um, so, I mean, that stuff is going to come up every now and then. And I think it, you never want to like lean on it too much. I think you can right. acknowledge it and have a moment, but I will always, even if I acknowledge something, I still go, I'm doing a job. I'm being the journalist here. I'm not going to oversell something or overstate something to go, who is talking about my husband? How dare he? Somebody's like right in my face doing that. Like I remember Samoa Joe doing that when we were in AEW and having to like navigate that a little bit. And listen, when Samoa Joe's in your face, kind of talking some shit on your husband, I'm like, oh, buddy, what? Um, but yeah, I, I just, I think about that more. Uh, in terms of how I'm going to react to things, but it's it's never a conversation that John and I are having. It's always how I tend to, you know, watch those segments is um, I get the sense that you are playing a professional broadcaster who has to keep it together and do their job despite, yeah. you know, going through anything personal in the yeah. background. And yeah, I think, it's always yeah. that. I mean, whether it's doing stuff with Soraya, who's like my best friend, sometimes she'll do stuff where she's got to kick me out of a shot. And like there's moments like that that just kind of happen. And that really is what it is. It's kind of like playing the role of the journalist you're keeping it straight and narrow. You're sort of playing the straight man, but it's those little nuances that I think can really make those right. moments, at least for me, feel a little bit more real and authentic. Well, Renee, this has been a, such a pleasure uh, to have you on, capping off our post-wrestling Christmas show. We have had a lot of guests on our show Um your favorite guest might have been on already because uh, someone that is attached to our network is one Braden Harrington. And if that name doesn't ring a bell, his Halloween costume may, uh, which he went out this past Halloween. <laughs> I saw this. That with about is a dozen so skewers in good. his head. Um, it's this, incredible. Um, just uh, <laughs> the, the man goes above and beyond for Halloween and he topped himself uh, this this year. Um, it is so good. I know. I, I, I was like tagged in that a few times and got to see it. I was like, wow, <laughs> it's really great. <laughs> well, it. we also want to let everyone know that the, uh, the Renee Paquette AEW Canadian tour is going to be taking place uh, beginning March 16th. And AEW is going to be pretty much going across Canada from Ottawa, 
uh, back to Toronto on March the 20th, and then Quebec City, London, Winnipeg, Edmonton, Vancouver, and Calgary uh, with tickets available at AEW ticks.com and i guess hopefully you get uh an extended uh stopover in, in toronto to reacquaint yourselves with the uh the comedy bars and and yes. such uh that, that the city uh still hosts i always make sure to give myself a little pad on either sides of the tv show to get my time in toronto so i'll probably be doing that in most canadian cities i'll be on honestly like i've not been to vancouver in forever um i've not been to quebec city in God, a decade. So yeah, I'm really excited to go to some of these cities and, and show everybody around. All right. So AEWTix.com, they're all available now. And Renee, this has been a, such a pleasure to have you on the show. A Merry Christmas to you and your entire family. And uh, thanks so much for joining us here on the Christmas show. Happy holidays. Thank you guys so much. Merry Christmas. I'll see you guys soon. Ladies and gentlemen, Renee Paquette, from AEW joining the post wrestling Christmas show and great to hear from Renee joining us from Cincinnati discussing uh, her history in Toronto. And uh, when she agreed to come on the show, I don't think she knew that it was going to become, this is your life courtesy of waiting, <laughs> taking her into the way back machine. Yeah, uh, very nicely done. Yes. I mean, I, I, I suppose when you, you think about, um, you know, her journey, it's, it's, it's a really one of those, odd stories where um she she kind of you know was birthed out of a, a very similar circumstance or, and scene as as us so only felt natural to address it with her i i think that we've had a lot of like you know similar paths in the industry while being mm -hmm. at different places that just never i mean you did work with her like at, at a time at fight I was around her. I might have been part of like one or two productions with like a match in show, but like beyond that, like we've never really had any sort of interactions. But she she knows so many of the same people that we know working through it with, you know, Arda and Jimmy, of course, on uh, Aftermath, Moro, I guess, at one point on Aftermath yeah. as well. So um, it's just been amazing to see her rise. And from the moment you saw her, you knew that she was like really kind of, you know, destined for for something big. And uh, it makes sense, sense to me why she's so successful. I wish. Uh... Well, I wish I could see uh, Brayden and Davey's reaction for that reveal at the end. That would have been fun. Maybe you will well, later on. <laughs> thank you again to Renee for joining us. And we would be saying goodbye, but the fun is only beginning because now that all the guests here, it is time for the annual post wrestling jingle contest where over the past month, the submissions have been open. We have not taken a peek at any of the submissions. We're going to be watching these for the first time and then crowning the winner of the 2023 post wrestling jingle contest. So way, are you ready for this annual affair as we go through these submissions? I am ready. And let me just first say every year you put the thread up and you and I just get really concerned. Are we, is this the year where like, we're not going to have any entries. And then when we get at least one, we're like, Okay, well, at least we have one. I mean, we're still a bit nervous. I've always said the year we get like two, um, that'll be the end of the jingle contest. It's always my my concern yeah. of like, we're this is too much of an ask for too much work that we're putting out there for people to provide. But this year, happy to say people came through. And uh, you might hear some familiar voices on this edition of the Christmas jingle contest. So let's start things off. And you know what? Let's give some extra points to this person. Canadian Bulldog who sent their entry in 14 days ago. Dude, Canadian Bulldog, number one, he submits one every year. And this year, especially just seeing that, like you put the, I put the post up and then it's just waiting to see, is anyone even going to respond? And then when Canadian Bulldog posted this, I was like, dude, this guy always comes through every always. single year consistency. I always appreciate consistency and Canadian Bulldog uh, delivers every year. Uh, Canadian Bulldog says, John and Way, I apologize for the length of the song. Please feel free to hit stop once you have the general idea. Hope everyone in the post wrestling universe enjoys and has a happy holiday. Uh, okay, if if it sucks, then we will uh, skip skip it. He's the name of the, do they know it's Vince McMahon? I cannot wait to hear this. Okay, so here we go, everybody. Do they know it's Vince McMahon by Canadian Bulldog? Let me try to uh, present the other window here as I do that. Here it is, everybody. Have a listen. It's 
Vince McMahon. There's no need to be afraid. All his affairs have been settled by now, or at least NDA'd. And in the world of sports entertainment, all the die-hard wrestling fans can enjoy watching the show without the McMahons. But wait a sec. Look who came crawling back. Just imagining this abandoned. Your punk, but that other jerk known as Minnie Mac. Sure he's no longer the owner. But he damn sure has a stake. Where the only thing for certain are all the rules he'll break. And while TKO are the owners, we don't really think that's true. What's a tonight, strip full H instead of you. <laughs> okay, that's a good one. And there's still be lots of roster cuts in business time. Oh, the GFL gets a 90-day non-compete. After three months of being gone, they'll get a call from Tony Khan. And do they know it's Vince McMahon at all? Lovely. Wow. Here's to you wrestling shows that are really lame. Hire new wrestlers that force them to change their name. And do they know it's Vince McMahon at all? All right. Wow. Do we have the idea? Do they know it's Vince McMahon? <laughs> yes, a, a, a very strong first entry from um, Canadian Bulldog here. Merchandiseandmemories.com. Let's give them a plug. Uh, there's actually more of that song to go through. And um, you know what? People can go to the uh, the forum if they if they want to hear the uh, the complete version. I had my finger on the trigger that entire time. Okay. And we lasted pretty long. Like we lasted, you know, like uh, way deep into the show. Um, um, I guess, uh, you know, the bridge and, and for the most of it. What did you think of this first entry? I thought that the uh, the, the lyrics were pretty. Like that's that's not an easy task to to write out that amount of a kind of a witty lyrics. I thought I thought that was a, a strength. Um, I guess we we kind of have the uh, the, the copyright music to uh, kind of contend with under there. Um, but that's that's, okay. that's, no, that's that, a request. That it's not a a, yeah. a demand. Um, I guess we we can go a little bit on. Um, I think we we could get, we could have had some clearer audio maybe if we're looking at this from a technical standpoint. Oh, but if we're looking okay. at strictly, um, I do believe of of Canadian Bulldogs prior submissions. I think this one is right near the top of his entries. So I thought overall, um, I was very impressed with the lyrics. Yeah, I thought I thought um a lot of work put thought uh, and thought put into it. I, I thought a uh, very topical discussion for the end of the year. I would say, um, and uh, perhaps could raise the uh, the awareness of the Securities and Exchange Commission as well. Of uh, is TKO really running this company or is it Vince McMahon? I think this should be sent to them and maybe played um to all the investors, perhaps. Thank you very much, Canadian Bulldog. Maybe we will reassess whether or not this was good enough to win the contest this year. Up next, it's another regular of the post wrestling Christmas jingle contest. Sancti. Hey, John and Way, Ian from the best film ever here. And it's always an honor to throw my proverbial hat in the ring for another Christmas jingle contest. This year I've recruited Georgia also from best film ever to help with a little call and response in this year's entry. Thanks for everything you guys do all year long to keep the whole post wrestling machine running so smoothly all year long. With that, we present, we present baby. It's the bloodline. Here it is from best film ever in Georgia. <laughs> Say who's in that ring? 
baby, it's the bloodline. They've won everything. Oh, yes, they're, they're doing fine. Those twins look upset. Jimmy and Jay. I hope they'll be okay. They're just not feeling that you see today. Honorary member today. That ginger guy, he is Sammy Zay. To Roman He'll be the difference at the war games. He'll be the most over a His moment and how it will stop. There's no way they can screw up this call. They'll job them out when in Montreal. Now the rumble is won. But the guy with the tattooed neck. Does he win the belt? The story's not over yet. That makes no sense. <laughs> what does that even mean? Just buy the shirts, they're all the same color scheme. Tribal combat begins. Jay gets hold of the floor. Now his twins are going and to deuces, war. deuces, deuces, then he'll go out the Logan, door. Jimmy and Jay, oh, acknowledge that. The Bloodline are now in your ditty. Ooh. Very well done from uh, the Best Film Ever podcast. You can subscribe to it on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or Spotify. Um, Thank you, Ian and Georgia. What did you think? Well, baby, it's cold outside, but this contest is heating up inside. And this was a very strong entry from the team at Best, Best Film Ever. Mm-hmm. And I thought, uh, number one, I, I, I always like the, uh, the collaborations, uh, that we got here again, I, I will always lean towards the, uh, original lyrics, uh, being written. So I, I thought this was a really strong one, kept my attention for the full minute 27, good length. Um, what do you mean they, original lyrics? Like, like they wrote the lyrics for this, like, uh, th- everybody did. I, I would imagine. What do you mean? Like, well, sometimes we we've, we've got ones where it's, uh, you know, they've, they borrowed here or there, or uh, I'm just saying, like to to write a song like this, I'm I'm just giving some applause. So is this is this based off of another song? I, yes. I, I don't know it. I don't know this. Baby, oh, this is baby. It's cold outside. outside. Oh, yes. okay. I didn't realize. Yes. So what do you mean by original lyrics, like or borrowed lyrics? Even I'm just saying that they 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 had to take existing lyrics for this original song and rewrite them to right. fit a wrestling theme. But isn't I mean, that you're not just every... like snapping your fingers and doing this? It'll it, that takes a lot of time. But I guess I'm just saying, isn't that what isn't everybody doing that? Okay, to varying degrees of success. <laughs> I see. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, p- points for that. I I think points for the length, and maybe this is where like, uh, you know, the the choice of song, I you know, really helps. Uh, compact. You get your fix in a minute thirty seconds here, and uh, very clever. Timely. Yeah, and and you know maybe to your first criticism of um, our first entry, audio quality um, is w- was exceptional. I would say for something like th- uh, for this entry, so very well done, best film ever pod. We shall see if this entry was strong enough for the end. All right, let's go up next. I believe this is a brand new entrant. His name is Double H. Hello, John and Way. Double H. From Sweden here, longtime listener, first time jingle maker. My submission is a duet between Tony Khan and Phil Brooks, rudely interrupted by Jungle Boy Jack Perry. Being horrible imp- impersonations, I've, I've provided you with the lyrics down below so that you can know who is supposed to sing what. Please forgive my any any bad grammar and such. English is my second language. All right. Okay, well, I'm intrigued. Okay, this song is called "The Fairy Tale of a Second City Saint." It was Sunday Eve, babe. This is Tony Khan. At all hours, and no man said to me, I work with children. And then he ate a bunch from Mindy's bakery. I turned my face away. And cringed in agony Got on the punky one Came in a lead to one Imagine Tony Khan doing karaoke 
This year's not for me and you. So happy Christmas. I love you, Punky. I can see a better time when all our dreams come true. Tony. Oh, hi, Phil. Can I sing with you? Sure. Hop on in. They get some big stars. They get rivers of gold. And the workload's not crazy. Good place for the old. TK, take my hand and I'll sign for ye. As long as not Ryback is waiting for me. You were handsome. You were pretty. King of Second City. When the crowd stopped cheering, they hold out for more. But problems were lingering. Backstage you were swinging. We kissed on the corner and danced through the night. And the boys on the AEW choir were singing glory days. As the bells were ringing out from Punk's first day. <laughs> is that a real microphone? <laughs> it sure is. You want me to show you how to use it? Nah, go cry me a river. <laughs> You're a bum CM Punk. I want to be Terry Funk lying there almost dead with my ass in real glass. Now listen to your old ones. Look what happened to Goldberg. You're a kid. I'm the grown-up. I'll choke your ass out. Now Come the here. Boys of the <laughs> Singing glory days as the bells were ringing out from Punk's last day. Oh my goodness. Why couldn't you been somewhat like Ed or Danielson? You took my dreams from me and I had to fire you. But I should have kept you, babe. Should have kept you for my own. Can't make it all alone. I built collision around you. Now the boys of the WWE are singing glory days as the bells are ringing out for Punk's first day. Oh my goodness. Wow. Have a look at that Christmas tree. It's just been standing there in the corner since you lie, making no sense at all. Until now. Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry real Christmas. Shut up, Jungle Boy, or, or I will choke you out. Yeah, he'll choke you. Merry Christmas, John. Merry Christmas, Way. And Merry Christmas to the post-wrestling universe. Wow. Fantastic. I'll go out on a limb and uh-huh. state that there was probably a time, maybe it was too late, but I feel that in the immediate aftermath of everything that went down, if all these parties got into one room and played this, <laughs> that they all might have been so um, beside themselves in laughter that the end result would have been, what are we fighting about? And they would have had a group hug and wrestling history would have been changed. Mm -hmm. That song could have had that impact. Um, That was Mm -hmm. totally ludicrous, but had me captivated for the entire four minutes that that went there. Um, You know, much like uh, first time home buyers insurance, first time submission does come with some bonus points from the John Pollock scale. Uh Um, Original lyrics as well. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yes very also impressive huge. very original also like I, i'm sure that is based off of a song i don't i don't know what the song is fairy tale of new york by the pogues okay there we go um points for originality well original <laughs> originality in in that sense too i don't think we've had a parody of, of that song before no um i i, I thought that was a great submission um, i thought that was excellent there. um okay so first of all double h from if you're actually from Sweden, there was no nothing like to apologize for for um, uh, grammar and such. Like you, you speak English better than me, so I, that was like fantastically done. I thought the impressions in the middle um, were excellent. I mean, okay, maybe not accurate, but the the effort that I think w- was went into uh, creating this landscape, I felt I felt like I was right in that um, gorilla position. Okay, with uh, Jack Perry and CM Punk. Um, and I thought some of these lyrics were hilarious. I thought that was uh, 
wonderfully, very, very strongly executed. Very, very strong submission. Thank you, Double H. Um, that was great. Okay. This one I'm very excited for. Um, I know we've had a lot of like, you know, return entrants, former champions of the post wrestling Christmas show contest, but we're dealing with the heavyweights this year. Okay. You want to talk about um maybe, you know, a star studded edition of the G1, maybe a star studded, you know, continental classic that brings out all the main inventors. We have entering for the first time in the post wrestling Christmas show, the one, the only, the voice of Rewind of SmackDown, the identity crisis has come out of hiding to what? enter the post wrestling Christmas jingle contest. And might I add, um, some of the entrants, including a um, uh, uh, Canadian Bulldog, uh, you'll get video lyrics, videos, the, the, the extra points for video accompaniment as well. The identity crisis, as he's been known to do for a lot of his musical efforts, um, seems to have made his own music video for the song. So I have not watched this yet. We will all watch and listen together. This is the postmas song by the Ent identity crisis. Waiting's patience has been wearing thin. Oh, sorry. Before I do that, let's let's read what he has to say. Uh, Yo, fellas, thanks for another year of, of hard work and dedication. Here's my submission. A parody of Nat King Cole's The Christmas Song, Chestnuts Roasting on an Open Fire, written on behalf of other <laughs> original lyrics, written on behalf of other fans like me that have completely stopped watching wrestling for years, decades even, and only keep up to date through you guys. All instruments, vocals produced and performed by yours truly. On my end, I'm working on new stuff. I actually got a grant from the Mississauga Arts Council to do my next single, and I'm working on Grammy-nominated rap group Kritz's new project. They did AJ Styles' TNA theme. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to the both of you. Well, that basically makes you a Grammy nominee uh, affiliated, okay? So... Could he earn a Grammy for the Postmas song? Let's take a listen here from The Identity Crisis. Waiting's patience has been wearing thin. Pollock's not so far behind. All the crap that is on Monday nights and Wednesdays and most Fridays too. Everybody knows. This stupid stuff is getting old From the Bucks to CM Punk Many marks With their eyes on the screens Will find it hard to watch Tonight They know when Flair Is on the scene in wrestling rings since 1970 and we know Becky Lynch has come so far she has eclipsed her husband as a star and so I'm thanking Post for staying strong and I'm renewing Patreon so she took a win <laughs> they still sit through hell Many hours, many days Thank you, waiting And John <laughs> I was waiting for the gentleman Jack to uh, take a prompt Oh my god, he's the best Oh my god That was the one and the only identity crisis with the Postma song There seems to be a, 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 a The Postma song Way Ting's patience has been wearing thin uh, Your thoughts, John? I loved it um, Adding the video component I mean, dare I say, he's he's reimagining the game Of the jingle contest with video that, that that's certainly true. Uh, extra points uh, and effort for for that video accompaniment. Um, I I always feel like um, we should give some extra points to what sounds like original instrumentation as well. I mean, original lyrics <laughs> and <laughs> original mean, lyrics man? and original music, or at least like you know, um, it's great sounding drums as always, keys. Very high quality production, Grammy nominated, adjacent. Adjacent. Okay. 
Well, we thank the identity crisis. I mean, we, we got the pros uh, coming in here, but there are, there are no restrictions. Anyone is able to uh, to enter the field. So it is uh, may the best man or woman win as we uh, continue to go through our submissions. But uh, strong entries. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I don't have a front runner yet. Competition is ramping up. Okay. And as we said, the heavyweights are in town entering this contest this year, uh, our final entrant this year. A lot of, uh, a lot of um, maybe uh, guests have dropped in over or this this Christmas um, uh, special. Um, we've been missing this person. Haven't really heard from this person, at least for a year, maybe more. Braxton Witherspoon and the Smart Marks have made yeah, an entry. Him a Christmas this. card every year. We, we only hear from him. Comes out of hiding like Santa once a year. We've asked Nate, hey, where's this guy? Like, you know, you, you're in contact with him all the time. What, what's going on? Well... Brother Pollock and Brother Ting, I woke up this morning after a late night at the Poison Rana Christmas party with a splitting headache. I guess trying to go shot for shot with Braden and Davey and then watching a WOW Women of Wrestling Marathon with Sino was a bad idea. Yes. Uh, back when I, but when I checked my phone, I found a weird text from an unknown number that simply said, I'm back, BW. When I clicked on the attachment, you can imagine my surprise when I heard a brand new holiday song from Braxton Witherspoon and the crew. I hope you, the Post family, and all the postmarks out there have a safe and joy-filled holiday season. Okay. What a wonderful surprise. Let's hear Silver Bells WTH by Braxton Witherspoon and the smart Marquettes. Marquettes. <laughs> Hello, everybody. I'm Braxton Witherspoon coming to you from Temecula, California, by way of Chattanooga, Tennessee, and of course I had my brief two-year stint in Tokyo, Japan, and these are the smart marks. Uh, I, I said these are the smart marks. Huh. These are the smart marks? What? Larry! What's going on, boss man? Larry, where are the fellas at? It's time to make a Christmas record for the people. Where are the smart marks? Uh, Braxton, don't you remember last time we made a Christmas record with Ben Manuel Miranda? Yes, yes, Larry, I remember our record with Ben Manuel Miranda is. But what's that got to do with the smart marks? Well, uh, we, we ain't put out a holiday record in like two years, Braxton, so they figured they'd book some tour dates with, with Ben this, this holiday season. What? They on tour with Ben Manuel Mirandias. Damn you, Ben Manuel Mirandias. Now don't worry about it, Braxton. I got it covered. Ladies, come on in. What, what are you doing, Larry? You know I'm in a committed relationship with Lisa Morette. This ain't got nothing to do with that, boss man. These are the smart Marquettes. The smart Marquettes? Yes, they they great singers. I think they'll be perfect for our next holiday record, Braxton. You know what, Larry? That's crazy enough that it just might work. And I got a perfect song for the Smart Marquettes to debut on. You do? Yes, I do. Like the hit? Here it goes. Another one. Yes, we back at them. Ladies, help me out. Silver Bell. Oh, what the hell? Punk has returned to the WWE. Ring-a-ling. His watch rings. Soon it will be clobbering time. Here's a story, y'all, about my man Paul up in Stamford CT. In the air, there's a feeling of petty. Paul's got a plan, gonna sign a man who can change the whole game. And up on every dirt sheet you read, that's saying silver bells. Oh, what the hell? Punk has returned to the WWE. Ring a link, his watch rings. Soon it will be clobbering time. 
Second city, you're so pretty. My God, Jermaine's so mean. As the bakers bake up all the muffins. Chi-Town's got class, won't use real glass. This is Phil Brooks' big scene. And amongst all his people, you hear they're saying silver bells. Oh, what the hell? <laughs> Punk has returned to the WWE. Ring-a-ling, yes, his watch rings. Soon it will be clobbering time. <laughs> Now, you know the holiday season is a magical time of the year where anything is possible, Larry. It's All like right, Kevin Garnett said at one time. Anything is possible. Show yes. Up. So no matter what the people in your life are trying to tell you, take this time. Make your own Christmas miracle. Your Kwanzaa comeback. Your Hanukkah Hail Mary. Make the haters around you look at you and say, what the hell? <laughs> oh, silver bells. Punk has returned to the WWE. Ring-a-ling, his watch ring. Soon it will be clumpering time. Ladies and gentlemen, Andre 3000. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Go three stacks, go three stacks, go three stacks. <laughs> that boy good. Keep it up, Mr. Benjamin. You're going to be the next Sam Fear master of the pan flute. <laughs> Smart Marquettes, let's take them home. Soon it will be clobbering. Soon it will be clobbering time. Yes, it will be. <laughs> I said, soon it will be. I said, a clobbering time. Yes, for the Smart Marquettes, Larry Lufthansa, Andre 3000, and the Smart Marks, wherever they may be. I'm Braxton Witherspoon. Happy holidays. We'll see you next year, everybody. Probably. Man. Oh, my God. New, New Blue Sun had nothing on Braxton Witherspoon and the Smart Marquettes. Is that what it, what that's called? New that's Blue, was that the Andre 3000? Andre 3000's uh, <laughs> release this year, starring a flute. Um, that might have just won based on Second Cite, Oso Prete, My Guy Germain So Mean. <laughs> the only Christmas jingle to reference Jermaine from Chicago, I'm sure. Um, that was amazing. Honestly, what a return from Braxton Witherspoon and the Smart Marks. Um, that the, the, the charisma of that man on the microphone, the performance. I mean, we will maybe de deliberate about maybe what the best overall song was, but there's no doubt in my mind what the best single performance was. You know, uh, outstanding. Braxton Witherspoon could be a future Grammy nominee slash winner um, mm -hmm. if, it, if it came down to us being part of the uh, uh, of the voting. I think Braxton yeah. Witherspoon. I think at this point we could put out um, at least like an iTunes like playlist or a Spotify playlist of Braxton Witherspoon. By this point, in uh, like almost consistently, uh, we have gotten. Uh, submission oh, most so, years somebody needs to put together a greatest hits absolutely i mean well braxton should that you know whoever his man sign off on it maybe nate can negotiate um you know a, a, a suitable um agreement with braxton we'll, uh we'll, we'll ask larry won't we we'll have to yes yeah that was amazing honestly like again like we're just a wrestling podcast the quality of entrance is i think way beyond um what we really should be getting like these people put a lot of effort into all of this so let's go back from the very beginning here we have canadian bulldog with do they know it's vince mcmahon we have uh which, which kudos to canadian bulldog like the first entrant is like getting the ball rolling for everyone else to aspire to to you know break the ice um so i i, I always appreciate the first entrant each year two weeks in advance do they know it's vince mcmahon we have Ian and Georgia from Best Film Ever with the BFE post Christmas party. And again, that was uh, Baby It's the Bloodline, original lyrics and all. We have Double H from Sweden with Fairy Tale of the Second City Saint. We have uh, The Identity Crisis with the post mess song and Braxton Witherspoon and the Smart Marks with Silver Bells. What the hell? Uh, <laughs> pretty, pretty, pretty tough um, year to choose. But do you have? maybe even a top three 
Oh, oh, top three. Um, well, number one, um, I think that Double H certainly was um, an impactful debut. I think that he is, um, if he doesn't win, he has made a great splash in his first year. I thought I was really impressed with this uh, new entrant here. Um, when it comes to just the uh, uh, pr- production values, I, I think Identity Crisis really, really coming out strong with the video to accompany a- an original Identity Crisis release. Mm-hmm. Um, but man, I'm a sucker for Braxton Witherspoon and uh, the 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 lyrical um, wizardry wizardry that we got uh, once a year from Braxton, who comes out of hiding to give us what the hell uh, with the smart Marquettes as well. So I mean, we're working with a whole different crew this year on top of it. And, and Andre three three stacks, um, getting him out of retirement and on, onto this song. So. Um... I would agree. I would also, if we're trying to, you know, limit who who maybe we we are thinking, I I want to give a shout out to uh, Ian and Georgia as well for Baby It's the Bloodline. Uh, co- the call and response I thought was uh, very very well done. Um, I again the length of it was very strong. Canadian yep. Bulldog with the lyric video as well, and again the early entry we have to award points too. So everybody did really well. But if I have to pick. The ones I, re- I received maybe the biggest reaction for, um, I would go with Double H from Sweden, okay? And that might be a bit of an upset here with uh, his debut, the fairy tale of the Second City Sane. Uh, I also have to give it up to Braxton Weatherspoon and the Smart Marks. Those are my top two. Now, I think, what are we, mm, I think we're in agreement, okay? So those are the top two. We got to pick number one. So sorry, we have Braxton Witherspoon and what is the other final? Double H from Sweden. Yeah, Double H was good. I best film ever. I I really enjoyed like the duo. I, I do want to add that as well. They were yeah. um they, they were in this one as well. Um, if if we are going between those two, then I would state that I think. Oh, this is a tough one, way very tough. Shall we listen to at least a little bit from each one just to kind of make up our mind? Let's let's listen to like thirty seconds. Okay, let's. This is a W H. Uh, sorry, <laughs> not W H. Oh, double w- H. <laughs> double H from Sweden. Oh my god! Well, now I'm next, fantasizing. Next. <laughs> like, uh, uh, imagine a submission. It's fair tale of a second city saint. Just a little bit of a sample. And in agony. They get some big stars, they get rivers of gold And the workload's not crazy, good place for the old TK, take my hand and I'll sign for G As long as not Ryback is waiting for me You were handsome, you were pretty, king of second city When the crowd stopped their cheering, they hung out for more But problems were lingering, that stage you were swinging We kissed on the board, and the night For the boys, the lady, the cry was in glory days as the bells were ringing out from Punk's first day. Oh, so good. So, so good. Now, what does it say about this that, like, our top two choices are both songs about Mr. Phil Brooks? I think it tells you who the main character in professional wrestling was this past year. Despite ups, downs, it was always a consistent line of attention that Phil Brooks commanded. And just an incredible, I guess, um, I don't know, source to f- mine. <laughs> Christmas parody material out of here's Braxton Witherspoon and the Smart Marks with Silver Bells. What the hell? His watch rings. Soon it will be clobbering time. Here's a story, y'all, about my man Paul up in Stamford CT. In the air, there's a feeling of pete. Paul's got a plan, gonna sign a man who can change the whole game. And upon every dirt sheet you read, that's saying, seal the bells. Oh, what the hell? Punk has returned to the WWE. Ring a link. His wide range. Soon it will be clobbering time. Second city, you're so pretty. My God, you made so mean. Okay. Do you have a? Does that make the choice any easier for you, John? Oh. It doesn't for me. It's it's oh. it's really hard to to pick between those two. Both incredibly strong. Um, like take me through your thought process. What are you thinking right now? So I, 
I think my my difference is going to come down to the lyrics. I think that's going to be the key mm-hmm. differentiator between the two. And I think that um, number one, I think that uh, Braxton, I think both of them had like their entertaining lines. I feel that Double H really put himself out there with the uh, the CM Punk, uh, like the, the visual of Tony Khan actually getting up and, and singing this. I don't know for some reason it kind of uh, does. Uh, uh, <laughs> entertain me greatly to imagine this uh coming up so i feel i'm gonna lean towards the rookie entrant in (sighs) double h i was feeling similarly john and i i it's such a hard decision to make because i i think nate's i'm sorry braxton's uh again vocal performance unmatched you know seriously like so so entertaining just by itself and then you have like you know all the different elements um the smart kits you know great performances themselves having andre 3000 on the track so many like fun like i don't know elements introduced to the song but man um i don't know something about like what w D- double h double h sent this year i i i thought was really really captivating you know having the entire um having jungle boy you know be attached to to this as well and finding ways to work that in i mean this is i think a bit of a maybe tougher song to even parody just because it's so vocally dense um and every line i felt was very very well done here i think i give it to the rookie as well double h from sweden congratulations you yes what, what I'm going to say Double H is the 2023 post wrestling jingle contest winner. But I have decided uh as I I feel like th- the efforts were clearly demonstrated by everyone and I was I was toying with an idea as I was um are you are you up- uh, uh Mr. Dana White uh at the uh 2000 Ultimate Fighter finale 2005? Way we are not just giving out one Six figure contract. Who We're gets a scion out. though? <laughs> Instead of a scion, ladies and gentlemen, John Pollock has come up with the consolation that all five are going to receive. I have decided that once I reach my book total for the end of 2023, I am going to purchase and send out a book from my list to each of the five. So I am going to, you are going to blindly receive one book from my reading list of 2023 um, that I feel suits each per, each particular individual. Wow. A so custom will, book selection from John Pollock. So some of these are going to be some, some blind uh, gifts that you're going to get. And uh, we, we will see how they, how they, uh, how they fare with, with, with people. Interesting. Okay. I'm, I'm curious to know what you might pick for, um, Every Braxton, sure, yeah. Well, uh, you will find out. So okay. there you go. All all five are going to get some prize for their entrance, their entries this year. Yeah. In addition, I I'd probably um, like to throw in something from store.postwrestling.com. Uh, I I we really do need to do a better job of making maybe announcing these gifts beforehand. But um, trust me, I will make it worthwhile. Um, is there anything else I can give them? You're getting a book. You're getting something from the store. We're going to make it worth their while. In and fairness, Brad- we put these up every year and we don't promise anything. And these people just submit <laughs> these just for bragging rights alone. So we look at this as as gravy. Way clearly not impressed with what we are offering. No, I'm very impressed, especially with the books. I mean, I you've never given me a book, you know, handpicked from your list. You've so. never entered the contest. That is true. That is true. Hey, congratulations to everybody. Honestly, incredibly strong. You can go to forum.postwrestling.com if you want to find links and listen to yourself. Maybe even download. Save these for the future. Play them for your family. Add them to your Christmas playlist. You know what? I think I might even make a... Well, you know what? I, I can't exactly do that. But I you, I will make a playlist on our YouTube of all the YouTube entries. So um, we'll do our best for to do that. Or people could just find this video on YouTube. Maybe that's just easier. Thank you. Well, I want to thank uh, not just all of the uh, the entrants for the jingle contest, but all of you for spending any portion of your holiday with us for the annual post wrestling Christmas show. And uh, to everyone that has checked out 
any, all, or somewhere in between of post wrestling over the past year. Uh, we, we had a really great year for the for the site and and growing a number of different areas, and we're very excited for 2024 and where we kind of stand after, after six years of this site. Like we had, uh, we, we had a really great year. So that's all because of you, and we hope that we can replicate, if not grow, further in the new year. Mm -hmm. thank you to everybody who listens takes the time to subscribe to the podcast feed or the youtube channel or people who leave a comment uh but thank you especially to all of the patrons at postwrestlingcafe.com or channel members at uh, video.postwrestling.com or apple podcast membership subscribers all of you guys who subscribe um are really the main source of keeping this entire project alive so without you uh, we wouldn't be doing this I want to give a special shout out to our double, double and espresso level patrons. And those of you who still remaining at, at ice cap, even though we've kind of um, closed that, that tier for, for the time being, a lot of you guys who choose to go the extra distance, we choose to recognize you with a, uh, credit roll at the end of all of our video podcasts. So we will end this podcast with that as well. Anything else to say before the end of the year? Happy holidays. Happy new year. Ho, ho, ho. We'll see you in 2024. It was Sunday Eve, babe, at all hours. And no man said to me, I work with children. And then he ate a bunch from Linda's bakery. I turn my face away and cringed in agony. Got on the punky one, came in a to one. I've got a feeling this year's not for me and you. So happy Christmas I love you, Punky I can see a better time When all our dreams come true Hi, Tony Oh, hi, Phil Can I sing with you? Sure, hop on in they get some big stars, they get rivers of gold And the workload's not crazy, good place for the old TK, take my hand and I'll sign for ye As long as not Ryback is waiting for me You were handsome, you were pretty King of Second City When the crowd stopped cheering, they hold out for more But problems were lingering, backstage you were swinging We kissed on the corner and danced through the night And the boys on the AEW choir were singing glory days as the bells were ringing out from Punk's first day. Is that a real microphone? It sure is. You want me to show you how to use it? Nah, go cry me a river. You're a bum CM Punk. I want to be Terry Funk lying there almost dead with my ass in real glass. Now listen to your old ones. Look what happened to Goldberg. You're a kid. I'm the grown-up. I'll choke your ass out. Now Come the here. boys of the AEW choir were singing glory days as the bells were ringing out from Punk's last day. Hopefully you can see this. Oh! oh! <laughs> oh my god, I can't wait. Oh. Why couldn't you been somewhat like Ed or Danielson? You took my dreams from me, and I had to fire you. But I should have kept you, babe. Should have kept you for my own. Can't make it all alone. I build collision around you. Now the boys of the WWE are singing glory days As the bells are ringing out for Punk's first day Wow! Have a look at that Christmas tree It's just been standing there in the corner since July Making no sense at all Until now Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry real Christmas. 
shut up, Jungle Boy, or, or I will choke you out. Yeah, he'll choke you up. 